Aliliantuli Mainayam, Nyokat Kutini, Natalie Kali Maiki. Hello, how are you? My name is Natalie Kali Maiki, and it's a joy to be here with you all today in the beautiful city of Bristol. To begin, I'd like to offer greetings and gratitude to the soil, the waters, the trees, the animals, and the fungi of these beautiful lands. I bring greetings from the Apus, the great mountains of the Andes. And I also greet and acknowledge the lands and the ancestors from which each one of you have come. And thank you for making the long journey here today. In this crucial moment in humanity's history. If the seeds we plant here this weekend bear fruit, we can build a future rooted in justice and joy for all. This movement has the potential to bring us back into right relationship with each other and with our more than human family. And if you're here today, it's because some part of you is also longing to reclaim our birthright as the regenerative keystone species we were designed to be. Creators and stewards of biodiversity, microdiversity, cultural diversity, that is the promise of localization. Over the next few days, we'll be giving birth to a narrative of hope. A hope for the future based not simply on wishful thinking or a more positive mindset, however important both those things may be, but on pragmatic and grounded change rooted in respect for nature, for the feminine, for the indigenous. This is localization, a place where environmental needs meet cultural and personal needs, where no one is left behind, where the best elements of our human nature have the opportunity to flourish. We are incredibly lucky to have as the pioneer of the localization movement, one of the, of the most compassionate and wisest women I know, Helena Norberg Hodge. I've only known Helena for less than a year, but in that short time, she's become my inspiration, my mentor, and my support. Many of you will know her background, the first outsider in recent times to master the extraordinarily complex language of Ladakh or Little Tibet. She had the rare and invaluable opportunity to experience a pre-industrial culture, as it were, from the inside. The contrast between that culture and her own modern Western culture gave her almost unique insights into the fundamental principles of development and progress. And then, following in the footsteps of E.F. Schumacher, author of Small is Beautiful, whose 50th anniversary we celebrate this year, to advocate passionately for a decentralized, human-scale, and deeply ecological economic path. Helena is the godmother, the midwife, perhaps, of the worldwide localization movement. And it is my honor to introduce her to you today. I've only known Natalie about six months or so, but we have become soulmates, and I'm so grateful. And I also want to say how grateful I am to Anya Lingbeck, who has helped to put on this whole event. I hope you'll all be looking after her. She'll be speaking several times over the summit. And it's really been on her shoulders to pull all of this together. And it's been a major effort. We've had so many issues, but we're so grateful to be here because when we started planning this event, we knew that there might be another climate emergency, another pandemic, all kinds of reasons why we might not be able to gather. So, so happy to be here today and so happy and grateful to all of you for making the journey here, despite the rail strikes and, and all the other issues that are raining down on us. And really the message from this movement from around the world is that there is a path into the future that's being created right now, right under our noses. 
our bodies, our souls know at a deep level that it's happening. But we're being misled by abstractions, by numbers, and by a narrative that is taking us in the opposite direction. So there are two paths into the future happening right now. Unfortunately, our governments are still wedded to an abstraction about growth. That means that they are taking us further and further away from nature, and that means also from our human nature, from what our bodies and hearts know that we need and want. On the other side, I've had the privilege, going back now almost 50 years, to see this other movement from the bottom up, ordinary people. And the truth is that more than 99% of humanity are not engaged in taking us away from nature. On the contrary, there is a huge cultural turning that we need to see clearly, that we need to embrace, and we need the paradigm, the worldview, the lenses to do so in a really meaningful and strategic way in order to allow the 99% who are showing that they want a closer connection to nature. So from my perspective, which as Natalie said, started in this ancient culture of Tibet called Ladakh, it's the westernmost part of Tibet, what I saw there was a people that had been allowed to develop, to evolve, to change. Life is change. It has always been changing. Cultures evolved, like the Ladakhic culture, in a deep dialogue with nature. And that means with their place on the earth. It was not an abstraction. It wasn't a photo of the earth from outer space with us holding the earth in our hands. No, we do not hold the earth in our hands. The earth holds us in her hands. And when we knew that, which we did for most of our evolution, we evolved in deep relationship with, dialogue with, listening with life around us. We know that the enclosures, that slavery, later colonialism, started taking us forcefully away from that. And as this grew into an industrial, global monoculture, imposed worldwide, it had become an inhuman structure based on abstractions, not based on experiential knowledge. That system, unfortunately, our governments are still supporting and in the last 35 years or so, this um, systemic path taking us away from nature has been escalating because of trade treaties. Please see the trade treaties as an enormous opportunity to wake up to where we have to focus. It's a strategic thread that has been now taking us away from nature, away from community, away from any form of democracy, that thread has meant that governments have signed in black and white that you, global banks, global traders, Monsanto, Cargill, Pfizer, these giant corporations, you can do as you like, and if we do anything that inhibits your profit, you can sue us. This is not in secrecy. This is out in the open. The clauses where governments are signing, you can do as you like. And if we do anything like raising the minimum wage or trying to keep our water clean or protect biodiversity, you can sue us. Those are called ISDS clauses, Investor State Dispute Settlements. So it turns out that trade and trade treaties are the central major reason 
why labor and conservative, socialist governments in Scandinavia, virtually every government in the world has signed over their rights to a consortium and sort of empire of interlinked banks and corporations. And in these last 35 years, as climate chaos has escalated, poverty has also increased. Every single one of us is having to work harder day by day to just put food on the table and a roof over our head. And we are not being allowed to see this because we are told the economy is growing. It's growing for you and it's got to keep growing. Otherwise, if we do something about climate or if we do something to protect nature, you will suffer. So we've been pinned into this corner where we are told it's either us or the rest of them, other people or nature. This is completely wrong. The same policies that are destroying and really decimating the living world are impoverishing 99% of humanity. So we actually have an amazing positive paradigm shift that would be so empowering. Can you imagine people voting to say, we want growth policies that mean that we have to work harder and harder just to meet our basic needs? Can you imagine how pleased people would be when they know, actually, the policies we need that will support local businesses, local farmers, support us, are the same policies that are gonna heal the environment? That is the truth. Now, we're gonna have, I hope, discussion over these next three days. I hope many of you will join us on Sunday as well, because we'll have more time for action and plans for the future, <clears throat> talking more about what you can do. Over the next few days, over today and tomorrow, you'll be hearing a very dense program of lots of speakers from all over the world. And this, of course, for many people is a strange thing. How can we be talking about localization and create a global gathering and where we have people flying in from around the world. It turns out that it is a global perspective that really sheds so much light on what's going on. And that makes it so clear that we must turn, systemically turn towards localizing, towards placing economic activity in the arms of Mother Gaia and in the arms of democratic process. It's rather simple. We really need to ensure that we have a say in what direction the economy goes. So to come back to Ladakh, which I started talking about and dropped, to come back to Ladakh, what I saw there, what I lived in, I had the great privilege of living in a culture that was still developing and evolving according to its own needs. People empowered to see, both to see and to feel responsible for keeping their air, their water, their soil clean. A knowledge that came from experiential knowledge. No community in this world <clears throat> would create a measure of progress where cutting down every tree on the hillside would be seen as progress. No community on this planet would say, oh, we polluted the water, now we can make money out of selling water in bottles and call that progress. This is happening because of scale, the link between very narrow, specialized, over-specialized knowledge linked to bigger and bigger scale and speedier and speedier changes. And it's now been in the hands of giant global corporations inhabited by people who are not very different from you and me. Maybe many of you are still in those giant corporations. From our point of view, this is not about individuals. This is about systems. It's about scale and about abstraction. So to come back again to Ladakh, what I experienced was that 
when people lived side by side, interdependent through their economic dependence on each other, Muslims, Christians, Buddhists, even some Hindus had lived side by side for 500 years without group conflict. Maybe more than anything, what I, what I came to see was that the multi-generational fabric that has existed in virtually every culture until this industrial global system, the multi-generational relationships were meant that each child had a secure sense of identity, a sense of identity that made them feel worthwhile, feel loved enough to be loving, kind, and compassionate. So I'm so happy to be able to introduce my close colleague of about 45 years, we've known each other for 45 years, Dolma Tsiding from Ladakh. Julie Dolmalin, you know, English, English, the big China, oh my God. So, Dolma does speak some English, but she'd prefer to speak to you in Ladakhi, and I will translate. You know, it's a big more Ladakhi. Yeah, Ladakhi, 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 Hele <laughs> Then it rang and rang at a young Jing Motana, at a playing young at a harvesting tana, then a young at a Sapaman Macolva, Najiman in Nazuga, Tangma, Chigna Chica, Roxica, and the last book. Roxica Dugana Yampo, then a mean with my skit for Tangma Tatpo, skit for Chigna Chicks, Chigna Chicky good relationships, so Mademont in Najia, the last book. Then I guess that something's got good. So um, Dolma was explaining about how when I first came there, how people lived together, and she was saying also about the different generations together, how they would cook together. Well, first of all, they would plant together, they would harvest together, they would cook together, they would build houses together. And it was amazing to see that in all the different tasks, they would sing while they did the work. And it was, it, it was a very happy, Collaborative and amazing culture. Yeah. Then I just meet the puttaika, I just take over the mountain. Yeah. Then the best churches, rarest churches, barest churches. Paspoon that can do the money interesting thing. Don't you know? Paspoon that are not poor. Paspoon bongata, dasagata, money for a mirab, na mirab, a paspoon man in Yambudukjan. They paspoon was there no, Nata Azuko, Timizik, Nata, Campena, Tongshana. Yeah. So they also had these institutions where they had structures to support each other. So at harvest time, they would take turns helping each other. They had also, in terms of taking the animals up to higher pasture, they had something called rares, where they would take turns taking the animals up and the animals of their neighbors. And then they had another institution that was so amazing. It was called Paspoon. And it was about between four and up to some Paspoon. So even up to 15 houses in different villages. And I think that was strategic in case there had been a drought or a problem in one village. So these houses were linked not by blood, but through this institution, which was passed on for generations, that they would come to help each other, particularly birth, marriage, death. The, uh, the, the paspoon would come in and do all the work. 
for the for their families. So between four and 15 households linked across the region in different villages. Small industry means Agriculture, agriculture, so she's saying we didn't need to get anything from the outside. We didn't need this type of industrial development because we just made everything ourselves. And so the men would weave the coarser wool. They, we, you know, they would wear, make their own clothes from their own fibers, dye it from local plants. And the children would learn from the elders and pass on all the skills. So they didn't have any need for all, all that industry. <laughs> Demo, Mana Yodeno, Devo Jigma Juju, Molecon and Moldu Yale, Deningaja Sama Yulula Songse, Deningaja Zes, Dasa Gaun Langatanga Daruan, Man Agriculture, the last six summer demo you don't really. Then it's a city and it's the Pigia and Yarga and Yampote Sama met cancer. So she's saying that we, we together started this women's alliance that we went into all the villages and there were thousands of women raising the status of women and agriculture and their work, working with the land, and how that's still going, still very helpful. It is definitely, Ladakh is under a lot of pressure in the opposite direction. But mainly, what we are here to say is that we really can make a shift. It is happening. You'll be amazed at how much is happening around the world and right under your noses here in Bristol. We're going to have examples of local groups doing all kinds of things. And I am so amazed that every single day I learn about new projects. We're keeping our eyes open. In Local Futures, we are gathering examples of these smaller human scale, often led by women, initiatives that rebuild the community fabric. We're talking about reconnection to human life as well as nature. So don't start in on this sort of anti-human, you know, raising the status of nature and trashing humans. No, this is about reconnecting to life, all of life, human and non-human. And there's a way forward where they are linked. It's happening right now. Join this movement. You won't regret it. Thank you. Do <laughs> you Well, hello, everybody. I'm Rupert Reed, and welcome to this session. So what's going to happen is I'm going to do a short intro to the session. And uh, then we will have a series of short talks and some discussion. Planet local. What a beautiful paradox. In order to return to the strongly relocalized future that is our birthright, we must primarily get serious and effective at acting locally. But in order to do that, 
without being at the mercy of the forces of capital that have been unleashed. They need to be released again. The old adage goes, think global, act local. But the burden of the work that Helena Norberg Hodge and I have done together in the past is that in order for the local to truly thrive now, there needs to be not just global thinking, but global care, global care, global protection. The precautionary principle needs to be entrenched across the globe. The law of ecocide needs to be implemented through the UN. The UNFCCC and its COP system, which has badly failed us on climate, and which under a fossil fuel magnet in the United Arab Emirates this autumn, is gonna become a parody of itself. These need, in my view, to be ditched via a breakaway strategy in which countries of good faith get together beyond the auspices of the COP system, the failed COP system, and start to put together policies on climate and nature which would actually be decent and impose tariffs against countries which are recalcitrant to this decency and futurity. So we create a more local future from the ground up locally, but also by protecting against the local and global forces of destruction. All of this is what we're talking about in this morning's session here. So let me turn to introduce someone who, in the old adage, requires no introduction, because she is a force of nature in this struggle. Because of this, she's the one person who we've allowed into this event remotely by way of a recording, and that's true. She is, of course, Vandana Shiva. So over to you, Vandana. Dear friends, gathered for Planet Loka, I'm so sorry I cannot join you physically because we are having our one month course on returning to the Earth. And then on the 1st of October, we will be celebrating the Earth, Bhumi. This time connecting the issues of climate change, the issues of food security, the issues of health. After all, every one of the crises we face is a crisis that has been created by a dysfunctional relationship with the earth, by an attempt of limitless extraction, limitless greed, limitless profits, limitless power. The path of limitless power and profits began with colonialism. It continued with the so-called development of the Bretton Woods institutions, the World Bank, the IMF. It then morphed into the globalization of WTO. And today, there's only one future on that path. That future is extinction. That future is collapse of the Earth systems, collapse of societies, collapse of relationships. It is a path that has spread all the things we do not need in the world. Chemicals and toxics that kill made from fossil fuels, fossil fuels itself, that are mining 600 million years of the Earth's fossilization of a living matter. To pretend that we are becoming more efficient and more productive hiding the costs, hiding the energy slaves on which industrial civilization rests is not progress, it is an illusion, but it is a very destructive illusion because those who are being made to pay the price have not caused it, the earth has not caused it. The people of the south haven't caused it, the working people of the north, the women of the world haven't caused it. A handful of people, it was 600 men in England who wrote the charter to, for the Queen to sign, created the East India Company, the first corporation. And what we are witnessing over the last 500 years, and a little more, is corporate rule. Corporate rule with no ethics, no ecological limits, no vision of the future, no sense that we are one Earth family. We have to now commit ourselves, no matter who we are, across our diversities, across the world to another future, a future of regeneration. And regeneration begins with love and care. 
and love and care begin in the intimate, in the relationships. Love and care blossom in the local. So we have a collapsing globalization, which will end by itself. But we must facilitate its exit so that we can sow the seeds of another future. And that other future is the future of celebrating life on Earth, beginning with the tiniest seed we plant in the smallest piece of land, a little pot in a windowsill, a little garden in our backyard, a little community garden, a little food shed with local farmers. This is what is already happening. Local is not a distant future. Local is the dominant alternative. 80% of the food we eat today with all the destruction of industrial agriculture comes from small farms. Industrial agriculture and its globalization through the rules of WTO, which allowed seed to become intellectual property of Monsanto, and Monsanto wrote that treaty, or agriculture to be reduced to trade in commodities, and Cargill wrote that treaty, or our food from being nourishment, from being our health and our medicine, being torn into the single biggest cause of chronic diseases. Food is the reason people are dying some for lack of hunger because, or lack of food because of injustice, but double the hungry for lack of good food, food that nourishes us. 75% diseases come from the globalized industrial food system. And those treaties were written by the junk food industry, the Pepsis, the Cokes, the Nestle's. We can do without them. We will do better without them. Between Monsanto, which is now Bayer, Cargill, the junk food industry, they have created not just a catastrophe for our health, but a catastrophe for the Earth's health. 50% of the emissions that are destroying the planet's health are coming from an industrial food system, from 14% destruction from production, 20% by going into the Amazon to grow GMO soya, most of which goes for biofuel and animal feed another 20% to move food miles and miles and miles and ultra process it and package it. And then this globalized system is based on waste. In Earth's economy, in nature's economy, there is no waste. Everything is a cycle. Everything moves between each other. Food is the ultimate cycle. Food is the ultimate currency of life. And it's food, with food we can begin the relocalization of this planet. There are already so many of you gathered to celebrate the only future, the future where life is reborn and life is regenerated. And in this future, we can grow food for all, as Navdanya has shown over the last 35 years. We can grow better food and more nutrition. Our farmers earn more, 10 times more, 50 times more, by not being exploited to buy costly seeds, GMOs, costly chemicals that kill life on Earth and cause cancer everywhere. We have a cancer train leaving the land of the Green Revolution in Punjab. We can find alternatives, and these alternatives are already there. But the beautiful part of localization is, it is the only answer to the curse of destabilizing the climate systems of the Earth, which she has managed over millennia herself. And becoming part of the Earth, returning to the Earth, to become part of the cycle of the plants, the photosynthesis, pulling out the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, giving us food, but more importantly, giving us oxygen. And in the root zone, creating the amazing web of life, that then creates the food system, the mycorrhizal fungi in the soil, bring food to the plants that have given them food. And through that, the earth cycles are renewed, but we are nourished. This is the path that already the earth is showing us, nature is showing us. It is not a human invention. We must give, us, give up anthropocentric arrogance. This is not the age of the Anthropocene. 
is the age of the earth, is the age of the plants, is the age of biodiversity. Let us grow the future together with love to all of you. Got to follow that. <laughs> this session is called Global or Local? Two Paths to Our Future. I don't think so, because first, the good news relocalization is inevitable. It is going to happen. The future is more local. Now, the less good news that we all now sense and dread. The most likely course by way of which this relocalization will happen, as things stand, is by way of uncontrolled civilizational collapse. And the longer the globalizers push beyond the limits, the surer and the worse the crash will be. And of course, a post-collapse world is without doubt a more local world. This is what I mean by saying, as I do, that this civilization is finished. The only conceivable way in which we reach the inevitably more relocalized future without having to endure the process of collapse is by way of beating that process to it. That is by swiftly relocalizing and reducing our collective impact voluntarily, wisely, deliberately, together. That is creating a new civilization from within the old. John Michael Greer has a splendid quote, some of you might know it. He says, collapse now and avoid the rush. <laughs> if we make the shift to a more local future that can be sustained, if we make that shift smartly enough, then we can beat collapse to it. Make no mistake, executing this will be almost impossibly difficult now. The obstacles in our way are vast. And part of what makes our situation so desperate, of course, is that even now there is hardly any public acknowledgement that our situation is quite as desperate as it is. If we're in a long emergency, it's partly because a focal feature of that emergency is precisely that there is so little understanding that this really is a new kind of emergency. This is what I call the meta-emergency. An emergency is, of course, much more serious if people are acting as if there's no emergency. So our predicament is grim, but when we relocalize, we are simultaneously heading off an otherwise inevitable, terrible future and preparing for that future of collapse if it should materialize. It's a win-win precautious strategy. It's a no-regret strategy. It really is a no-regret strategy, of course, when we bear in mind what I call the beautiful coincidence that the very things we need to do in order to increase the probability of our making it through what is coming are the very things we need to do in order to enrich our lives. Yeah? And we all know this. A more local future is a future with more community, more sanity, better health, better food, less insecurity. It does simply be a better future, whether eventually we lose or win, collapse or no collapse. So no regrets. Okay. Do I really believe that we can prevent collapse, given how profoundly stacked against us the odds are? Well, let me put it this way. Would I bet on it? And I'm sorry to have to tell you the answer to that question is no. I wouldn't bet a penny on it. But here's the thing. I'd bet my life on it. And I do bet my life on it. Right? I know that many of you are betting your lives on it. Yeah? Do you get it? I wouldn't bet a penny on it, but I'd bet my life on it, and I think we're all betting our lives on it. So do I believe, do I really believe we can prevent collapse given how profoundly stacked against us the odds are? My friends, I do. Why? Because we are capable of utterly extraordinary things. Because what we have seen so far, for instance, with Greta and Extinction Rebellion, that was just the beginning. We're just getting started. That's why I've now launched the Climate Majority Project, the idea of our project to mobilize not just progressive activists and ecologists, but most people 
to organize the majority, to act together to save our common future. It's a huge ask, but it's exactly the ask we now need to be making. What we are talking about at this conference is, of course, not just the preserve of progressive activists. It needs to be for everyone, including millions upon millions who will never become activists as such, but who are gradually waking up to our desperate predicament and thereby starting to make it just a little bit less desperate. We are just getting started. And that is what is so hugely, hugely exciting and hopeful. And that is what makes our situation drip with meaning. What a privilege to be a part of this. What a privilege to be alive at this desperate, terrible, tremendously exciting time. Thank you for being a part of it. So the observant among you will have noticed beside me the diminutive, distinguished, magnificent figure of Satish Kumar, uh, a man who I'm honored to call my friend. Again, he really doesn't need introduction, I believe, with this audience. I'll simply mention his huge role in the past and in the present in relation to Schumacher College and his huge role in the past and in the present in relation to resurgence uh, magazine, but there's so much more I could say, but I won't cut any more into his time. Satish, tell us what you want to share with us here this morning. It is a great pleasure to be part of this wonderful event. I would like to congratulate Helena Norberg Hodge and all her team who have put together this event and brought us together as a family and a community. Thank you, Helena, and thank you, all your team, and giving me this pleasure and honor to speak to you. I would like to make some very simple couple of points about global versus local. <clears throat> First of all, Global sees nature as a resource for the economy. Local sees nature as a source of life itself. So, we need to go local because global has separated us from nature. We think nature is out there, mountains, and forests and animals. And we humans are not nature. We are separate from nature. Not only we are separate from nature, we are above nature. Local says, we are nature. That's a one big fundamental philosophical difference between the idea of global and local. The second, is global sees also humans, not only nature, but humans as a resource for the economy. You all have heard of the word HR. <laughs> HR stands for human resources. Dreadful word. What has global done to us? turned us into just a resource for making profit, making money, production, consumption, nothing more. Local says, change that HR to something else. Change HR from human resources to human relationship. Very simple, but fundamental change fundamental difference, philosophical difference. So for a local philosophy, local planet, we are, I mean, humans and nature are not a means to an end, the end of economic growth. The economic growth or economy is means to maintain the integrity of nature 
and dignity of humans. That's the fundamental philosophical message of local. Now, global goes further. Not only makes humans a resource, but humans, in general speaking, makes them disempowered. All the power is centralized at the top. A few board members at the top, full few designers will make the decisions. And majority of us are just consumers. Disempowering. So global is centralizer and local is decentralizer. Power to people. Every one of us are as important as the CEO or president or chair or prime minister or president or whoever they are at the top. They are no more important than you and I and every citizen of the world. They're doing their job, fine. <laughs> but every single person, every single human being has that dignity. That's the local. So decentralized local and centralized global. Choice is yours. And we are making choice to decentralize the economic power and the political power. Next, <clears throat> local favors diversity. And global favors uniformity. Global will say, make every high street same chains. Marks and Spencer, Asda, Sainsbury, etc., etc., as the same. Wherever you go, same. Same kind of architecture. Same of Costa Coffee. Same kind of McDonald's. Same kind of Coca-Cola. Same kind of blue jeans. Mass produced globally, distributed globally. With a lot of fossil fuel, a lot of roads, a lot of trains, a lot of lorries, a lot of motorways and highways infrastructure. So that's the kind of uniformity. Same kind of economic system should be for the all over the world. Same kind of political system should be all over the world. The global system, the global market economy. Anything else, no good. Now, local favors diversity. Nature favors diversity. We are all here humans, but no two humans are the same. We all have eyes, but no two persons' eyes are the same. We have millions of trees, but no two trees are the same. Diversity is the fundamental principle of evolution. At the time of the Big Bang, there was only gas, energy, and matter. Over billions of years of hard work, evolution has created this wonderful diversity of cultures, languages, humans, nature, philosophy, uh, so many, I can list a long list. But now, the globalists are saying, all this diversity, no good. Everybody should speak English. Everybody should buy jeans and Coca-Cola, no diversity. So local favors diversity, global favors uniformity. And uniformity is the cause of many, many conflicts. Wars, poverty, many, many other problems come because of the drive for uniformity. So why we want this? Planet local, because we want decentralized, biodiverse, culturally diverse, economically diverse, flourishing society. And every single human being is empowered to act in the world in the best of their ability and create this world a sacred, beautiful, enjoyable, celebratory planet. That's a planet 
local summit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Satish. So we don't have Vandana here with us, but we do have each other, and we have about 15 minutes. Yes, okay. So <clears throat> how do we want to use this time? I guess one thing which uh, I would like to ask you, building on what all three of us have said, where obviously there are big confluences between the, the three things, is how do you see us achieving this balance on an emotional level as well as on a practical level between the awareness of our current trajectory toward collapse and the potentiality both of having a better collapse uh, and or of managing to avert Collapse. How do you how do you see or, or, or feel that in uh, in your own life or in <clears throat> the audiences you interact with at this time? Yes. Um, the independence or the power is not going to be given to us. We have to take the power and a journey of thousand miles begins with one step. As you know, I walked from India to America. Two and a half years. 8,000 miles through 15 countries. How did I walk? Step by step by step. So, how do we do it? Each and every one of us take responsibility. We have to be the change that we want to see in the world. No good preaching others before being ourselves. So that's the first step we do. Second step, we all need to learn to communicate these ideas. The powers to be, the central, centralized power, the global power, uh, is very good at advertising, very good at communicating, very good at Coca-Cola everywhere. Our local message, the message of local, decentralized, biodiverse, culturally diverse, flourishing human life and human relationship is not yet communicated well. So we all need to communicate our ideas powerfully. I suggested to some of my friends that we need new songs. For example, at the time of uh, um, anti-racism in America, Martin Luther King, and I had a great privilege of meeting Martin Luther King. That was a wonderful time. And at that time, everybody was singing, we shall overcome, we shall overcome. That was a wonderful song. And John Lennon, imagine, wonderful song. We need that powerful new songs for our time and our movement. So communication, be the change and communicate the change powerfully. This audience and this conference is good, but we need to reach many more people. So communicate the challenge. And third, join others. No one person can change the world. How wonderful Helena Norberg Hodge is. She's a great woman, but she cannot do by herself. We all have to support and join together. And we work together. A great river is made of many, many, many tributaries. Mahatma Gandhi had millions of people joining him to create India independent. Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, an international movement against apartheid. I was part of that. So we have to join others together. So these are the three things, uh, Rupert, I would say. Be the change, communicate the change, and join others to change, and then do it all with love. No anger, no anxiety, no fear, no complaining. Just be the change, communicate the change, and enjoy the change. Join the others to change, but enjoy it. Celebration, no misery. We do not, in our movement, we do not want miserable activists. 
We want happy activists. And we are all happy activists, celebrating life and taking power in our homes, in our own hands and enjoying it. That's how we start the change. Okay, great. So... <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, a lot of support for what you're saying there in the room, and, uh, which is great. And uh, there's so much in the, the rich things you just said I'd love to, to come to. But let me start with, with a possible point of slight disagreement, because you know, we sometimes need that, that kind of grit and reality, yeah, yeah, don't we? Yeah, yeah. You don't, yeah, don't want to have just a total love in here. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, yes, absolutely, happy activists. Yes, absolutely, it's all about love. But... I worry sometimes when I hear people say, you know, no fear, no, no anxiety, uh, no anger, etc. Because what I hear when I hear that is people being told, if you have those feelings, then there's a problem or there's something wrong with you or you need to engage in some kind of suppression of them or they're not welcome here. Whereas the way I see it is more, all of these feelings are welcome. What we need to understand is that they are all actually, when they work at their best, forms of love. So people get angry because of the injustice that those that they care about and love, the injustice those people are suffering. People are uh, afraid um, because those they love, including themselves, are now so vulnerable. People are in grief because they are losing or have lost uh, what they love. And something that we're trying to bring strongly in the Climate Majority Project is the sense that these feelings, when they occur, are legitimate, and as my teacher, Joanna Macy, has argued so powerfully, they are themselves power, yeah. uh, and they are energy. We just have to be reminded of their grounding uh, in love, so we see them as forms uh, of love. So let me put that to you. Is there any disagreement after all, or, or not? <laughs> No, no, what you are saying, Rupert, is, is important. And there are lots of people who are feeling anger, fear, anxiety. There's eco-anxiety going around. And these, all these things are real. I understand them. But how long can you remain in your anger? Sure. How long can you remain in your anxiety? Yeah. One day, one week, one year? Then what? So... We have to act without desiring the world will listen and change tomorrow. It takes time. As I said, a journey of 1,000 miles start, starts with one step, but it takes a long time. So we need to be, be such that we act, but action is in our hands. Action is under our control. We can act and act and act. That's what I have been doing. But results, achievement, outcome, they are not in our hands. We cannot control. I can speak to you, but how will you respond to it is not in my control. Only thing I can do is to communicate. So action is my emphasis. Every one of us need to take action. People who are miserable, people who are angry, they are just sitting there and cursing the world without doing anything. This is my uh, uh, concern. I so act, and then action will remove your anger. Action will remove your... Nelson Mandela was in jail for 27 years without anger. Mahatma Gandhi was in jail for 12 years. Martin Luther King was arrested for 29 times, and I met him. He was an embodiment of love. So all the great figures have shown us the way that you can act and you can act, and you can act and leave the results in the hands of the universe and, and change will come. Apartheid did come to an end. Racism has been reduced. Obama was in, uh, in the White House. Um, India is in a, independent. Berlin Wall did come down. Soviet Empire did come down. Many, many women's uh, liberation is much more uh, better than it was before. Change do come only come because many, many people have acted. Anger is not going to change the world. Fear is not going to change the world. So I have been acting for 87 years old I am now, and I started acting at age 18, and I'm not angry. I'm not fearful. I do my best, start to my college, start resurgence, speak to you, do what I can. I'm going all the other, but with joy, with pleasure. 
So I advise you, Rupert, to leave anger behind and do your best for the uh, service of the world. <laughs> and, and, and then see what happens. Lovely. I think where we strongly agree is that, uh, <laughs> is that there is a serious issue if anyone gets stuck in these feelings. I guess what, part of what I learned from Joanna is the best way to not get stuck in them is to acknowledge them, allow them, express them, allow them to move through you. The problem about, for example, people being told not to despair is that if they're feeling despair, then they feel they have to keep those feelings at arm's length now. And what I sense often, actually, in those such as the so-called stubborn optimists in the climate space, who say, oh, you mustn't despair, despair is the worst thing. Well, I sense that there's something actually rather desperate now in the way that they are trying to keep our despair and perhaps their own despair at arm's length. And of course, if there's something desperate about it, well, the clue's in the word, right? They're actually in despair. They're the ones who are into the people who are saying, Yo, you mustn't despair, don't despair. There's despair that's already there. Whereas those of us who have sometimes felt uh, despair um, or other really difficult feelings, when we allow ourselves to feel it and it moves through us, then we have, a, and that's, this of course is why Joanna used to call her work despair and empowerment work. Mm. So I totally agree with you about the way this must issue in action and of course this is what buddhism has taught us this is what stoicism has taught mm. us but also thinking that there must be a, a role and and in the climate majority project we put this centrally in our theory of change we say the truth now is very difficult yeah. people be, need to be told the difficult truth and not have not have it kept from them but they need to be told it in such a way that they can handle it they need to be given resources to help them handle it and among those resources are pathways to action pathways to realistic, effective action together. And as you say, and this is why I'm so glad that you got us started on the, on the question of power, that needs to be through the places in our lives where we have power. For many of us, that will be in our workplaces or professions. And for those of us who feel very powerless, and of course, a lot of us today feel very powerless, there may be power in that very powerlessness. This, is, of course, is what Vashlev Havel so beautifully taught us, right? That's what we saw with the school climate strikers, for example, right? That they, in, the, in their very powerlessness, these young people, they came and they said to us, save our world. You know, we can't do it. We're too young. We're not in charge of the institutions, etc. yet. And time is, is terribly short. Save our world. And in that expression, that honest expression of power and a kind of desperation, in that honest expression of powerlessness, there was a huger power imminent. So I guess that's, what, that's why, why I'm excited that we are, as I put it, just getting started. That these, these emotions that, that course through us, which are all based in love and need to be expressed in a way which is ultimately joyful and happy, as yes. you say, yeah. that these emotions em empower even those of us who feel powerless to do things which are absolutely extraordinary. And we're only just starting to sense how huge they are. Yeah, yeah. Um, Joanna Macy's work, uh, Despair and Empowerment, is wonderful. She's a good friend of mine, and uh, she taught at Schumacher College. So what Joanna Macy is saying is that, yes, we know the problem, we understand the problem, we have to address the problem, and that's a despair, but don't get stuck at the problem. Yeah. Yeah. That's what she, that's how empowerment comes. So the moment you move from despair to hope, despair to empowerment, and empower yourself to act, then your despair will disperse, and, and you will be empowered to act. And every one of us, have a tremendous power. Every one of us have a potential to be a Gandhi, to be a Martha King, to be a Mother Teresa, to be whoever. I mean, you don't have to copy them, but we, every one of us, have a tremendous power. But that power is dormant. It's a kind of uh, uncultivated. So if we all empower ourselves, we can focus on the problem and always say, Sunak is bad, Modi is bad, Xi Jinping is bad, Putin is bad, Biden is bad, Monsanto is bad, um, ESO is bad, BP, bad, bad, bad. And then what happens? 
nothing. But if you, if you only focus on the problem and not on the solution, then you are stuck in your despair. And you are not moving with Joanna Macy and going into empowerment. So yes, emotions are human. Even anger is human. Even all the negative is are human. But we don't remain stuck there. We move to solution. What are the solutions? And we take power in our own hands and change our community, change our places, create new projects, protest, yes. But protesting is not enough. Extinction Rebellion, yes, but not enough. Um, stop the oil is good, but not enough. Protest is good, but after protest, you have to also protect what is already good in the world. Indigenous cultures, beauty of the world, forests, rivers, protect them and also build. Building is important. Build alternatives, build alternative ideas, local economies, local shops, local businesses, local bread making. Yesterday we were in a, in a wonderful food um, uh, uh, foundation. That was a positive building. So protest, yes. That's a kind of despair and protest. But then protect, also important. Yeah. And build, that's important. We all need to build alternatives so that Darkness will disappear when we light the candle. So better to light the candle than curse the darkness. Wonderful. That, I think, is a, is a fine moment at which to draw this session, which obviously has been a kind of invitation, if you will, to the conference as a whole, towards a close. And I'll just say one more thing, which is... I love the way that you are saying to everyone in the room, you have the opportunity to be the next uh, Gandhi or Greta or wh whatever. But I wonder also if there's, a, if there's a way we can collectivize that as well. The Dalai Lama has this wonderful uh, saying. He says, perhaps the next Buddha will be a Sangha, yes. which means perhaps the next yes. great enlightened being will yes. be a collectivity, right? Perhaps the next Gandhi is not one person sitting in this room. Perhaps it's the whole room. Together. Together. I agree. We agree. Yeah. <laughs> we agree. <laughs> I, think we, I think we got there in the end. A superstar. Thank you so much. Now, what we're asking you to do is to reflect for the next couple of minutes with your neighbor. Take a couple of minutes to just talk about what you've heard so far. And hopefully that could, those, those thoughts that you share in the next couple of minutes, that's all, just two minutes will be fuel for the discussions which will, there will be time for, obviously, in the rest of these three days and in the rest of today. Thank you so much, meanwhile, and yeah, please enjoy the next couple of minutes with your neighbor talking about what you've just heard. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you.
Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hello. Good afternoon. We're going to call everyone back to presence. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. This might work better. Try this one. Okay. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Still good morning and good evening to some, I assume, depending on your jet lag. Um, thank you to everyone for being here and making the journey from your respective places in the world. And it's an honor to have our Ladakhi elder here with us today. Um, so this is our first dialogue session of the day. And uh, I'm going to be in conversation with uh, Darsha Narvaez. And the topic for us is community, nature, and us. And when I was thinking through my little preamble, I thought, well, these three words are so loaded. <laughs> Why don't we just unpack those words? Um, there's a story that uh, Dene Elder shared with me about when the French colonialists came to the southwest of the US. And they asked one of the, the tribes, our understanding is that you have a dozen plus words for water, but you live in the desert. Why would you have so many descriptors? And the elder said, for the same reason, your culture has so many words for love. It's the thing you're the most bereft of. <laughs> and I feel the same about the word community in our modern context. We have so many ways to describe community kin, clan, tribe, family, etc. But such little embodied understanding of it. And then I thought about the word nature and um, this concept that comes from Timothy Morton, the philosopher, where he says, I want ecology without nature. Ecology without nature. And what he means by that is this idea of nature as some static background, some ambient landscape for human activity to take place. And ecology is more feral than that. It's more wild. It's more active. It's more engaged. And so I bring that thought in of ecology without nature and without these distinctions of nature, culture, human nature. And then the idea of us, which is also a very strange concept. Uh, where does the delineation begin and end? And the more the rational mind does the investigations, the more we realize that we have no idea what identity constitutes. Quantum physics is teaching us that we are more like space-time becomings than beings. Our particles are entangled with other particles in non-local ways. Our very notion of separation is being blurred and queered. Evolutionary biology is teaching us that we are uh, primarily made up of bacteria. So who is the us? Then even the safe areas of uh, we are our thoughts, we are our ideas. What we're learning is that we are highly sensitive, contextually dependent beings. That even the food that we are eating is determining our thoughts through the uh, vagal nerves. So it's our, the bacteria in our gut that is determining our thinking. So there's no safe place left for the idea of us. Uh, you know, we are a congress of beings and becomings simultaneously. So Darsha Narvaez is an uh, emirata professor at the University of Notre Dame. She has done a beautiful job of synthesizing 
various disciplines, biology, neurobiology, uh, clinical psychology, um, anthropology, evolutionary studies, and she is the founder of EvolveNest.org. She's written a series of beautiful books. Uh, one of them is Evolve Nest, which is sitting here on the table. Um, and I'll let her get into her content. And as we go into the, the depth, what I will say is there's going to be slides, there's going to be words, it's going to uh, feel like a kind of concept-rich conversation. And then the proceedings will be, I will ask Darsha a few questions after and go a little bit deeper. Unfortunately, we're not going to have audience questions today. We will on Sunday. Um, and so, yeah, maybe just take a moment before we go into the world of ideas to just sit with yourself and ask yourself what community and nature and identity mean to you. Darsha. Good day. So good to be with you. So I am going to talk to you about a puzzle that I've had since my first memory as a child. What's wrong with humanity? And I'm going to also suggest solutions, right? All in about 10 minutes. <laughs> so what does non-colonized human nature look like? We are all colonized today. We have generations of trauma that's been passed down unresolved from our ancestors since civilization started to coerce us into being a particular way uh, for you know, maintaining the system of hierarchy. And so we forgot a lot of things, and we've forgotten about uh, hum human well-being and how it's constructed. And how do we find out what to do? Well, what I've done is I've looked at sustainable societies, these are primarily in Central Africa, nomadic foragers. Uh, they represent 99% of our history as a human genus was spent in nomadic foraging bands, small bands, egalitarian. And they allow us to see uh, what we could be. Now, there are other traditional societies that follow these same kinds of practices that I'm going to talk about and have similar outcomes, like the Ladakis. So this is a complicated uh, image. This is what I'm working on today. I am going to talk to you about the middle section, developmental nestedness. I've been working on that for about 20 years. But I've realized now that that's not the fullness of becoming human. We also need a sense of connectedness to, yep, there it is, uh, to the earth to follow the cycles and seasons of the earth and feel like we are part of the bio community. And we also need a sense of connection to the cosmos, that we are part of this magical universe that uh, keeps us energized, right? And keeps uh, us fluidly dynamic together. And then our horizontal nestedness means that we also uh, understand our history, our ancestors. We respect traditions wise traditions, and we are concerned for future generations. So this is the kind of holistic uh, nestedness, but I'm going to focus on the developmental aspect. And first is the wellness-informed pathway. In the States, we talk about trauma-informed practice these days. But you have to know what you're aiming for, and that's where you need to know what the possibilities are for human potential. What's our optimal way of being? so that you can then construct the pathway. This is a pathway that you can, we can identify in the societies that are sustainable. We meet basic needs. And it's through the evolved nest, which I'll talk about. Every animal has a nest. We do too. We just kind of forgot it. Uh, and you foster thriving by meeting basic needs. And you develop then a heart-mindedness, the center of being a human being is the integration of heart and mind. All the wisdom traditions say this. And then this leads to a, an earth-centered living know-how. So what are basic needs? Very quickly, you can see the top list there. Animal needs, nourishment, warmth, protection, safety, competence. 
a lot of adults kind of forget that, you know, we need more than that if you're a baby. You also need affection and play and inclusion. We're social mammals, so we need extensive bonding and community experiences, support, social enjoyment, building the brain in the, in the way that helps our uh, social and emotional intelligence grow. And then we have human needs for immersion in communal life, like the Ladakis uh, have indicated, have shown us, apprenticeship in adult activities, not separation into same-age child groups, right? No, multi-age living. And we need meaning-making. We need the stories from our culture to guide us on who we are and how we live well, and opportunities for self-expansion and healing, because we always, unfortunately, make mistakes. So this is the evolved nest. We study this in my lab, the nine components identified all over the world in these nomadic foraging communities. So it's soothing perinatal experiences. That means the mother is uh, supported during gestation, during pregnancy, at birth, a welcoming environment for the baby, uh, which I'm jumping ahead, kind of positive climate. Um, but also the breastfeeding on request. The baby's in charge of breastfeeding by mother or others and or others, depending on the culture. Positive touch, babies expect to be carried all the time and moving and it's growing their brain in so many ways. Positive welcoming climate for mother and baby. Self-directed social play, that means freedom to run and play with multiple aged playmates, uh, not the organized sports, although that's better than nothing. Allo mothers, other nurturers. This is not just a mom thing here. It's not just a mom and dad thing. This is a village, right? The village of care, a community of caregivers responsive relationships to meet the needs of whatever, whatever's needed by that child uh, without denial. In the United States, we deny babies what they need all the time. It's part of the culture these days. Nature immersion and nature connection, so we feel like we are part of this landscape, this bio community. We relate to this tree, this river. We have our heart connectedness where we are. And then healing practices routinely because we get out of balance in our sense of self or our health, our physical health or our relational health or our uh, relations with the natural world. These are the things that we study and find are valuable and actually core to localization. This is where localization starts, how we raise babies. Now, babies are different than children, and I'll tell you in a moment why. So I'm not gonna read all the slide information to you because I don't have enough time, uh, but you can watch this again and read it through. And we have a lot of information at evolvenest.org, videos and podcasts and various things. So in the, um, it's a little hard to read. Hmm. Um, brain, body, mind development is what's happening in those first years of life, shaping human nature. So if you don't provide the evolved nest to the young, you are shaping a different human nature, the kind of nature we see around, at least in the states, where there's not a lot of nesting support of children. And so you end up with people who are dysregulated and can't get along very well, and get mad easily, they're triggered, and they're depressed, and they're anxious. All that stuff is seeded in early life. Um, and, sorry, I can hardly read it here. This is why nestedness is so important. Human babies resemble fetuses until they're 18 months of age. So they need immediate response to their needs because their brains are growing so quickly. Millions of, of brain connections every second are, are scheduled to grow and all sorts of systems are setting themselves up on how they're gonna work for the, for the lifespan, like the stress response. If you leave a baby to cry, if you leave them alone, they're gonna be distressed. You're setting up the stress response to be easily triggered and they dissociate. If you leave them too long to cry, they just get disconnected from their emotions, from relationships, and they have a sense of distrust, and insecurity. They carry forward through their life. And then they're looking for ways to try to solve that, right? And all the addictions are part of what happens. <laughs> so babies are, you know, there's, well, I'll just keep going because I can hardly read it. 
So nestedness then leads to human thriving. And these are the characteristics we see in these societies that provide the nest. And the nestedness is not just for babies, actually. It's for all of us. We all need affection. We all need friendships, mentors. We need play. And we need nature immersion and connection. And we need to have e routine healing practices. And this is what uh, it looks like when you have that kind of environment, that kind of community. You have quiet minds, you're gleeful, vitality is a part of who you are, a sense of humor, uh, you're able to build habits at will, it's not so hard, you're attached to the ecology, you're connected to spirit, and you're in relationship, you enjoy being with others. In the States, we have a lot of people that don't enjoy being with other people anymore, right? Because that brain was not set up for social, emotional connection and intelligence. So we have uh, a lot of things on the right side then that are part of a community. Uh, a biology of love uh, is created um, from the nestedness, and it creates a compassionate human nature. And the way it does that, why it's so critical, the neurobiology shows us, is the right hemisphere is scheduled to grow more rapidly in the first years of life. And the right hemisphere is govern, governs our self-regulation of all kinds. It's our emotional intelligence and empathy and our sense of being in our bodies, allows us to transcend uh, and, and reach higher consciousness and develop a receptive intelligence to the natural world. So that heart-mindedness that, that develops from nestedness is the relational attunement, the ability to be here and now not concerned with resentments or worried about the future, but here and now uh, establishing an interpersonal dance with whoever you're with, an, an I-thou relationship. And when you use your uh, abstracting capacities, it's a communal imagination you have, not just about me and us. It's about all of us together and in part of the bio community, part of the natural world. So nestedness leads to an earth-centered living know-how, where you understand that every creature is part of an interacting dynamic whole. All of them are relatives of ours. And you understand that a things are right to do when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. And it's wrong when it tends otherwise. You have this deep in your soul. So what we've done in the last hundreds of years, although you know, the, the roots are thousands of years old, is we've shifted into the purple side here, the dominant culture, where we think the, the world, at least the dominant culture tells us this, the world is fragmented, the cosmos is fragmented, disenchanted, amoral, only humans have spirit, only humans really matter. The humans are the pinnacle of evolution or creation, and you're restless, you don't feel at home on the earth and you want to conform everything to some ideal in your head. And you hoard and you, know, you can't get enough because you have that hole in your heart. But on the left side, that's our heritage, all our ancestors. And many traditional people still have this worldview of a unified, sacred and moral cosmos where spirit pervades everything. We're mutually related with all. And humans are really the younger siblings. We have much to learn from the mosses, the trees, the animals around us. They're there as teachers. And we have, feel placeful. We feel at home in this landscape because we've been rooted here and have affectionate bonds with these trees, with these uh, plants, with these stones. And we fit in with the local landscape. We don't try to control it. We're partners and we share reciprocally. What we have now dominating us, though, are cultures, the dominant cultures, root metaphors. They've straight-jacketed our perception. It's really hard to shift out of the dominant culture's perspective because it just seems like this is normal, right? So it's patriarchy, and dualisms, us against them, human versus nature, male against female, West and the rest, emotion, reason, etc. And so there's an authoritarian coercion that's just assumed to be normal. That's how we control these evil human beings, right? Uh, and so there's a lot of violence and cruelty against nature, against children, and any others, those others out there. 
So there's a whole list there, the things you know, you understand, you've heard, you've felt, and you know there's something wrong with that list. And it comes from the underdeveloped right brain in early life, uh, which enhances then human survival systems. So we're born with the dominance orientation. That's pre-human. Uh, and we are um, ready to grow the relational attunement that I talked about, the communal imagination, but we have to have the experience. We have to have the nestedness to get there. Without it, we go to school and we learn this list and we become clever chimpanzees. So right now we are on this cycle, the cycle of competitive detachment. And uh, you can, if you're from the States, this is what I see in the States especially. We have extreme social poverty. There's undercare, number one there, developmentally inappropriate child raising and that plants feelings of insecurity and scarcity. There's not enough, because you never get enough as a baby, right? And then you're dysregulated on so many levels and layers and layers of dysregulation. You're traumatized, you're threat reactive, you see threat everywhere, you get triggered, then you go into that dominance fight or flight mode uh, or submit. Um, and then adults who are not very well, not very wise, and they have an exclusionary morality, us against them, you know, they always go into the black and white kind of thinking. And then they continue this trauma-inducing culture. But that's not our heritage. <clears throat> our heritage is a cycle of connected, cooperative companionship. This is, by and large, all of human societies, through all of our species' existence, have been in this cycle, it's only recently we've really moved into the trauma-inducing cycle. This is where you nest, you provide companionship care from conception, you build healthy psychosocial neurobiologies, adults who are well and wise, compassionate, and communities that, that attend to basic needs, all with the earth in mind. So, <clears throat> here and now, it's really important, then your attention is one thing you can control. You have a lot of things in your life that have been um, established by others, right? What you see in your head, television and other images get stuck in your head and you can't get rid of them, right? But you can control your attention. So this is what we need to practice as much as possible, to accept what is in this moment, to receive the life energy around us. Look at all these beautiful people here, right? Look at how we are together, bonded, creators, co-creators of Earth consciousness. See the beauty in the people you meet. Connect to the sentience around you. Revere the uniqueness of each person, of each tree. Enhance the well-being of others, wherever you are. And the San Bushman, who have been around for 150,000 years, their oldest culture on the earth, say, we talk too much. <laughs> Come on, get up and sing and dance. Dance the energy of the earth, right? So what I want you to do now is learn this song very quickly. I, when I take a walk, I sing this song uh, or other songs that I invent along the way. And this is how it goes. We love the earth, we love the earth, all our kin. We love the earth, we love the earth, all our kin. We love the earth, we love the earth, all our kin. And then I ask myself, who do you love? And whatever I see as I'm passing along, I say, oh, oak tree, who do you love? Ooh, grasses, who do you love? Dandelion. So let's try it again, and this time you're going to mumble or shout <laughs> something you love on your walks, right? Even over here, okay. We love the earth, we love the earth, all our kin. We love the earth, we love the earth, all our kin. Who do you love? Who do you love? We love the earth, we love the earth, all our kin. All right, thank you, I need to stop, so. <laughs> So remember, 
to attend to your own nestedness. And these are all things you can do on a daily basis. We have at the EvolveNest.org, uh, EvolveNest curriculum. It's all free, it's all nonprofit. Uh, where you, there are a lot of suggestions for that. So thank you very much. And the last slide, come on. There we go. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dasha. I'm going to look at our timekeeper to see how long we have. Uh, so I'm going to do a public service question. For those of us who uh, have underdeveloped right brains and are no longer in that phase of uh, accelerating development, what are the recommendations from your research? What I recommend is to play with children who are under age six and follow their lead. They are ready to run and jump and they want you to be there in the moment with them, right? And if, you're, if you don't play in the moment with them, they'll stop playing with you, right? So you want to keep the play going. Follow, that's the best recommendation I have. Other creative things that keep you in the present moment, painting, drawing, dancing, that, those are the things that grow your right hemisphere, which you can do all life long. In a, in a culture like the dominant culture that rewards psychopathy, short-termness, greediness, extraction, etc. How do you regulate these behaviors? You, we were talking about the sun earlier and some of their cultural practices. Maybe you could share a bit about how do we regulate the misbehavior of power elites who are rewarded by the incentive landscape of modernity? Well, the, the Bushmen and other nomadic foragers give us a model which we kind of maybe have to think about how to apply, and that is when a hunter gets a large animal, the other hunters will say, oh, it's so tiny, we should go back and, you know, get a rabbit, it would be bigger, you know, and they keep teasing the hunter over and over until he starts to laugh, and then when they're asked, why do you do that, it's called leveling, uh, they say, oh, if we didn't do that, you will become dangerous to us. And we have forgotten that, right? We, we grow big egos. We grow egos because we, we need to, when we aren't cared for well, you build an ego of protection, self-protection, right? And so we have to somehow uh, lasso the big egos and bring them back down to being on the same level with us, with everyone. Thank you. And in terms of parenting, one of the implications is that village-mindedness and collective parenting would be a way to create a more evolved nest. But in our atomized culture, apartment blocks, urbanization, heteronormativity, pair-bonded child-rearing, all the sort of traditional aspects of the Occidental lifestyle, how do we do that? How do we village parent? Yeah, this is the challenge of the century, I think, uh, to get back to understanding that we are all raisers of the children, whether we ha they're our own biologically or not, that we can all encourage the goodness in the child to nurture and nest them when we meet them. When you see a baby, smile and try to get them to smile because you're growing their brain in the positive <coughs> direction. So um, in terms of organizing, I'm not an organizer, a community organizer, but all you guys who are, I'm sure you're going to have great ideas about how to get back to uh, pulling our families together, you know, have parks in every neighborhood, have uh, drop-in centers for moms and children, have workplaces. I think the pandemic gave us at least an insight how you can work from home more and be with the children. Of course, you don't want to be isolated with the children. You want them to be with uh, multiple people so they can build, you know, a attunement to lots of different styles of being. Um, so there is a lot of things that we can do, but I think if we all nest ourselves so that we are in our heart-mindedness, that will enable us then to have this energy flow to whoever we meet uh, that is going to be a positive uh, kind of um, evocation of their deeper self. Thank you. Um, 
Maybe we will, do we have time for group session? Yeah, great, okay. So find a neighbor, maybe the other neighbor from the last session, um, and maybe we'll spend like three minutes in what were interesting, non-obvious insights or surprises that came from Darsha's presentation, um, ways to apply these into your life, and uh, maybe for you know the anarchists, how we hack the dominant culture <laughs> and, and apply some of these uh, in a larger cultural context. Can I just say, I have, uh, I think, 200 little flyers here with the Evolve Nest and QR codes. I'll leave them on the stage because we have a break after this. If you're interested, take one. Thank you. Great. So, yeah, chat with your neighbor, and you'll let me know in about three minutes, and then I'll let you know. Okay, we're just going to call everyone back to presence. You could maybe finish your sentence and know that we're going to have more time and space. Or not. Uh, so, so we're on break now. And the request is that we come back at 11.05. Uh, we're going to come back at 11.05 for an 11.10 start. Okay? Thank you, everyone. We'll see you at 11.05.
closest to the mic. That is the key to it. Yeah. And then it back in.
these are funny. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. Um, we're now, uh, we're about to have a session uh, food and Farming Revolutions. I'm Patrick Holden. I'm going to moderate the session. Uh, but before we do so, I just need to make one housekeeping announcement, which is, should there be a fire alarm, remain in your seats. The house manager will come and most likely direct us to the back of the building. And then I think we're good. we would probably assemble in Sh Charlotte Street. But don't worry. It's all going to be OK. <laughs> so I'm delighted to. Uh, uh, announce the beginning of this session, but we're going to head start it off with a video. So here we go.
Well, that was a, a sobering summary. Um, and it demonstrates that we've got a huge mountain to climb. And if you believe the uh, su suggested time span, we've got to achieve that transition. We really need to be well on our way within the next five to 10 years. And so it's really my honor to be uh, introducing to you uh, in a moment or two, uh, four practitioners who are walking the talk, who are each of them in their different ways, uh, part of the transition that we all need to see. Um, but I've been asked to set the scene a little bit, and I suppose perhaps one way of doing it is to just briefly tell my own story. Um, I was uh, back to the lander uh, in 1973. I grew up in London, and I, uh, I got back to a farm in West Wales in 1973. Uh, it was a, a rural commune, really, um, and it was my hour... Um, response to what we perceived as the growing ecological crisis that was affected, affecting farming. And I was inspired um, by glimpses of nature and a new kind of consciousness that was arising at that time. And we've literally just, in the last couple of months, celebrated 50 years on that farm, during which time we've been farming in harmony with nature, obeying the principles of the, cir the circular economy, trying to uh, sell our food locally and doing the best we can uh, to be part of the solution. And along the road, I've had a couple of day jobs. I worked for the Soil Association for 22 years. And then I moved in 2010 to set up a new organization, the Sustainable Food Trust. Uh, and our mission is to accelerate the transition to more uh, sustainable, local, agroecological, organic, biodynamic, choose your term, um, systems and I want to say something positive about the change because I believe that and it's following on really from Satish's wonderful optimism um, that I think there is an atmosphere almost it's partly maybe like animals that know when the tsunami is coming more and more, more of us know that we have to make a change fast and because of that I think there's things that can happen in the next few years that are almost beyond our collective imaginations. And I think that is exactly what's needed. And my small organization, based here in Bristol, uh, is working internationally to be a catalyst for that change. And one of the things that I want to say about uh, my work with the Sustainable Food Trust is that we believe that the change that is needed needs to come from work which is not just from the bottom up, and we're going to hear four bottom up stories, but also from the top down and in the middle. And um, w I have been inspired by an initiative called the Sustainable Markets Initiative, which the then Prince Charles, now King Charles, launched at Davos uh, in 2020. And of course, Davos is the World Economic Forum gathering, annual gathering place where all the quote, masters of the universe, and they are mostly male, gather to uh, plan their uh, progress for the next year. And he stood up at Davos in 2020, and he said, the situation we find ourselves is so serious that unless we involve the corporate world with the transition, we won't get there in time. So he convened, because he's got great convening power, uh, 20 task forces each sector of global business and industry represented uh, of CEOs. And if you'd said to me five years ago, th through my work with the Sustainable Food Trust, I'd end up being on quite close terms with some of the most powerful CEOs in the world, I would said, well, that would never happen. But weirdly enough, it has happened. So I now know the chief executive of Lloyd's Insurance or HSBC Bank, who actually came to my farm for lunch a couple of weeks ago, or supermarket heads. I know these people, and I'm even heading up one of the task forces on me measuring sustainability impact. So I thought it would be good for me to say that I personally believe that the change that we need can't be achieved without involving these people who are running the world at the moment and who are part of all the problems we just saw in that video. There's no question about it. But it seems to me that if we, the smallholder 
relocalizing disruptive radical organic agroecological producers of the world are going to succeed in our mission, we have to overcome a major econ economic headwind and policy headwind, which is represented by uncosted um, negative impacts which aren't financially measured, uh, which, uh, which are causing irreversible climate change, loss of nature. We heard yesterday in the State of Nature report that the catastrophic decline in biodiversity is continuing and terrible social impacts as well. And what I want to share with you is that these individuals are human beings. They have children. Uh, they are worried. They know that unless they take action quickly, they're going to be part of the problem. And they might even be a statistic, like Kodak, as it were. And they are worried and they know that their own customers are starting to um, exercise their consumer power by buying differently, and their show, shareholders are doing that, and they don't want to be a stranded asset and all that kind of thing. So I just wanted to mention that, because I believe that top-down change is necessary. In the middle, uh, this was also mentioned in the film, we need to have policy change. We need to make people account, accountable for the, financially accountable for the impact of their damaging practices, because if we don't, people like us won't be able to make it, and this is really my own story. So after 50 years, we're trying to produce products which are part of the solution from farming in harmony with nature. But we find ourselves relatively marginalized in the market because the price that we're having to charge for our products is so much greater than the cheap, apparently cheap, dishonestly cheap food, which most of us are buying in the supermarkets. It's a sobering thought that even in Bristol, this green relocalized food system capital of somewhere or other, England, the United Kingdom, the world, actually, we're hardly making any impression at all. It's totally marginal. The scale of the local sustainable food purchasing in Bristol is tiny compared to the overwhelming majority of the food that is purchased in supermarkets. And there are lots of reasons for that, and that's what we're going to discuss. But uh, so really my message is, we, the, the citizens, can be part of the solution, but we have to scale up our work. And I think we have to act as individuals, and we have to act as voters and influencers, and we have to mobilize fast, because if we carry on at the speed we're going at the moment, our food systems transition won't happen in the time available. So that's my sort of sobering summary, but I am an optimist. And so on that note, I'm going to hand over to our four speakers. So we're going to have half an hour of discussion, but I'm going to e ask each of the four speakers to tell their story. Um, and then we'll go through the four, four speakers and then we'll have a discussion and hopefully bring you in as well. So the first contribution is from Chris Mage. Chris, will you introduce yourself and tell your story? Yeah, thanks very much. <laughs> uh, so my story in a nutshell is I began my career as an academic social scientist um, I was kind of interested in peasant farming uh, systems globally, um, but I didn't actually know anything much about what peasants did on a day-to-day, -day, but you know, I had this kind of intellectual interest in peasantries, but knew absolutely nothing about farming or producing food. Um, so I put that right about 20 years ago, jacked in my academic job, um, became a small-scale market gardener, small, small grower, not too far from here in North Somerset. And I would put an emphasis on gardening rather than farming. You know, I think you know, globally we have about 75% of global cropland is devoted to just 10 crops, most of which are cereals or grain legumes, whereas everywhere there's a much greater diversity of local production in the hands of small-scale producers. So horticulture rather than agriculture, I think, is, is an important message. Um, so I did, I learned a few things about farming and gardening, and um, yeah, it's, it's quite hard. Um, it's, it's, it's a tricky thing to do. And the reason it's hard is basically the larger um, uh, economic and political structures rather than the, the, the growing itself. So when we're talking about the need for a revolution, um, you know, I don't think we need a revolution in food production. Every part of the world has figured out 
um, a, a, a low impact, diverse, um, uh, job rich agriculture or horticulture, and the problem is these larger systems, as, as Patrick was saying. So, you know, I've written a recent book saying no to a farm free future. That the, the whole language of revolution in food systems tends to be a, a kind of top down biotech argument. We don't need a revolution in food systems, we just need to to do what we know how to do locally, which is to garden and produce food. We do, however, I agree, though, need a very rapid transformation in the larger food systems um, around which um, production is situated. Um, and I, it resonated with me what uh, Satish Kumar said earlier, that, that, that we, we can't ask for change. We need to take it locally. And I mean, I've got enormous respect for people uh, on this panel I'm sharing with who are working at other parts in the system, I guess my approach is a kind of grassroots, bottom-up approach. How do we take um, power in the system? Any number of ways we can do that. Everyone is drawn to you know, what, what, what their skill is. My feeling is one key thing is access to land. As we become more local, uh, you know, in a country like the UK, um, uh, who owns the land has become less relevant as, as industrial global food systems have assumed more um, importance. So uh, organizations like the Land Workers Alliance, that I'm sure Jyoti will tell you about, or the Ecological Land Co-op that I've been involved with are, are doing things on that front. But really it's upon all of us to take responsibility for food locally in our communities and to get involved in, a, in, in accessing land for local food production. Um, and, um, you know, and, and again, to, to echo Satish's message, to do that collectively. You know, it's not about taking land aggressively, it's about um, understanding um, how we can uh, produce food locally if we have access to it. So that would be my, my one revolutionary change that we need. Thank you very much, Chris. So, Gioti, over to you. Can you turn them on? Oh, hello. We got it. <laughs> Hi. So, um, like Chris, I started out as a smallholder farmer here in the UK, going back to the land to try and produce food for the local economy, and uh, soon realized that operating in isolation like that within a system that was fundamentally geared against small producers, against local food economies, in a country where there's been underinvestment in local food economies and a plan for domestic self-sufficiency and the power of small shops and those distribution systems that support local food for decades was actually a very, very difficult task. And the question I have about thinking about top-down solution is who's at the top? What voices are at the top? In, in deciding where resources go to create the society we want. And in the interest of trying to make life easier for those people in, on the grassroots level trying to produce the food we need for our local communities, you know, using their blood, sweat and tears to produce our local food, I formed a union called the Land Workers Alliance along with other colleagues. Other people were experiencing the same difficulty of making it work because unions are a form of collective action. It's a way of bringing people together to fight the structural injustices, to create the sort of systems and grab political power, take political power, bring voices into that sphere so that we can make conditions so that we are actually getting what we need as a society. It's a way to form a just and equitable society. It's a way to try and make a planet that works for future generations. So the Land Workers Alliance, my union, I'm the head of policy there, and I do a lot of advocacy for the Land Workers Alliance with the UK government and internationally to try and make conditions better for small-scale producers. We're a union of small-scale farmers, family farmers, growers, community-supported agriculture, small foresters, craft workers, local food processors and distributors. And we work within La Via Campesina, a union of 200 million, 200 million small-scale farmers, family farmers, peasant farmers, and indigenous people across the world, representing the local food economies across the world. We call them agroecological food webs. And the bare facts that have been researched are that 80%, 80% of global food security is provided by localized agroecological food webs using 20% of global resources. 
Yet the industrial food chain, the sort of globalized trade that you saw in that film, the sort of you know, large-scale monocultures owned by corporations, only produce 20% of global food security using 80% of agricultural resources. And those are the ones driving us towards ecological destruction, you know, more hands in the power of the rich, and, and, and leading us towards, fundamentally, the fact that we will not have food security for future generations. We're expecting 1.6 billion climate refugees because there will be uninhabitable parts of this planet where our fellow colleague, peasant farmers across the world, will not be able to produce food. We are heading to that situation because the people that have the power are spreading the idea that our global food supply needs to come from this corporate food chain. So in order to reclaim that power, we formed a social movement because social movements are how we build collective power. It's how we reclaim the idea that we, as human beings, have a right to claim our rights, that we need to hold governments accountable to our basic human rights. If we think about food, We've for so long in this country believed that it should be governed by the market. The market is the very worst way to provide for our human rights. Markets may have a role to play, but we have to hold them to account. And government needs to be making a strategic plan for our food security. We have to hold government to account for that. And that's how we do it, is through collective action, through us realizing that we need to understand the structure of how all of this works, stepping up to our power and our knowledge, and collectively organizing to be able to create structural change so that everybody on the grassroots, across the planet, doing this work, is operating in the best conditions possible so we can transform this society into something so exciting by working together, collectively. Here in the UK, I'll go on more about how we actually do this, but, you know, believe me, the power is in collective change. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, you heard it there. And <laughs> so the, the situation is just so interesting at the moment, and this is going to uh, be explored in our, in our discussion afterwards. But my third, uh, our third speaker is Nelson Mudzingwa. And uh, Nelson and I have a Zimbabwean connection, which we just uh, discovered. Uh, but Nelson, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm a smallholder farmer. So I'm going to share my experiences on farming. Maybe just to start my discussion, let me say that there's only one professional job that is celebrated by everyone. Otherwise, those who can afford three times a day, and those who cannot afford, it's once a day. You can be a medical doctor, I cannot come to you when I'm not sick. You can be a teacher, but I cannot come to you when I'm not a child who is going to school. You can be an engineer, I cannot bring my car when it is functioning very well, but food production is celebrated by everybody three times a day. The biggest question is, the food producers in the global south are actually the poorest of the poor. And one person who has all the brains would ask why when everyone is eating three times a day and I was watching here, a plate is going for around 11, $15. If you multiply by the billions, who is enjoying those billions? The truth behind it is that the big corporates have captured the food industry. They've captured all the value chains. They've captured the seed industry. They've captured the machinery. They've captured the fertilizers. They've captured the pesticides. And they've gone further to practice a lot of land grabbing, causing what we call soft slavery, making myself a laborer on my own farm, producing on behalf of the corporate, poisoning my body, poisoning my environment, poisoning my animals, poisoning all biological diversity that was created by God. In Zimbabwe, we have had a successful land reform program. I'm one of those beneficiaries of the land reform program. In that idea, we have been a member of La Via Campesina and being a member of the Zimbabwe Small Organic Farmers Forum. 
Our agenda is that we need to have total agrarian reform. We need to convert all the land that we have acquired in Zimbabwe to become centers of excellency, whereby we want to bring farmers to learn from other farmers. Like, unlike the past, where there was huge commercial farm, farmers farming, where which was owned by very few farmers. The rest of Zimbabwe right now has become small scale holder, small holder farmers' land. Where we would want to emphasize a lot about saving our own seeds, where we don't need to buy corporate seeds, but we have already enjoyed our local seed diversity that has lived for years. Where we would not want to poison our soils, we've got these soils through a liberation struggle. So the agenda is that we cannot give ourselves any poisons. Where we would not want to let any single drop of water go because we are in the era of climate change. What best can we do to save the little water that we are receiving? So we need to, we are working so much hard to bring food sovereignty, to bring food to our table, to bring uh, nutrition to our table and to make our country very rich out of experiencing all these issues I've mentioned before. Thank you. Thank you, Nelson. Our fourth speaker is Margarita Basena from A Growing Culture. Thank you. Well, first of all, I cannot continue without mentioning that it's my pleasure and privilege to be sharing this panel with Nelson, with Yoiti, with Patrick, with Chris. Um, at The Growing Culture, um, we believe that stories are at the root of systemic change. It's very little times where a person feels a motivation and a call to action for change just by hearing rational data. It's complementary, it is important, it's important to inform our conversations with that, but mostly that call for action materializes when we understand that our struggles are interconnected, that my liberation is tied to your liberation. And in a world where food has become a commodity, um, at the growing culture we believe that food sovereignty is our birthright. It's the relationship we have with the land, the relationship, the birthright relationship we have um, with the earth, develop and nourish culture from that, and in the process of that, nourish ourselves individually and as a community. So um, in this conversation, I will try as much as I can to understand the complementary sides of the different struggles when it comes to the food system and food as a commodity and generate, not solutions, I don't think that's gonna, what's going to happen only in a day or only in an hour of conversation, but understand how the story around industrial agriculture, it's as, as an evil needed to feed the world, it's not a true story. I know I'm preaching to the choir in this space, but it's not a true story. So what are the existing alternative stories that we don't have to invent, that they're already there, and they're thriving and reclaiming uh, food as something more than a commodity? Thank you. Thank you all for uh, keeping to time and thus allowing more space for this conversation. So I just want to go back to a rain check on how well we are doing. Because if you look at greenhouse gas emissions, if you look at the state of nature and the impact of farming on biodiversity, which was reported yesterday, as I said, if you look at the social impact of the global industrial food systems that predominate at the moment, you could say we're not even gaining ground, we're losing ground. And yesterday I was with a guy called Chris Van Tulken, and you might, some of you might have read his book, Ultra Processed People. And he uh, was talking about how we are part of a feeding trial uh, where we 
produce our food industrially, uh, process it with additives, a range of additives which are entirely unknown to our bodies, and watch the result playing out on the human population. And one of the shocking things he said was that if you compare the young people of this country with even our equivalent generation in mainland Europe, uh, there are several inches of height difference. And this is because the diet that we are eating is compromising our health. So we are in a, a very serious situation. And these inspiring stories we've had, especially from you, GOT, who really are mobilizing a movement of change of hundreds of millions of people, somehow we are not making the progress we need to make. So I want to explore what the barriers to change are, and I want to ask each of you to comment on that, because we need to be honest with, the, with, with each other. If, if, we, if we want to see this change happen quickly, we need to work out why it isn't happening and what we can do about it. So Chris, um, what do you think the main barriers to change are? I mean, I think, you know, it's very much um, the, <laughs> All the things we were hearing about this morning, you know, we've created this, I mean, in, in my first book, A Small Farm Future, I talk about a kind of um, symbolic economy. Humans are really great at, at, at kind of creating these abstract ideas like money <laughs> and capital flow and, and using those to kind of create connection or flow that, that kind of overwhelms the, the, the sort of local ecological capacity and we've now built up such an edifice around that um, that there is, um, you, know, you know, it's very hard to kind of um, unpick it all at, um, you, know, you know, at the local level or even, you know, systemically at, at any level. What I argue in that book, you know, therefore, I mean, maybe there's a slight difference between us there is that... Um, I kind of don't really see a mechanism um, within existing state structures to to affect that, which is where you know my argument is the, the need just to get going with food systems or, or whatever system at, at, at the local level. I talk about what I call supersedure states, where I think you know historically what what has been the centre becomes the margin, becomes the periphery as states are trying to juggle and sort of keep all these balls in the air, increasingly they're dropping them, that's where the opportunity is locally to insinuate ourselves and start doing things differently. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's very much the message of Satish this morning of, 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 of getting together collectively, being the change and thinking about food locally and, and you know, seeing what we can do to, to, to kind of, um, uh, you know, creatively divert the course of the juggernaut rather than taking control of the juggernaut, which, you know, which, which we won't be able to direct. So, I mean, that so would be my take on it. Nobody here, I, I imagine, is going to disagree with the be the change uh, that we need to see um, life that you are leading. But isn't there something you think we can do? Because it does seem to me that's a little bit... Not, I don't mean it's defeatist, but I mean surely we want to influence the system, the economic and policy system which we're all operating under. And just to give you one example, yesterday this came up in conversation. The reason why big food is causing an ultra-processed population is because the commodities that, of grain, milk, all the key commodity crops that farming produces at the moment with all the commodity slave farmers are dishonestly priced. And that means that it's possible to produce this vast range of foods which are in supermarkets at below the price that we can compete with. And not only that, but if the farming systems were changed, we wouldn't have so much grain and all these raw materials. So surely you, you must agree, don't you, that there needs to be a change of policy and finance? Because uh, yeah, otherwise sure, we're yeah. stuck. Yeah, but you and Jyoti are doing a much better job than I could of uh, influencing. <laughs> I am a member, yeah. But, um, yeah, you know, the, the, I mean, we've got into this problem where, where fossil energy is, is cheap, human labour is dear, um, you know, there's the, the, the sort of creation of surplus capital is making it so costly for people to get a roof over their head and, and you know, as, as, as we've all been saying, the, the, the pricing of, of, of food bears no relation to any kind of meaningful 
ecological relationships in the in the world. But are you making it? You know, are you making financially? How is it for you? Um, oh, it's terrible. <laughs> well, although saying that, we have access uh, to land, and actually, our uh, you know, in terms of making what would be regarded as a as a, as a kind of viable income from selling food is is not great. But in terms of um, uh, you, you know our, our sort of input costs, and you know, there's a, a a big intensive pig farmer down the road who's he's so leveraged. You know, I mean, he's, his his kind of um, monthly input costs are hundreds of thousands of pounds. But so you know, that it's it's sort of finding our way out of that, which is why I mentioned access to land. You know, we have to, um, there's so many young people, you know, one of the encouraging signs I think in recent years I've found being involved in the food and farming system is so many more young dynamic people getting involved, but the problem is they haven't got access to land or a place to farm. So that is the, that's a kind of key point of entry into the system where local community organization and, and sort of greater knowledge of local food systems has, has got to be the point of change, I think. Okay, well, thank you. Jyoti, you, you've just had some yeah. praise from Chris. Uh, can you identify what is needed really to unblock this huge systemic barrier to change? Because we need mm. that, don't we? Well, it's bit by bit in starting to just um, be more bold with trying to work our way into the system so that we can actually reclaim resource. So I'll give you two examples of the type of work we're doing within La Via Campesina to try and leverage the power just to show a little bit how difficult it is. And I also want to give credit to Nelson here as being a real leader in La Via Campesina. Um, the, his organization in Zimbabwe was hosting the Secretariat of La Via Campesina and the voices of people from Africa, the peasant farmers from Africa, is one of the most marginalized voices there is in any of the spaces where power is distributed. And, um, and I think that's something we really need to acknowledge and recognize is that we've got to bring those voices, the voices of the youth, the voices of workers, the voices from, from farmers across the global south, and the voices of indigenous people actively into creating the solutions in order to make this change. So, one of the big campaigns we were running here in the UK, along with a huge coalition of people across this political spectrum, um, you know, from animal rights activists to, you know, people, the Countryside Alliance campaigners, was to try and fight the um, trade agreements that were going to allow in low standard imports that were produced to lower standards to what British farmers can produce here. And those trade agreements, we need to really stand up as a society to try and say, you know, we, we're allowed to have rules that protect our farmers' livelihoods, that protect our local food economies, that protect, um, you know, what we want to do with our future so we can create it according to the identity that we want to create it to. And um, it, it, was, it was actually quite a disappointing result because this huge coalition of people came together to try and put an amendment to, into the agriculture bill that would stop these low standard imports being, being allowed in. Yet, at the last minute, government managed to, um, you know, instead of putting something into law that lo put those low standard imports into place, put this like really wishy-washy committee that might look at trade rules into place in some way. Okay. And that was really disappointing. Right? Well, I just want to, I want to push you on this because yeah. the, it's absolutely right what you said. Yeah. The government has done this terrible job on <laughs> agricultural trade deals post-Brexit. I mean, yeah. awful. Mm -hmm. It's really a race to the bottom and yeah. it's just political. It's awful. But mm -hmm. Who's responsible? I would say us. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. basically, we governments, and I would say that mm -hmm. Keir Starmer would be no different if the Labour Party mm -hmm. get in, they do not think that food, sustainable food, is a political issue. Mm -hmm. So somehow, I'm just, I'm just want to call it out because I was on yeah. Great Lives with uh, Matthew Paris the other day on Lady Eve Balfour, and I read out the founding objects of the Soil Association. Back in 1946, the organization was formed, and the mm -hmm. third and the most important object was to create an informed body of public opinion about the importance of the relationship between the health of the soil, plants, animals, and people, and we failed. So the reason why the trade deal is so awful 
is because we didn't mobilize enough political force. So exactly. what are we going to do about that? <laughs> Organize more. <laughs> <laughs> get, you know, up your knowledge and get involved. It's your responsibility to get involved and see yourself as a political citizen that can hold government to account on these things. It's getting involved. And, um, and also to really like be active in our hope that we can actually create that change. So the other example I wanted to give is um, something that I'm actively working on with the Climate Justice Collective of Livia Campesina, but it's something that we can all hold as human citizens, is thinking about how we can have a, a, a citizen-led climate adaptation plan and try and get government to actually leverage resources to do that around our food systems. You know, right now, um, that, you know, that, that there's, uh, there's citizens mobilizing to go to the climate change talks, and each country has a nationally determined contribution that, that, that we, you know, put forward as a country with, you know, how many, uh, you know, emissions we're going to try and reduce, and, and then what money we're going to put forward to different packages in the climate negotiations, like loss and damages and climate adaptation. And um, th th there's very little actual say, you know, citizens aren't really stepping up to say this is what we want to see in our government's nationally determined contribution. And a whole part of that is about agriculture. And right now what's happening, I, I sit often as a representative representing farmers at the climate change negotiations as a representative of farmers in the world and as part of civil society. And what I see happening is that corporations step forward with initiatives like Aim for Climate, which is all about genetically modified crops, um, and, and more sustainable intensification, you know, using less land by having intensive farming so that more land can be spared for nature, and all these arguments for getting that climate adaptation finance that's out there for agriculture to be put into the corporate pockets for industrialized agriculture. And what we haven't done is step up and say, actually, we want this to be going to local food economies where you don't sell stuff all across the planet, where we actually keep food within our local food economies, to be looking at regenerating our soils, putting trees into the soils, looking at the seed-saving programs, the tremendous ones like the ones that Nelson and, and his colleagues across Africa are doing to have, you know, uh, like open source seed being bred that's highly adaptable to climate change, the millets and the jawars and the sorghums and all these amazing diversity of seeds that can be fed without using loads of irrigation. All these programs need financial support. There's vast networks across the world of agroecology training networks, farmer to farmer training that I'd love for Nelson to tell you about, um, that could be financed, but we're not stepping up and asking for our governments to step in and pay for that and letting the money go to the corporations. So, Nelson. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your resilient seed-saving, water-saving work, but also maybe you've got a perspective on what's stopping the change that we need to happen at scale. First of all is to say that um, the world of the farmers are not regarded as educated people. Despite the fact that they are the best scientists we have ever seen on Earth, because they actually are doing a lot of it on the ground in practicing, not necessarily wasting time reading books. They do it. So the work that I, I, I was explaining on water harvesting is actually practical work that we do to make sure that we don't lose any water. We know that the earth is losing water every day and we know the value, the sacredness of water. We don't treat water as a commodity. It is my birthright to have water and there must be that relationship between myself and water. And there must be that relationship between myself and the seeds that I grow. It is the food that I would want to eat, which is the nutrition that comes from all those seeds. But when a farmer is not allowed to keep those seeds, and when a farmer is deprived of favorable policies that support that level of seed keeping, that's where the danger is now. Are you being stopped saving your seeds right now? Yes. One example is the Union for the Protection of Plant Varieties of 91. That policy is actually depriving my right to save, to reuse, and to exchange seed varieties. And it is promoting foreign seed that we have never seen in our own community. And you can imagine if the birds of the air were being fed with the GMOs, what was going to happen? So what's wrong with me to be told to go to that direction? So such policies of that level are dangerous. And I don't think the world over would accept 
to go that way because we have never asked for such kind of seeds that do not do well within our own environment. And there is this policy that goes along with uh, feeding our soils, our living soils with poisons. I don't think there's anyone of us here who can s spend the whole day after just having a teaspoon of food. You, we want to give a plant a teaspoon of ammonium nitrate and say that plant can stay for three months. That's a joke. We want to feed the soil for the soil to feed the plants. So we need policies that support these practices that farmers are doing, which is not coming down to ourselves because the corporates, those who are benefiting the profits, are holding on to their theories, some of them which are very crazy. How are, they, how are the corporates responsible? Because I can talk to them. Yes, they are the biggest scientists that have created the, uh, this narrative that only science can feed the growing population in the world. But yet, behind that science, it's a million dollar project that they would want to achieve. It's big time money to sell fertilizer. It's big time money to sell hybrid seed, which has been put a terminator gene, which you cannot regrow for the next season. So you're going to talking to them, I think it will be important to inform them that we are refusing such kind of seeds in our own environment. I will do that. But I, I'm just saying this, I think at the root of this problem is a, is a deep misunderstanding. There's all this talk about climate smart agriculture, which is a term that is used very widely, even the term regenerative agriculture. Now, very often, I mean, people would have seen the advertisement with, for McCain's, uh, who, those of you who watch television, there's a wall-to-wall -wall advertising on Channel 4, Channel 5 for um, McCain's chips. And, you know, the, the rotation that the farmers are using is not regenerative. And so I think there's a deep misunderstanding here. And I, I, I think it's what worries me about this discussion is that there's so much energy and anger, which can be controlled into a positive form in this room. But are we reaching with our new ideas and our thinking, the people who are holding on to the power at the moment? And I think we need to do that. So a growing culture, you are a disruptive organization. Um, how do you feel about this discussion? We try to be. Um, well, from the story's lens and going back to where I can speak a little bit better, how we engage with reality um, is rooted in stories, as I already said. Human rights, statehood, legal frameworks, all of these things um, come from a story, and I'm not here to dismantle that, but depending where we stand or where we locate ourselves in time and space, we're gonna face different challenges and struggles. In this panel, I have Joyti here and Nelson, and they can speak more for the context of Zimbabwe and Africa, for the context of the European Union, um, and how we're dealing with these conversations. But where I can speak is from the need of having a paradigm shift when we relate to food. I'm saddened or I consider a tragedy that some politicians in this country or in this context think that food is not political or that sustainable food is not political. I don't know what stories they've heard around food. I don't understand how the connection of food and the land cannot be considered a political one because we, I mean, you cannot produce food without land. So in terms of... Um, how we can start changing these paradigms or how can we start telling ourselves and our communities different stories is that depending where we stand, depending who we are, we have to remember that we are not just consumers and producers, that we are more than that. And that in order for us to envision alternative ways of relating and nourishing ourselves and nourishing others, um, we have to start well, no, we don't have to start, but there are already a lot of stories in the ground. There are already a lot of alternatives existing. And we cannot envision a future if we cannot see it. So the idea of engaging this brain muscle, this collective muscle, 
uh, of ancestral futures, of radical alternative futures, it's very, very important for us to achieve and organize till the next step. So, yeah, thank you. Well, we've got, we've got another 10 minutes, a little bit more, and I would like to broaden this discussion. And I would, would it be possible for us to have an exchange which is short, because there's so much to cover, and brief interventions from yourselves and ourselves to see if we can get this conversation going somewhere, because it is the critical issue of our time, how we can accelerate this much needed transition, which isn't happening fast enough. So uh, if you want to make an intervention, could you keep it short, please? So, so, so the quest, one of the questions, maybe it comes directly from what Tracy has shared with us, is, is constructive engagement even possible without selling out? Because I'm just going to tell you what I think. I think we have to engage with these people because they are running the world at the moment and it's going very wrong and they seem to be winning and so I think we have to engage them. I've met Bill Gates. I won't say what I think, but I, I just say I think there's... <laughs> There's, he needs to be influenced, as do all these people, and we're not succeeding. So what can we do? <laughs> if there is a microphone, I don't know if there is, but if you can shout. Okay, so that's an important point. that We can't solve this with the people that are in power. We need different people. Okay, so that's a really important point. Can we, I'll go to you at the back, can we build a parallel system with a, the collection of our disruptive efforts from the ground up, which eventually will challenge the orthodoxy? That's obviously, arguably, one of the key questions. I'll go to the back and then to the front. Oh, okay. Hello, uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I have a, a farming project in Spain uh, and um, uh, been spending a lot of time thinking about this and <laughs> I think Tesla is a very good example of, of, of how change could happen. And I think when you start creating the demand from the public, uh, things start moving. When the politicians realize that this is what our voters want and when the companies realize that this is what the consumers want, then things start happening. I have very little faith in, you know, by convincing companies that they will change, by convincing politicians they will change. And I think, you know, the big uh, issue is that people, uh, we need to create the demand, yeah. and then you need to catch people. And unfortunately, good for the earth doesn't sell, good for you yeah. sells today. And how, how to change that narrative is, is the trick. And I think a lot of people are struggling on so many levels and when they hear all the negativity about the food systems, it's hard to take in and it's hard to get excited. And I think we need to build a...
positive story that draws people in through inspiration, a cultural movement that is, uh, sucks people in from a positive angle and not from, oh, all of this is wrong and we need to do something, but saying, whatever okay. is happening over there, but this is exciting, engaging, fun, rewarding, and attract people from a positive well, narrative. I think you make a crucial point, and this is you know, against what I said earlier about trying to influence people in leadership positions. Unless the power of the market expressed in purchasing the better food is there, even if you're a leader that wants change, it won't happen. So I think you make an important point. I'll just hand this microphone. Oh, thank you. Uh, hello, Chris. Um, just on uh, when you were speaking, I got the sense that you, you wanted to move away from a state solution um, and uh, one thing I wanted to raise is there seems to be a fear maybe from the 20th century of, of state-based solutions but with all their infrastructure and uh, power centers um, wouldn't it be better to move like we move from a theocratic society to a plut 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 uh, you know money-based plutarchic society actually to convert um, government take control of our budget and actually you know use our country and use the state to to improve the environment and farming Do you want to say anything to that? That's a big one. Uh, you know, I, I think maybe there's a tension here. You know, I, I very much agree with what Jyoti is saying about organise, but, you know, uh, the question is, you know, what, you know, what points of entry into the system are we organising for? You know, my feeling is it's not about communicating to leaders because they know exactly what they're doing and, you know, the... The system has become incredibly concretized around a dysfunctional model. Um, so for sure, you know, humans, we're inherently collective political beings. So the answer is not a kind of individualized or purely localized model, but it's more about, you know, where are the points of change within, uh, yeah. you know, within our collective political structures. And, you know, I'm certainly not saying that we shouldn't be um, you know, being active around, you know, trade treaties and, uh, and all the rest of it. But I don't think, you know, ultimately I think we need to be thinking about much longer term cultural change. You know, this, I mean, I'm a storyteller in my writing of a certain kind. You know, we all tell stories of different kinds. You know, my story is not about a biotech food revolution. So it's kind of how we, how we get to that much longer, deeper kind of spiritual change, um, you know, not, I think, about uh, sort of immediate uh, state yep. structures. Well, I, th I think this is really... What we're struggling to find, and I think this exchange is getting closer to it, is something which hasn't been achieved yet. And so, it's n of course, it's difficult to work out what exactly form this takes. But I think, I think if it was easy, it would have been done before. So we shouldn't be dispirited by the fact we're not easily just saying, oh, it's this or it's that. Can you? Oh, good. Um, can I put forward, oh, is it on? Yeah. yeah. Um, I just want to put forward two proposals that might help unblock the, the policy ch uh, chain here. The first is we should be taxing commodity trading. And that was put forward after the global financial crash, and it was defeated by the oil industry. And this affects um, foodstuffs as well, of course. Calming the markets. Most, I'm sure, I don't know so much about the food industry as I do about the oil industry, but I'm sure they are profiting simply from trading on, and on the volatility. And of course, as we get into this period of higher and higher prices because of climate change and war, um, they are, that's what's feeding them. Okay. So, yeah. can, can it, please. So I think one of the big issues is that we don't understand how food is priced. And that is, um, uh, we need to understand price reporting agencies and so on, which are so corrupt. The second big proposal is that we need state funding of political parties. If we want to get the money out of politics, we have to push for state funding. And this should be a cross NGO push um, because, because we have to stop the... Okay. Parties uh, reacting to who they pay, who pays them. We, we've only got three minutes left, which is so annoying, um, <laughs> because it, we, I want to go to each of you to just say final conclusions. But uh, taxing monetary in instruments for making sure that food dishonest food pricing is corrected by making sure that financial accountability is into all food transactions. I think that's crucial. I don't understand so easily the 
the second point you made, but I'm sure it's right. Uh, can we have a couple of, <laughs> a couple of, a very short, very short, and then I'm going to go to the panel to... Surely one of the problems with localising food production in this country is access to land. Something like two-thirds of our land is owned by 1% of people, most of whom are extremely rich and make money from industrial agriculture and so on. Thank you very much. That point was already brought up. Um, can you shout? Yes. Um, humans are also inherently curious and working in a small project, very humble, with a primary school, growing flax fibre, converting it into linen. It's a way to look at regenerative textiles. Education intervention very early on is a, is a useful way forward. Thank you very much. We have... Um, we have... I think education hasn't come up, but I think it surely is the key. And I'll um, just call this out. We have some uh, pupils and students from Atlantic College here, uh, which is great. Um, and th it's, <laughs> it's great that the next generation, it's all about you, really. So it's really the actions you take in solving these problems which are touching us all every day and which we must solve in the next two or three years, really, this, this movement for change, which needs to touch all of us and affect all of our individual lives and so that we know what we can do to be the change, is really the subject that we've been tr trying to struggle to identify what, that, what those things that we can do to be the change are. So I'm going to ask each of the panelists to just uh, make some closing remarks. I'll go in the, the reverse order, so Margarita. Well, um, there's not much that I can add, but in the words of Audre Lorde, um, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And I'm very inspired and hopeful to, to hear young voices as well, questioning the parameters on how we find solutions. Uh, often we can get in, entrenched in the systematic or structural constraints of how we landed here, but I also think that there's already so many alternatives existing, so many reclamations that are already on the ground, and yes, looking forward to more conversations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Nelson, thank you for all the work you're doing in Zimbabwe. What do you want to share with us as a closing message? Um, with climate change at our doorstep, I think this is the time now. We need the farmers, organizations, the researchers, the academia, government, and all other stakeholders to put our heads together and make sure we come up with a, a strong alternative that nature's mother earth. Giochi. I have one little story to give visibility to the fact that there is a parallel economy out there and it's thriving and we have to stop it being blocked. There's 90 million small-scale dairy producers in India with two to four cows each that hand milk their cows, bring them in the morning in churns, often on their heads, to collection centers that collect them and then redistribute them to people to feed the majority of people there. It's the largest dairy producer in the world, India, with 90 million small-scale dairy producers multiplied to provide at scale the dairy production for India. Yet, there's trade agreements being signed now by European governments that will undercut the protections that are there for Indian dairy farmers. They get 75 pence a litre. Often, farmers here get 14 to 25 pence a litre for their milk because there's no protections there. And when there was a threat to those protections there, the Indian farmers mobilized. There was one of the largest protests in human history, 250 million people on one day, and a year's worth of farmers mobilizing and surrounding New Delhi and trying to stop the liberalization of the policies that would fundamentally threaten that localized food economy that they've had and the fact that almost 70% of, of people in India are small-scale farmers. They mobilized and they won. Small-scale can win, mobilization can win, collective action can win. So, what a fantastic 
closing story, I should be milking our small herd of cows <laughs> in Wales tomorrow morning. And I, I don't know if you heard farming today this morning, but there was a wonderful mm -hmm. interview with a chap from Cornwall <laughs> who said that there used to be mm -hmm. thousands of small dairy herds in Cornwall with 60 or 70 acre farms, and they've all gone. And when we started milking our cows in 1973, there were 3,000 small dairy farmers supplying the local creamery, and now it's just a handful left. So we've got a job to do in this country. Maybe we need to learn from India, but thank you for that great example. <laughs> I guess, well, just building on that, I mean, there's, there's immediate politics. I think we need to keep our eye on the sort of middle range, sort of geopolitics, um, climate futures, energy futures, which is not within the power of anybody, you know, even the, the most powerful people in the world to control. And I think that's going to manifest in a very different class politics um, everywhere, locally, so I think, you know, my message is to really attend to, you know, who has access to resources locally and to try and turn that into, uh, you know, to, to the benefit of everybody locally with an eye to that kind of longer range, you know, political change and cultural change that's needed. Well, thank you everyone for participating in this exchange. Let us see what we can do to continue this conversation and make sure that Bristol and the community of Bristol and the wider uh, food systems which feed Bristol can be part of the solution that we've been discussing today. Uh, bless you all and thank you for your attention and for your participation and thank you particularly for our speakers. I'm not sure if it's ah, okay, it is on. <laughs> Wonderful. Can we gather ourselves again? What a wonderful gathering of the tribes. I'm just amazed with the energy of this place and, and our morning. I just want to also say hello to over 500 people who are watching this online all over the world. So we're not as few as it seems. Um, my name is Daniel Wahl. I'm a 
fledgling food forester on the island of Mallorca. I'm also an activist. I've worked with Guy Education and the Global Eco Village Network for many years. And I wrote a book called Designing Regenerative Cultures, which is currently translated into eight languages and soon 12. And our session today is Living Cultures Old and New. And it's a real pleasure to share this podium with um, Kaibo Oiba, who is a cultural anthropologist, an activist, and started a slow life movement in Japan. And the other member of this panel is Maura Gamble, who I've known of for 20 some years and met a few years ago. And Maura is really a legend to me in the permaculture movement. Um, she's done such brilliant work enrolling youth into permaculture and enrolling refugee youth into permaculture. She's the director of the Permaculture and Education Institute at Crystal Waters Eco Village, where she's lived for a quarter of a century. And we'll change the order of our presentations. We'll start with Kaibo. Hello. <laughs> Briefly about myself, I uh, uh, got trained academically in North America and uh, my uh, specialty was cultural anthropology, ethnic studies. But uh, while I was in, uh, living in Canada, I met uh, David Suzuki, renowned uh, uh, environmental activist and a scientist. So he inspired me so much that I became an environmental activist. So last uh, 30, 40 years, I have been um, trying to bring cultural aspects and uh, environmental, ecological aspects together. But as you, as you realize, you know, the world is quite, a, you know, separating all these different aspects, you know, social, cultural, and ecological. The kind of um, um, crisis that we're going through is not just environmental or ecological, as you know. It's a, it's a cultural and a social uh, dissertation um, that we are going through. So um, since I went back to Japan 30 some years ago, the uh, first thing I did was to bring uh, David Suzuki to Japan. He's a third generation um, Japanese Canadian. And I was away for like 14 years, so you know, I was quite new to Japan. So we um, walked around, did research, and uh, we wrote a book called The Japan We Never Knew. And we meant it. And since then, uh, well, that book, you know, brings sort of a culture, try to bring culture and uh, ecology together. I mean, he representing, uh, of course, the ecological side, and the me, more or less, you know, representing a, a cultural side. So since then, I have been kind of re-educating myself in Japanese traditional culture and trying to find the key words, key notions, concepts in the tradition. And um, later, I uh, started a movement called the Slow Life Movement. And it became quite... Uh, well, influential in Japan. And uh, so why slow? By the way, slow is one of the three S words that I regard very important. Slow, small, simple. Three S's. And uh, you realize that these notions can be found anywhere in the world. Every culture has these three notions. And in modern times, these three words uh, seem to represent sort of negative things, right? You don't want to be called small or you know, slow or simple. <laughs> but embedded in every culture, I think these three notions 
tell us how to live, how to live with nature, how to live with the, one another. And uh, another thing uh, is a set of three R's, no, three airs. Do you know what they are? Three airs, very important notions. That's fair, share, care. I invented this, right? So three S's and three R's. So I have been trying to sort of uh, uh, rediscover these notions kind of embedded uh, in or hidden sometimes, a lot of times, in Japanese culture. And I have been finding a lot of things. But today, we don't have time to think, talk about it. But um, I'll tell you, for instance, you know, somebody was earlier talking about uh, regeneration. Our notion of nature was originally meaning regeneration. Regenerate, you know, like Earth regen regenerating itself. For instance, there's a one philosopher and doctor during the Edo period, 300 years ago. This person was talking about sort of a Japanese version of Gaia theory s regarding every bit of nature, you know, like, uh, of course, humans and animals, plants, trees, everything is regenerating itself. He called it direct cultivation in Japanese, chokko. Okay, but this word, chokko, is not known, forgotten totally. Disappeared, you know. Nobody knows in Japan what the chokko means. So what I'm saying is that we have to reclaim these things. Of course, I'm not, I'm not saying that all those you know, Western notions of uh, you know, envir environmental justice and uh, social justice, human rights, all these things are not important. I'm not saying that. But it's time for us to go back to our cultural roots to re rediscover all these notions now hidden, you know, uh, dormant in our culture. Thank you. <laughs> there, is, there is so much in what you just said, Kaibo, that resonates with a kind of way of thinking and being that I've discovered through exploring what permaculture actually means. And I just want to take a step back because uh, it was way back in the early 90s when I was just a young woman, um, I met Helena at Schumacher College. And it was so wonderful to see uh, Satish and Helena up here this morning because it was them taking me under, my wing and, uh, under their wing and, and actually exploring what it means to live a simple life. I knew in my head, I'd studied sustainability, I'd studied design, I could write about it, I could be very articulate about it, but I didn't actually know what it meant in my heart, in my bones, in my elbows, in my knees. And it wasn't until actually being in a culture like Ladakh, my whole world was unraveled. My Western way of seeing things just kind of fell away. And so connecting the head, heart, and then hands, the question that I left there was like, well, how are we to live? How are we to live here in, well, in Australia and in places like this? And the nearest thing that I could find to this simple, slow, beautiful way of connecting was permaculture. It had emerged out of discussions in Australia, but deeply embedded in traditional and sustainable practices from around the world. And interestingly enough, the three core ethics of that are earth care, people care, and fair share, which is your air, air, air. And I really, <laughs> that, that resonated beautifully. Now, I then went to start to find, well, how is it that we can create the possibilities and the context that people can also experience this? If the transformation is not a head thing, we can understand, but if the transformation comes when we're deeply feeling it, it's like when, 
when the policymakers go to eat the food at Patrick Holden's place, when we feel it, when we ingest it, when we metabolise it, when we really deeply have it in our, in our soul, something shifts dramatically. And so I ended up uh, finding my way to a place called Crystal Waters Permaculture Village, which is a, uh, an eco-village. And I, as Daniel said, I've been living there for a quarter of a century now. I don't know where that time's gone. I also want to acknowledge that that place is deep, is, um, is the unceded lands or the stolen lands of the Gubby Gubby, uh, the traditional custodians of that land. And I spent a lot of time walking the land with the traditional custodians. And there's one particular man, Wurunga. And um, as we're walking through, I took him, I brought him into my garden and he didn't notice anything that I'd planted. He just started looking at all the other things and then, you know, harvesting a berry from here and then spitting out the seed. He said, that's how I garden. And just buried it in with his toe and, and then, we, you know, scratching a piece of bark here and finding some other foods. And he said, look, this, this is your supermarket. And I started to really try and internalise how to actually be in a place and be deeply held by a place and feel the nourishment of that place and understand that the land loves us as much as we love the land. And I think that part of the where I started to discover that was I planted this mulberry tree about 20 years ago. And from a permaculture design perspective, I'd planted it because it was providing shade for the chickens in the summertime and it was going to be chop and drop for the mulch, like all the things, you know, all the multiple dimensions that you do in a permaculture design. And then one day, this bird arrived in it. And the bird had come all the way from Papua New Guinea and it was calling out, it was calling out for a mate. And then I, I noticed that. And then a couple of weeks later, the rain started. And, and then I discovered that this is actually called the storm bird. Mm -hmm. And then the next year it happened again and again. And so now for 15 years, this same bird has landed in that particular one tree in now what I can't call my garden, it's our garden. And it has shifted my complete sense of reality about what a garden is. Because if I start to tend to the garden, it's not just tending for me, for my family, for the food. It's not just about the food. It's about all of life and creating cultural ways of being that nourish all of life. And so that was one relationship. And another one was really not trying to fill in all the spaces and acknowledging that we need to be considering how we enter into our relationship with the land that we tend from a whole species perspective. So there was this kangaroo. There's, there's actually mother's groups of kangaroos that live in around my, in my house. And the mothers all come into the, into the yard. And, and I don't know whether they're drawn into it because for the last, you know, 15 years or so, that's been my world as well. And one day I was out there with my young baby in a sling. And... And I've always talked to the kangaroos. And one day I was sitting out there with the baby in the sling and she had her joey in her pouch. And she just like opened her pouch. And she said, look at my baby. <laughs> and so I just went, oh, here's mine. <laughs> and it was the most magical moment. And in order to be able to think about how we enter into that slow, simple, beautiful way of being in creating the spaces that are the nests and raising our children and ourselves and our families and our households in an environment that really nourishes us and there's a deep sense of connectedness. So I want to... Thank you. So, Daniel, with all the work that you've been doing with regenerative cultures work around the world, now you've found yourself deeply embedded in your own food forest. I wonder how that shifted your perspective of how change happens in the world. Thank you for that question. Yeah, it's, I resonate strongly with what you shared of how coming home to place has been healing for you and has changed your worldview. And I, I can feel that I'm three years into the story of being the custodian of just a little bit over an acre of land on Mallorca and I planted 300 trees and um, brought in from an organic um, mushroom growing business 
14 trucks load of um, really rich compost. And to see how this caring for the land is a reciprocal relationship is, has transformed me. To feel in my body the, the communication that happens when you go into deep relationship with a piece of land. That you find yourself walking off thinking you're going to do this and then you 10 minutes later you're somewhere else doing something else and you kind of go, I wanted to do this, but this actually called me. Uh, I, I very strongly feel in dialogue with the land. There's a couple of things that, because of this beautiful title of the sessions, Living Cultures Old and New, um, that I wanted to highlight in this context, um, which is we too often put the, the whole meme of transition, the whole meme of we're in a mess now and we need to create a future utopia, keeps us trapped in a way of thinking that actually disempowers what's already going on here. And with my book, Designing Regenerative Cultures, I now hear too many people talking about regenerative cultures as this future utopia that they would like to create. And I think what we need to anchor, like if we want to create a better future, we need to first remember our past. We need to understand that, as somebody said at the opening, we are not a cancer on the planet. We have the potential to be a regenerative keystone species, as was said. And the truth is, none of us would be here if for the long arch of our journey as a species, we had not been gardeners and careful tenders of the ecosystems and the bioregions that brought us forth. Really, the big shift is to understand that we, we cannot be owners of the land, we're expressions of the land. And coming back into this deep practice with the land, which I feel is also a privilege, you and I have the privilege to have land to do this, I, I feel it's really important to also anchor the notion of regeneration as a core principle of life. I love the fact that in Japan it was actually part of the word used for nature, because that roots us in our indigeneity to life. We have all been born into life. Um, here in Europe, we got colonized by other European empires early. We got traumatized by that, and it took centuries of unprocessed trauma, the, the, the plague and all those other things, that ultimately led that trauma to be imposed on others through colonialization. And so, I find, while it's critically important to give voice to the indigenous people who are still living cultures, expressions of place, let's not build up a, another dualism of indigenous versus non-indigenous. Let's remember that life is flowing through us. Gregory Bateson once said that the unit of survival is not the individual or the species. The unit of survival is the individual, the species, and its environment. Really, life is a planetary process. I'm nothing but a permanent manifestation localized of this ongoing process. And that invites me a little bit into one thing that I would like to hear you is, is can we talk about living cultures without changing our attitude towards death? Can we embrace collapse of systems that no longer serve? And maybe, paradoxically, if as a species, we get to the point that we care more about life's ongoing journey than about our own individual or collective survival, we have reached the maturity to actually build that regenerative future. So I would love to hear a little bit more from Kaibo about what you learned, learning your own culture again, because it's, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of a um, friend of mine, long-term CEO of Guy Education, May East, saying, if we try to Trying to create your future without knowing your past is like planting cut flowers. I want to encourage um, like graduate students, if 
somebody is, <laughs> graduate student or researchers, you know, who uh, is interested in Japan, Japanese culture, look up this name, Ando. That's the philosopher I mentioned, you know, from 300 years ago. Not, you'd, you will not find much, you know, but the, it's really worth rediscovering him. Um, anyway, he was talking about the, this regeneration, you know, r roughly translated as regeneration, right? And um, that's, I think, that can be found in many other cultures too. For instance, you know, uh, you, I, last night I mentioned the Satoyama. That's another very important key notion in Japan. And this is used in many societies now as, uh, as Satoyama, the Japanese word is used. Satoyama means um, it's basically a agroforestry system, you know, Japanese version. And it uh, has a sort of a human, you know, area and a buffer zone, and we have a forest, right? So uh, people had um, quite a self-sufficient uh, life for a long time. Um, historians, the last 10, 20 years only, that discovering that uh, we had a period, historical period called the Jomon. That's another keyword, Jomon, which lasted more than 10,000 years. And uh, there are some uh, uh, archaeological sites where we found that people were living there constantly, settled and lived there constantly for more than 10,000 years. I mean, when I was a kid, I never learned this. You know, now we are discovering it. And uh, since then, we have been basically, I mean, until recently, we had a very sustainable life. Until, let's say, 100 years ago, or 150 years ago at least, um, each village, we had um, about 40,000 villages. They were all self-sufficient. Of course, there were, you know, quite active trades and things like that, but basically, 100% self-sufficient. And up to only 1960, we had 80% self-sufficiency in food. But today, Japan has almost uh, nothing as self-sufficiency. This is a very, very violent pro process. You think that Japan is uh, one of the success stories in globalization. We are the winners, you know. But this success came with really great, I mean, tremendous, horrifying loss. And uh, we are now going through environmental crisis and also mental, psychological, and spiritual crisis. Our children, harming themselves, killing themselves, you know. And we were the second after Britain, England, that uh, we set up a ministry of loneliness, you know. Uh, I think th these things are all, you know, inter interrelated. This healing that needs to happen, it's intensely powerful. I teach permaculture teachers around the world and a lot of people come with this deep yearning, there's a deep longing for something else. They know it in their heart, in their bones, like I was saying before, there's something else. And, and young people too. So what, what I think is really amazing is to be able to create those spaces where people can come and immerse themselves. So that's part of that slowing down and taking the time to, to be in the land. One of the first projects I started was a city farm, actually, in the city of Brisbane. And there was a young man who came there and he didn't say much, but he, he and he, I realized later he didn't say much because he had an intense stutter. He was full of trauma and anxiety. And 
over time, just from the slowness of people being present and sharing meals together, growing together, just, just talking and taking care, I, I noticed that he started to join in some of the conversations. Within a year, this man had started organising all the events and the garden tours, and his stutter had actually gone. And every time I looked at around this community, I would see this healing that was taking place by being held by the community and being held by the land. Now, there's something quite profound too that I've noticed in the work that we do with refugee communities in East Africa. So this Perma Youth Network that was actually started um, by a group of young people out of eco-villages, rippled out across the world and somehow landed in these refugee communities. And this is part of this process of myceliation that I'd like to maybe touch on if I can at one moment. But in the refugee communities, the young people saying, like, mostly in the refugee camps, this is in throughout East Africa, they're young, they're under 17. Over 50% of the young people in the camps are under 15. They have, they can't go back, they can't go forward, they have no money, they, the food that's like $3 a month that they're getting given to buy rubbish food, suicide, depression, violence is rife, rape, everything. And part of what they're saying when they're exploring permaculture in their localised form, in their local language, they're saying this is peace, this is hope, this is possibility. For the first time in my entire life, and I've grown up in this refugee camp, I feel like I have a future. And I think there's something deeply powerful about that being, being held by this emerging culture. I think permaculture somehow gives us a portal to remember. And that's, that's what I like about it. And you were saying there's other, other words and other languages. I actually feel extremely clumsy now with the English language. I keep feeling these things. I have no way of expressing it to you except to describe the feeling or to explain, you know, that kangaroo moment. I don't have a word for what that is. Uh, and uh, one of the key things that I've discovered too is like, you know, we talked about, you know, how do we change the system? I think if we start to think about our nervous system as a system as well and how we change that and how we feel whole, we show up in every single moment, in every single day differently. And that matters. I'd like to pick up on this, um, let's not get stuck on creating future utopias. Um, the, my personal theory of change with 12, 13 years almost of trying to do what I can humbly to influence and nurture a different future for the island of Mallorca, which I moved to specifically because it was an island, because that makes it a bounded bioregion where we don't have arguments about where the bioregion ends and where it stops. Um, I, be I believe what we need to do is to make acts of caring, loving, nurturing, restoring, regenerating visible again. And we need to do that in such a way that we've, we've been silophied ourselves. Some people feel more identified as social activists, others as ecological activists, and then you get a discussion whether what's more important, but rather than going into that space, to actually, within a given territory, make visible to each other all caring, sharing, nurturing. The organization that helps single mums, the organization that tries to protect the badgers, the organization that teaches permaculture, and begin to learn that that is a manifestation of life's regenerative impulse flowing through us. That that is the regenerative cultures we don't need to create in the future, but we need to fan the embers of it in the present. What? <laughs> One of my mentors, and this is going to sound a bit conceptual, but actually it's really to the point that I spent a lot of time at Schumacher College 20 years ago, and it transformed me. And the Masters in Holistic Science there, and one of the teachers, the, the founder of the Masters, Professor Brian Goodwin, one of the leading um, mathematicians and biologists who started complexity theory. He, I asked him once, okay, if 
if we can't predict and control the system that we emerged from and are parts of? How do we influence positive emergence? How do we influence positive change? And he said, paying attention to the qualities of relationships, paying attention to the quality of information that flows between agents in the system, and making that system more visible to itself already creates the basis for positive emergence. And that, for me, links very closely to this planet local. What is local? Local is fractal. Sometimes we've been talking about farms that are, whatever, 70 miles away from Bristol, and they're still somehow supporting the local food system. So let's also focus on the pattern of re-inhabitation or the pattern of dwelling in place that we've had at a species. In ab Aborigine culture, they weren't sedentary, they moved around, they had eight seasons and they stayed in the... F not, not that we can all go back to being m migrants, but what, it, what, what I mean is they had a real sense of territory in terms of region. And for me, the, the notion of bioregional transformation is actually somewhat the, the missing link, because having been in the permaculture movement, the transition town movement, these ultra-local initiatives are needed and vital, particularly for the takes a village to raise a child part. But the real juice is when we connect these villages and even the cities within their regions to a new coming home to the region. And then we connect these regions internationally with each other. Three minutes left for all of us, so better hand over to Kaido. <laughs> I'll give you one example. Um, in Japanese traditional culture, right, people train themselves to recognize 48 seasons. Have you heard of a haiku? Yeah, I, I recommend you to start a haiku. <laughs> you know, I had a program like that in Thailand, you know, like teaching people from different backgrounds, you know, different countries, to learn a haiku. See, haiku is like a five, seven, it's a, such a short, short, shortest form of poem, right? Uh, sometimes it just uh, can include like a five words, you know. And one of them has to be seasonal word. How ecological is this? I mean, you know, it's amazing. And we, we have to rediscover that, that side of culture, you know, each of you. Uh, relearn, to relearn how to connect ourselves to the rhythm of time and, and the seasons. Um, earlier, sorry, I'm taking too much time. There is a word that in, intersubjectivity. So I, I feel sorry for English-speaking people, you know, like intersubjectivity. <laughs> we have a perfect word in Japan. Intersubject, interbeing is embedded in our everyday life. Sorry. <laughs> Just one last little. We have this sense that uh, the small is not powerful that it's not enough. And I often hear this, oh yes, but the problem's so big, that's not enough, we can't just do that. Everywhere I've been around the world, everyone I speak to around the world, you just scratch the surface slightly and you will see and you will feel this movement there. There's this myceliation that's going on and every now and then you'll see these little mushrooms pop up, of, like it becomes visible. So the change, a lot of the change is happening in the unseen world that's not yelling out there. And I'm not saying that it's either or, we need all of it. But what I want to say is that there is an enormous amount of power in the unseen, and we just need to add compost to it and to shine a light onto the mushrooms so that they can then spore and, and land the spores in the fertile ground to myceliate even further. And I really think this theory of change is so empowering and enabling for, for everyday practivists around the world. Wonderful. 
we have to draw it to an end. Um, I just want to end with uh, my favorite quote by the Dalai Lama, which is, if you think you're too small to make a difference, you've never tried to go to sleep with a mosquito in the room. Hello, just before you leave, hi, my name is Anya Lundbeck from uh, Local Futures. Just a bit of housekeeping. So we got lunch break from one uh, to two. It says 2.10 in the program. And that's because we would really like you to be back at two. There are loads of places to eat out in the streets here, unfortunately, and also in the cafe, uh, but nothing uh, provided here, except for the speakers. Uh, whom we are taking care of. They should meet on the lawn outside and we'll, uh, we'll walk together. But please be back at two outside. There will, in the afternoon, be three uh, slots of breakout sessions, eight to choose between. They take place on two, in two different venues here and at something called Bristol Folk House. But if you meet here at two, please look at the program beforehand and choose the sessions you want to go to. And there will be a guide that will take you to the room that you want to join. Thank you. What? No food allowed in the auditorium, I'm told.
Well, hello, um, welcome, thank you for coming to this session in which I and Bio will be talking about we don't know what. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, neither of us has met before today, we've yeah. created a friendship already, <laughs> and we're just going to take the conversation where it may wander, but I'm going to begin by making some reflections for a few minutes and then ask Bio to respond to that and then the conversation will kick off. Yeah. Okay. So I, I warn you, by the way, that there's a war going on between technology and me. And, and usually whatever I'm doing that's technological suddenly fails. So if, <laughs> if you can't hear me, um, I apologize. Um, It seems to me that we often conceptualize our current predicament as a series of perhaps, to an extent, unforeseeable problems that just happen to be besieging us at the same time. We were doing so well, and then suddenly somebody said, the weather patterns are changing. Somebody said, the seas are poisoned. And it's not like that. All the many-faceted, wicked, aspects of this predicament are the foreseeable consequences of taking a certain toxic point of view towards the world, ourselves, and the relationship between them. And I want to take us in this conversation, I'm sure Bio does too, to some of the root causes. Because my view is that we can put a sticking plaster on a cancer, but unless you actually radically treat and remove the cancer, you won't have if effectively caused the change that is needed. Because that change is not superficial, it's in the hearts and minds. So we could do all the right things, but if we don't actually change our minds and our dispositions, it will be worthless. So, here are some reflections by you. Relationships are primary. Everything is a relation. There are no things as such, only the things that emerge from a web of relationships. That's important because it means that you can't take anything out of the context without altering radically what it is. It also means that nothing is independent of everything else, and you can't just have a one-way effect in anywhere in this living system that is the Earth. Whatever you do has a feedback effect on others and on yourself. And then I'd like to say, not only is isolation not the norm that we then have to relate, but relationship the absolutely pervasive condition which we sometimes misconceive as isolational elements that are somehow linked post factum, but also the world, the cosmos, is intrinsically alive. So it's not just that life is a rather freakish thing that has turned up in the cosmos and the normal state is inanimacy, but inanimacy, if it were to exist, would be the limit case of animacy. Similarly, although we were taught that in Newtonian physics, the natural state of things is to be at rest and motion can only be brought about by something added into the system. No, the complex system that is life and the cosmos is eternally in motion. And stasis, if it could be said to exist at all, which I believe it can't, would be the limit case of motion. So I just want to lay that down. And then I just want to say, there are three very important things that follow from an animated view of the world that are quite different from the inanimate, materialistic, reductionist idea that you find out what something is by taking it apart and taking it apart until you've effectively got nothing. Um, and then you wonder how something came out of nothing. 
the trick is that the something was already whole. When you took it apart, you destroyed what it was. So in this way of thinking, I would just like to link this to the two hemispheres of the brain. This is something I've researched for 30 years. A lot of you will know about this, but effectively, the two hemispheres pay attention to the world in two different ways. And this is evolutionarily important because we need to be able to grab stuff, but also to look out for the whole picture. And what has happened is that the left hemisphere is specialized in enabling us to use, utilize the world for our own ends and purposes, to grab, to get food, um, uh, things with which we can build a shelter or a nest. It helps us to do that, but it doesn't see the big picture. The, the big picture is seen by the right hemisphere. Now, if you pay attention to the world in two different ways, various things happen. If, if you pay a certain kind of attention, which is very detached um, and objectified in a certain curious way, you find that the world only exists as little bits that are fragmentary and inanimate. This is the left hemisphere's attention, which isolates and fragments. You, you end up with a world that has no meaning. That you have to, if there's any connection, it's something we put in. But in the right hemisphere, it sees that everything is fundamentally connected, flowing, changing, and always only understandable in the context. And that brings me to the final point I want to make before we move on. The three thi we think that happiness will come from fixing various problems, enabling us to live longer. God knows why that would be a blessing. Um, it, it would come from amassing material goods that give pleasure. But anybody who knows anything about happiness and the hedonic treadmill will know that this is no solution. Instead, we need meaning in our lives. And that meaning is not something we paint on. It's not something we generate to cheer ourselves up in our hermetically sealed cell without any windows. Some scientists talk like this. No, we are here, I believe, to respond to a universe that embodies values such as beauty, goodness, and truth. We don't make those up. We either respond to them or we don't, but they come before us, not out of us. They come through us. And so the things that would give us meaning are our belonging in a world of social beings. That means a community that is a genuine community where we share beliefs, we share food, we share company, and we help one another. The second is the natural world. Our relationship with nature is fundamental to who we are. It is not the environment. The environment is a technical thing that might sit around us. That's what it means. And you might end up with a department of that because it's a bureaucratic invention. No, nature is the thing that is always being formed, always coming into being, never entirely predictable, and gives life to the whole. And our relationship with it is critical. And in recent years, we've seen it as something just for us to exploit. Because as, I, as you probably know, I believe that this left hemisphere mentality, which is basically geared to power, has taken over it, it's needed in some cases, it's not that it's useless, but we need it to be under the, the aegis of a hemisphere that sees other greater, profounder, spiritualized values. And that brings me to the third thing that would lead us to being fulfilled and fulfilled and happy as human beings, if happiness is really what it's about, which I'm not sure that it is, would be the relationship with the divine. So I think we've We've, if you wanted to make people really miserable, you'd cut them off from the natural world, you'd disintegrate society, and you'd tell them that only simple-minded people who weren't educated believed there was a divine realm. So I'm going to hand that to you now. Oh, you've got your own bio. Yeah. <laughs> so. Maybe one more time. Ladies and gentlemen, Ian. <laughs> uh, we uh, we uh, were supposed to have a conversation, a serious conversation, and then we met today, and we we're like, what are we going to talk about? Like, okay, let's talk about, it seems this 
this, there's this aliveness to localization and, and speaking about it, but this doesn't feel like the time or place to speak about localization. We want to meander a little bit, right? And so Ian mentioned a a meandering, you. yes. And so Ian mentioned jazz, and that's what we want to we want to jazz things up. So are you open to jazzing things up a bit? <laughs> um, I'm just going to ask Ian just your permission to do this in the spirit of um, what you just said about relationships. The world isn't a container of already predetermined items with stable identities. The world is a meandering, um, autistic, seeking, fugitive performance of relationships that often congeal into a thing, but are constantly being, uh, moving and fugitive. So in the spirit of that, I would like us to stand up. Can we do that? If you can stand up, please stand up. And, and find, find two or three people. See, this is social technology. <laughs> this, is, this is huge stuff. This doesn't really happen, especially in pandemic times. This is criminal work, okay? <laughs> what I'd like you to do is to find two or three people, hug them so tight. <laughs> you know what to do. Let's model this. <laughs> Just to get us started. <laughs> Two or three. That's the... Um... Not four. <laughs> Five is right out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All righty then. All righty then. That is quite enough. Thank you very much. <laughs> it never goes according to plan. You say two or three and people are just like, no, six, you know, let's go more. Um, thank you for that. How does that feel? Um, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to dance with some of the things that my brother here has said. And he does feel like a brother just met, like I've said. We share um, disciplinary backgrounds. I may not be as adept as, at speaking about hemispheric partitions as you are. Um, but I often describe myself as a recovering psychologist, <laughs> recovering from all that training. And, and, and there is a story to that. I'm not sure we'll get to it, but I'll say a few things about what he just said about relationships. And I want to just try to premise this, um, dig this into the ground, that how we think and experience the world and feel and notice and know, these are not isolated things that happen in isolated bodies. You know, modernity is the presupposition that we are individuals, neat and tidy, conceptually separate, ontologically distant from each other, right? That you have your private thoughts and I have mine, and never the twain shall meet, right? But there's a sense in which it is becoming increasingly difficult to think of ourselves as separate and separable. We're finding in small homeopathic doses, I'm just gonna let that linger, <laughs> that we are, and I know we say this all the time, we are entangled, but, but it needs to be premised and fleshed out even more. And I'm just gonna take a cue from Ian's um, introduction to speak about that a little bit. Now, um, um, I'm going to use entomological examples to, to help us situate this, this entomology, the study of ants. Now, I'm not sure how many of you spent your teenage or childhood moments burning those critters, 
with magnifying glasses and things. No, no. It's just, this, this is the right crowd, right? Now, this is in church. Um, well, some of us did. Well, there's an example, a fascinating example from that world that might, you might have heard of, and I've been speaking about this quite a lot. Um, it's called an ant death trap. Have you heard about it? Has anyone heard about an ant death trap here? It's a spiral. Um, ants going around in circles. You, if, if you know what I'm talking about, just raise your hands in the air, wave it like you just don't care. You just don't put it in there. So ants going around in circles. They just go around. And these circles could be as large as a stadium. And some could fit on your table. Right? And they just keep going around in. They just keep going around. And I'm not going to get into the mechanics of this accident of some kind, at least from our anthropocentric perspective. It feels like an accident, right? Some pheromonic trail gone wrong. A GPS system is broken. And so they're unable to find, especially with the ants that are the army ants and can't see. They just get, you know, in such militaristic fashion, they secrete pheromones, which are semiochemicals, chemicals that help with meaning making. And they tell each other, keep going. We're almost home, right? I often imagine to myself, this is the kind of thing nerds think about. Um, I, I dream, I imagine to myself sometimes that they have motivational speakers among them urging them to just keep going. You're almost home. But they, keep, they go around in a circle and then they die in the circle. They die in that trap. That, that's the reason why it's called the death spiral, right? They die there. Does this remind you of anything? <laughs> right? Um, it, it's not just ant, spirals, maybe an anthropos spiral, right, to some degree, that we are often dead stuck in patterns of repetition while urging ourselves that we're doing something new and prolific, but we are stuck in reproducing patterns and algorithms of oppression in networks of suffering. And we tell ourselves, all we need to do is get geniuses in a room, right? And we can outthink all our problems. That doesn't seem to be the case. I'm hearing some syncopated sounds, and I'm not sure where that is coming from, but it's jazz we're doing here, right? So it's, uh, it's, uh, jazz is syncopation. So, yeah, well, I'm going to riff a little here. You, you want to uh, riff? Look, okay. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I want to make a frivolous, but not entirely frivolous point, and, and a slightly more serious one. The, the, the relatively fr frivolous one is I want to stand up for ants and okay. their pheromones, um, because they can also be enormously clever. I discovered that there are, um, I think they're called ant scouts, that are set out to look for a place where we can have a new colony. Yes. And what they do is they go into perhaps a cleft in the rock, and they go, damn, left my slide rule, left my computer behind. So they have to work out what the area of this thing is. Mm -hmm. That's a quite a tricky thing to do. So what they do is they, they leave little trails. They walk at random around for a while, and they leave little trails. And then they go away. And then they come back um, hours later and see how often they encounter the scent that was left by them a few hours before. Now, obviously, the bigger the area, the fewer encounters there will be. And they are so accurate that by counting the crossings, they can produce um, a result of 1.96 for an area that is twice as big as the one that they were using as a standard. So they're, they're pretty clever. They don't just go around and round in circles like human beings, you know. <laughs> no, but this happens. <laughs> what? This, the, the, the circular repetitive pheromonic accidents do happen. They and do. They do happen. And, and I, and I want to use that as an example to notice how bodies, 
human bodies as well are often enlisted, right, in patterns of repetition. Yeah. Right. It, it, I mean, one question that often comes to me when I think about this, yeah. this cyclicity, this toxic cyclicity, is how do breaks open? How do portals open up in this carceral system that might allow us to experience the world differently, do new things with the world, right? Yeah, yeah. Experience each other differently, find new ways of building new alliances with our environments, our ecologies. How do we break out of this? So, yeah. No, I was just going to um, say, I thought you were absolutely right, of course, about the stuckness and the tendency to repeat. But in any system, a correct assessment of the situation will involve finding a balance between repeating a familiar pattern and innovation. So, for example, if you throw away all the received wisdom about something and try and start again, you'll be very foolish. Yeah. On the other hand, if you only stick with what's been always the case, then you become fossilized. And the trick of life and thriving is to find the balance between those. So, let's take this nuance and complexity and hold space for a few thoughts and provocations that I want to offer um, around um, relationship and, mm -hmm. and breaks and freedom and emancipation and decoloniality and a lot of black scholarship and what it has offered to our conversations about the question, how do we break away from problematic, troubling patterns of repeatability? Mm. And how do we find new ways of being in the world? Because it is often the case that the way we respond to the crisis is often the crisis. Quite right. Yeah. right? And, and we can get stuck in, in doing things exactly. that are, you know, a brother of mine, his name is Orland Bishop, he would say, you know, when uh, our rituals no longer have any grit, that's when we are in trouble. Mm -hmm. Who was in? Who was at Burning Man recently? You, but you know the story about Burning Man recently and mud. And I was just thinking about the ritual of walking because walking is a ritual. A, a brother, another brother of mine, calls it falling with style. Right? It's a, it's a position of vulnerability. You stick out one foot, but you land on the other foot, and 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 so on and so forth. And then he, you know somehow walking wasn't producing mobility at Burning Man because the, the ground refused to offer the surface tension with which that ritual might happen. What happens when our rituals no longer take, you know, is, is, is the question I want to hold space for using the materials of Ian's provocation. So I'm just going to offer a couple of thoughts here. And I'm dancing through some news pieces that I heard and read about recently, um, and in no particular order. One is the story of scientists in Japan climbing Mount Fuji and Oyama and finding that there are about 6.7 to 13.9 pieces of microplastics in cloud water, mm. right? That is, in a, in a litter of cloud water, in, in rain water, there's microplastics mm. now in the most beautiful places in, on the planet. Mm. The, the world is already, you know, the idea here is that we're already breathing in the capital O scene. You mm. know, the capital mm. is no longer outside of us. No. It has never been. I, I saw a picture of a turtle with a Pepsi logo mm. on its back, mm. right? There's no way to easily divide between the organic and the corporate no. <laughs> any longer, right? Our bodies are relating and they're, they're you know, our bodies are no longer items. Mm. They're matrixes yes. of, of cohabitation, right? And so that's, that's one piece, that we're breathing in plastic, we're drinking plastic, mm. we are sensorially 
adapting our bodies to plastic in some sense. The second piece is, is of story, news that I read um, a while ago, is from some scientists in New Zealand. And they, who here has read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, okay. And you know the number 42 is, <laughs> is the answer to everything, right? Mm -hmm. So these scientists found that 42,000 years ago, 42,000 years ago to be specific, um, there was a polar shift of some kind. Mm. And this polar shift um, of the Earth's magnetic core mm. proliferated dangerous toxic atmospheres that rendered the surface unlivable. This drove the, those proto-human populations into the Earth to form subaltern communities and around the planet, almost at the same time, was the emergence of cave art. Mm. If you've seen those pictures of red ochre handprints on cave walls, then you understand a little bit about what I'm talking about. The crisis drove us into rituals of descending into the earth and performing art of some kind. They had no way to tell each other, okay, guys, you're all underground safely. Okay, now we do art together. There was something, some kind of enlistment. I'm trying to bring our attention to the fact that we are not individuals acting upon the world. That is the story of the liberal world order, that we're individuals acting on the world. It presupposes that we are outside of the world acting upon it. And this is where a lot of veteran exhaustion comes with activists because we presuppose that we can change the world, right? But I'll, I'll, I'll stop there for now. I know you want to mm, say something. Well, no. I mean, I suppose on that very last expression, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because we know that none of us singly can save the world, but if we all thought like that, nobody would do anything. So we have to start from somewhere and I think we need once again a kind of dual level vision here. We need to be able to think about things that can only be achieved when we act together but also things that come from within us. So I'm very keen on the idea that the force that is important here is something like the soul. In other words, there's something in us that we need to listen to and to change our values so that even if it's only in our own life, and that's where we must start, you know, and, and Satish was saying the famous thing, that, you know, you must be the, the change you want to see. So we do have to start with our own lives, it seems to me. It's not, it may seem irrelevant because we have a very objective left hemisphere idea about size. So it's just me, what does that mean? But how big actually are you? How do we measure? you or your relationships. How big or small is the relationship between you and your most loved partner? How, uh, size doesn't come into this. And it's curiously defeatist to think in terms of such um, measures. So we need to begin by mending ourselves from the inside. And that's an ongoing process. We're not gonna just achieve it tomorrow. But unless we do that at the same time that we start to change things on a bigger scale, we're going to, two things are going to happen. One you already um, referred to, which is that very often the things we're doing to try and mend things actually are part of the problem. Um, and, and they can be distracting and they can also be destructive. So we need, unless we actually embody the right motivation and the right, what, I would, what I'm calling the right um, uh, mode of, or disposition towards the world, then what we're going to do will be counterproductive. So that, that's really what I'm saying, is that we need to be thinking in, in, in a sort of bipolar way, that nothing just exists without its opposite, that everything has that other opposite. The West never sees this. But it's been known throughout the world that the thing and its opposite coincide. And if you go far enough in one direction, you simply produce the very thing you were fleeing from. So you need to have a more sophisticated view of something and the relationship it has, the necessary relationship it has with what we call its opposite. The two co-arise. 
And it's, it's finding the way to use those together, not so as to make a flabby compromise, but to, so as to hold the tension between them. This is the root of wisdom. You don't make a good apple pie by choosing bland apples. You go, yuck. You take nice tart apples and lots of honey. And, and that tension is what gives life to it. And it, it, it's like the, the image of a bow or a, or a lyre that produces a sound, produces the shot that you want, is that you have to hold tensions between things. So I just want to throw that into the idea of how we look at what we're doing. We need to first deal with how we are thinking and work on that hard, which I think is to espouse certain practices as a part of one's daily life, and probably just spend some time, I know people are going to say, so what do we do? So I'm just going to come out with a few banal things, but to spend some time in meditation or contemplation or simply, or not, not so simple, mindfulness, which I think is incredibly important. So to start dealing with that, to surround yourself with people who embody the ideals that you want to follow. And to, I've always found that changes come from not from being convinced of an idea, but from being impressed by the way of life of a living being. So the people, my teachers, who really impressed me, it wasn't because they told me something that was a piece of information. I mean, they did that all the time. But it was the way they were as a person. And I thought, that's really good. I want to be more like that. And just as you can't, you know, if I want to imitate somebody's voice or the way they walk. I can't, there's no rule I can consult. I just have to feel it and do it. And the same thing if you want to imitate somebody for good reasons, you have to feel it and do it. So in, the, in this process, we're doing things here, we're doing them on the more left hemisphere practical um, side. And I have to put in a word, I put in a word earlier for ants, I'm gonna put in a word for the left hemisphere. Um, uh, it is, after all, my second favorite hemisphere. And uh, I mean, it, I mean, it can't all be winners. But it, it actually is very, very important. The title, The Master and His Emissary, of my earlier book, suggests that the emissary is a good emissary. It's just not a good master. And this kind of thinking we have, the very literalistic, procedural thinking, is not nothing. It's, we have to thank it for main, many comforts of modern life and ability to tackle diseases and so on. It has its role, but in itself, it can't lead us because its leading value is power, only power, power over things to change them. And that's great if we have wisdom commensurate with our power. And at the moment, the power is escalating exponentially, and I don't notice wisdom doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you, brother. Um, So, so there, there are beautiful points of convergence here in how we're framing this, and there are also points of divergence that I want to explore it, and in, within the time we have left. Yeah. And that, it, it's, it's, you know, I started to convene this idea of, and I'm just going to name it, I call it the sensorium, right? And the idea of the sensorium is to help us see that we are being enlisted in ways of behaving and ways of acting that are not reducible to our bodies, our individual actions, or the ways that modernity has formulated accountability or responsibility. That there is a sense in which behavior is ecological, territorial, like ants in a circle, right? That wasn't an attempt to put down ants. It was just a noticing of the phenomenon of ants in a circle. Uh, give me a magnifying to, glass and I'll polish off an that, ant. That, yeah. that is a therapeutic, psychotherapeutic moment that, <laughs> that, that, that will come afterwards. There's a couch behind. Um, <laughs> so I'll, I will lie on the couch. Um, but Damn, that, I was going to rely on it, I was hoping. But, but the idea here is, is, is to notice that we, we are often trapped in patterns of behaving. Um, I read another piece, and this is another piece that feels important to mention here, that noticed, and I mentioned this to someone earlier, um, that in times of global warming, 
it seems to be the case that human brains shrink, right? It, it, shrinking happens when the world gets warmer. Right? It also happens when they become civilized. When we get civilized, which is, which correlates with yeah. warming. I mean, farmed animals have smaller brains than their wild counterparts, and farmed people have smaller brains than Homo heidelbergensis. So it seems important to notice that the divide between the internal and the external are not as clear as they once were. Um, things happening at large are also our bodies in response. Again, how we respond to the crisis is the crisis. And we're looking out in my formulation of things and in the nourishing scholarships that have informed my thinking, the indigenous insights and neo-materialist feminist insights that inform my thinking. We as a people are being called to occupy cracks, the breaks in the world where things don't cohere as, usual, as easily as they once did. The places of failure, if you will. The places where capitalism has stuck up its nose and said, this doesn't count. In the places where the city says, this doesn't count, that's where the seed of fugitivity can thrive. That's where the seed of new kinds of upheavals and uprisings can thrive. You know how the ant gets out of that dead spiral? Does anyone know how? Well, I don't have David Attenborough's voice, but I wish I had his narrative voice to actually walk you through that. One very powerful way it happens is by infection. Infection, fungal infection. Who's watched The Last of Us? Yeah. The Last of Us. No one? Okay, Every okay, good, good. It's okay, you're not spoiling anything by raising up your hands. <laughs> Um, Codiceps, this fungal entity, infects the ants with spores, and the spores escape into the ant and takes over the ant's body. But somehow this hybridization of the ant leads to something fascinating in a dead spiral. The ant breaks away from the spiral. It breaks away from its trance. Now this is not an invitation to get infected, <laughs> but I'm asking, what are the forms of conceptual, ontological, philosophical, spiritual infection that is calling us out of the convenience of modern citizenry to explore the world in ways that are yet to come? I'm not a utopian fellow. I don't think about the world in terms of destination. I think about the world in terms of meandering, strain, and losing your way. Because my elders say, in order to find your way, you must lose it. So I'm all about the ant straying away from its, from its carceral perception. And that sensorium is about the major beat. Who here plays music? Just, uh, yeah, you know what I mean by the major key or the downbeat, right? It seems even our activisms play the downbeat, which is the imperial continuity, the tendency to uphold um, organizational structures that even in our attempt to pull down things, we are upholding their architecture. So where does decay happen? And how can decay be this prolific emancipatory moment for us to experience beyond experience? That is the question. I will be there. I think we should dance. Okay. <laughs> Um, is that the end or, or yeah, the, that's clock time says I'm from Africa and we have African time and African time. What, what does that mean? We have 10 more minutes. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Um, yeah, no, I, yeah, I, I mm. love that. I mean, one of the very obvious, I mean, it's, it's very nice to hear about ants. I mean, one of the things I <laughs> worry about is the zombie fungus ants, you know. The, zombie. The, <laughs> Zombies. Where they're taken over and they do things that are entirely unnatural, like climb up a tree to a very precise point and cling and on sprouting. to a leaf and then yeah. where they die and they fall down and they shower spores over yeah. the other. So, diseases can take us over and change the way we behave. And I believe that's what we're in now. A cancer is a very strange thing. Cells are so cleverly organized and so beautifully coordinated. 
and so intelligent that it's extraordinary that some of them just go rogue and start to consume their host. They, they eat up the resources. Anybody who knows about cancer knows that it, people with cancer get thin. The answer is the cancer is eating all of their metabolic strength and energy. And it eventually kills its own host. Now, there's an, an analogy there with the world we're in now, where a certain part of us has gone rogue and started to consume extraordinary, exponentially large amounts of the resources that could be shared in another way more healthily. So I want to just take that idea that sometimes we can be somehow infected and find it hard to break out, as you say. I love the idea that sometimes the infection can help you get out, <laughs> but it might kill you just afterwards. But um, the, thing, um, <laughs> the thing that um, comes to mind for me is when we think the answer to a problem that has been created by over mechanization and over administration and the dead hand of enormously expensive bureaucracy that slows down things, dulls imagination, kills expertise and skill. It, the answer that it's not going well is never, well, maybe we should do less of this, but the answer is we must do more of it. So you've got an exponential growth of bureaucracies trying to solve a problem of which bureaucracy is a perfect instance. And, and that's kind of important because it makes very concrete what I think we're both saying, which is that you can repeat a certain pattern, mm -hmm. which is actually part of the cause of the problem. Right. And uh, the only way we can stop this, it seems to me, is if enough people see it. And so I think what you and I, I hope, can do, Bo, is, is to sort of, in our various ways and, and you know, to, 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 to help people see something that is toxic. Mm -hmm. And then perhaps when people suggest, well, what we need to do is more of the same, go, hang on, we're imaginative beings, we're creative, that's why we've got to where we are now. Don't stop being creative now and just start repeating. There, there, there's something there, brother. There's something there about um, speaking and continuing to speak and hoping that people see, right? There's, I, I like that. But there, there are also limitations to people seeing stuff, right? Oh, and oh, I'm sure you acknowledge oh. that. There, there's, I mean, we could teach, we could break everything down in a pamphlet. We could, the, the, the liberal world order is premised on the idea that if we only just get the word out and keep on educating people, they will eventually get it. But human behavior, is it premised on escalating pieces of data, right? Like, oh, if I can get more information, now I finally get it. So I can change my, no, we are constantly building fidelities, which we often name or pathologize as addiction. But we are constantly building tentacular relationships with furniture and intensities and trauma and arrangement and algorithms. That means that we are much more than just beings awaiting more information. I think Franz Kafka, who has read The Metamorphosis here, I'm just dropping nerdish stuff, right? I, I think he had uh, his, what's his name? Uh, Gregor Samza. Gregor. Yes, I think Gregor had it the right way. The way to respond to capital, the way to respond to the brutal oppression of the city is to become a bug. Yes. That's, what, that's the thing to do, right? He, he, he started Chose the wrong bug, though. I don't well, think he became an ant at all. No, think. not an ant. <laughs> but, but he became a bug. Mm. And you know what becoming a bug or becoming monstrous or becoming invisible means? It means you're no longer available so, for surveillance, right? You're, you're, you're invisible. And this is what Deleuze, the French philosopher, called becoming invisible. How do we co-create crafts and practices that render us invisible to surveillance strategies? How do we become more than human? How do we become fugitive? How do we appropriate the tactics of those bodies stolen from Africa in the transatlantic slave trade where they hid their gods underneath the noses of their colonial masters? I ask this at a time when white stability is dying. And by white stability, I don't mean white people. Whiteness is not white people. Whiteness caught white people too. Whiteness is a social 
cultural project for arranging bodies in an apartheid system, right? It can also use black people like me, right? So whiteness is a more than human, post-human process of racializing bodies to fetishize the world for the isolated, dissociated self, right? That paradigm is dying. It's having a difficult time resourcing the separability of the individual. It is our task, our vocation, to render useless this stabilizing project, to steal into the cracks and do something with the machine. Do you get that? No. <laughs> Absolutely right. Of course, the idea of how we become somehow better humans or more than humans is the thing that the AI um, <laughs> death ride is, is, is supposed to be taking us there. But I don't want to become cognitively improved if it no. simply means processing data. I want to be a better human being. That's and transhumanism, no, no right? No computer is going to help me become a better human being. Because no. unless you've suffered, unless you have emotions, unless you have a body, yeah. unless you know you're going to die, unless you see the depths of the, of the universe, unless you see beauty and complexity mm -hmm. and richness there, which no computer can do, because those are feelings as much as they are thoughts, then we're going in the wrong direction. So let's all take heart from the fact that we can do things personally and we can do things actively together yes. to move towards better values. That's it. <laughs> But, um, <laughs> there we go.
Hi, folks. We'll be starting in about a minute. So if you could make your way out if you're not staying, and if you are staying, do come in. Okay, we're going to get started very shortly. Okay, can we get underway then, please? Can I invite the room to come to a, a gathered silence? Wonderful, thank you. My name is Rupert Reed. I'm a recovering academic. I just uh, retired. Um, I've written a number of books, uh, including this little number, This Civilization is Finished. Uh, I helped to launch Extinction Rebellion, and I, now I've just launched uh, the Climate Majority Project, which I mentioned a little bit about uh, to you uh, this morning, in the session this morning. And I'm delighted to be joined today by Andrew Schneer Magnusson, who is perhaps best known for this extraordinary book on time and water, uh, which I, I want to recommend to those who haven't read it uh, very, very highly. This is one of the best pieces uh, of writing on and around climate, simply that there is. It's just one of the be absolute best. So, um, Andrew, thanks so much for uh, being with us here today from Iceland. And basically what's going to happen here is that I'm going to say just a few words to frame the session, and then the two of us want to have a conversation. Uh, and the conversation is about the, the topic that you've been promised. Uh, I will explain that title a little, or we will explain that title a little if it's uh, mysterious to you. Uh, we're just going to talk about it for about half an hour. And then we want to make sure that there's at least about 15 minutes at the end for Q&A and discussion involving the room. And at that point, there will be roving mics and so forth. OK, so I'm now pulling out my copy of the program. No, that's not it. Have you got a copy of the program? To make sure we get the title right. So what we promised to uh, talk to you about is a transformation so mythic it breaks our very language. What are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about what we call climate change. But that term is so spectacularly inadequate that we wanted to spend some time talking through that inadequacy and how we might start to get to a place which was a little more adequate to reflect the sheer magnitude, horror, grandeur, profundity of the transformation that we are in the relatively early stages, actually, of going through together. We want to address that on a linguistic basis, partly, because we think that language is absolutely crucial here. If we're going to enable people to really feel, understand, and respond adequately in the kind of ways we've been talking about so far here today to this crisis, which, of course, is greater than but has arguably at its center, the climatic transformations that we're just starting to see, then we're going to have to language this better. But we're also going to make sure that in our conversation we get to talking about some of the other ways in which we need to change the, the way we figure this in order to actually get into a position to take it seriously and to realize that this is a transformation so vast that it's worth using this big word, mythic to talk about it. 
So I hope that makes basic sense as a, a plan for this session. Uh, before I hand over to Andre for his initial reflections on this task that we've uh, set ourselves, uh, I'll just note one thing, which is that I think that a base level to start here is to be aware that the term climate change was deliberately chosen, in effect, by scientists and in particular by uh, leaders in countries such as Saudi Arabia to be the term of choice for this phenomenon precisely so that it would be as undisturbing as possible. Now, if you want to understand that process more fully, I'd recommend you to read the book by Stephen Poole called Unspeak. Uh, and Poole's book begins with this marvelous anecdote from the life of Confucius. Uh, Confucius was asked, um, Master, what would you, what would be the one change that you think is the most important if we're to make our society run well and have it be well governed and well administered? And Confucius's reply was, I would rectify the names we give things. I'd give things their right names. We can't get anything right until we get that right. Uh, and whatever else is true, I think it's absolutely one million percent self-evident that climate change is the wrong name for the phenomenon that is usually termed climate change. So we need to, our baseline should be looking for, for other terms. We can start by going to terms such as the term I use in my latest book, climate breakdown, which is much more real to what's occurring. But we want to, we want to go beyond that and, and go deeper than that. Andre, tell, tell the room something about some of the ways that, that, that you see this coming from your kind of literary background, coming from your Icelandic background, coming from your serious, deep engagement with these issues. Yeah, thank you. It's uh, great to be here with you and all of you guys. Um, so I'm, I've been writing for 25 years or more, poetry, fiction, non-fiction, science fiction, and uh, I met a client, a climate scientist in Potsdam, and he asked me, why don't you write about climate change? You know, you're a and I said, I don't have authority. My father's a doctor. He hates it when laymen are giving medical advice. You know, he spits his coffee in the morning. If drink, eat more avocado or something, he's just, he just hates that. So, so I had this respect for the field. I shouldn't intrude into somebody else's field, like I think you're doing with your philosophy degree. Uh, but he said, but I produce data every day, and people don't understand data. They understand stories. Yeah. And I started to kind of... I felt like I had some kind of permission. And he said, if this isn't woven into stories that a normal person feels he has authority to speak, then nothing will change and the world will end, basically. So, uh, so I took this kind of seriously and I felt I had this authority and I started to read and I, and I told my friends I was going to write about climate change and I could see how their eyes glazed. They were like, oh. Uh, not again. <laughs> and, and, and I was like, how can the most serious issue, like the fundamental issue of everything, be taken like that by my friends, like as something boring? And in a way, you could say that much of the climate talk is boring and we get this kind of herd immunity against it. So the next time they asked me, I said, I'm writing about time and water. And then they were like, wow, interesting. Uh, and, and, and what do you mean? Well, in the next 100 years, every single element of water on our planet is simultaneously going out of balance. That is, the glaciers are going down, the ocean level is going up, nature is leaving geological speed of change into a human speed of change, uh, the pH level of the oceans is changing to a level not seen for 50 million years, permafrost, ice caps, uh, rain, snow, seasons, it's just moisture, it's just all simultaneously going out of balance and, and within the lifetime of a single human being. And they were like, wow, that's serious. <laughs> and I was like, yes, <laughs> it, it's sometimes called climate change. Uh, so, so it's like how words can frame things and empower, like mansplaining, you know, like the habit of a man speaking down to a woman like she was a child how that word kind of just disarms that, those habits. But then a word can also seal things, like climate change, and just, just you think you understand it. So then I went to go deeper into this and how to write about the issue. 
Just one quick yeah. note on those of you who are here in the last session. It's, it's quite similar, arguably, to what the point that Ian McGilchrist made about the word environment. The word environment is a, is a dead word which has been imposed precisely to cap feelings and a sense of connection and so on and so forth, unlike words like uh, nature and life, I would, uh, I would suggest. It's, it's, I think, somewhat similar to the point around climate change. Yes, and, and then just basically, when you start as a writer to write about it, how language fails you and, and how the issue is larger than language. Uh, and what does that mean? So if I say, for example, something that I got from a scientist, it's not my opinion, so in the year 2100, we expect the pH level of the world oceans to drop from, have dropped from 8.1 to 7.7. .7, and this is the greatest change in the world oceans for 50 million years. So I said this. Would you have cried if I said 7.4 in the pH? You know, would you be like shaking on the floor? Uh, you know, so, so in a way, every word that I said is meaningless. 2,100 is culturally meaningless because, because I think everybody here agrees that 1970 was 30 years ago and, and 2,100 is after 100 years. And, and this cultural kind of how 2,100, no, 2,000 was like imprinted and we don't even have a language of, to talk about the 2011s or, you know, we, we don't even, we can't refer to this century. It's just a one post-2000 period. And then... So 2,100 is just culturally meaningless. Uh, the pH scale is abstract. How can you scale, how can you understand a, a logarithmic scale and how serious that is? And then 50 million years is too big to grasp, but it means that a single human being born today becoming as old as my grandmother is witnessing a greater change in the oceans than not only all the ancestors of man, if man is 300,000 years old, all the ancestors of the homo species, if we're five million years old, but 10 times the evolution of humanity. I don't remember what kind of a raccoon we were 50 million years ago. But, and that, so the claim mythological is not yeah. shooting over the top. This is mythology. This will be remembered after 10,000 years if we get through this in your yeah. throughtopia. So, so, uh, so, 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 in a way, I felt the challenge of writing about it and talking about it is it was like the black hole. You can't look straight into a black hole. You can't just say pH 7.1, no, 8.1, 7.7. Uh, the only way, so to understand 2100, I had to go to my grandmother's house and, and go, to, like the black hole, you always go to the periphery, to the neighboring stars and galaxies to understand the scope of the black hole. So to understand 2100, I had to attach to the past. To grasp the scale of science, I needed mythology to be rational. I needed poetry. I always needed to go the opposite direction. And to be global, I needed to be personal. So, so I felt like this was not a straightforward challenge of making scientific language simplified for the layman or for me and my friends. But it was also explaining to the scientists what they were finding. Yeah, that's right. That, so part of our thinking is that... <laughs> part of our thinking is that when we're trying to actually understand and communicate climate, the language of science can only ever be one element of that. And it needs to be profoundly contextualized. And we think a helpful way of thinking about this matter is to ask the question, what will this climate break down? How will it be referred to in, say, a thousand years' time? Right? Well, it might be referred to as climate breakdown. I think more likely it'll be referred to as something like the catastrophe or the great unraveling or this phrase you use, Andre, the great water disruption. These are the kinds of things it might be called. What we know for 1,000% certain it won't be called is climate change. We know it won't be called that. So let's kind of get ahead of the game and dream into the meaning of this enormous, terrible transformation now. That is what we need to do if we're actually going to be able to face it and work through it and respond 
adequately to it. And what we meant, therefore, partly with the title of this session is that this really is a transformation so mythic that it breaks our existing language, our existing way of using words, that is the, the dominant way that they're being used right now in the media, in the science journals, etc. Uh, we need to get ahead of that game and start finding new ways of thinking it and new ways of framing it. Also, like, uh, I, I think that, you know, we have among us now, so just to understand what it means to be in a paradigm shift. That is, what is a paradigm shift? It's like uh, when Copernicus finds out that the sun is not going around us, but vice versa. And it's not like everybody was like, oh, that's a good idea. I feel that now. It, it takes 100 years yeah. kind of for a new paradigm to settle in. And often it's, it's a huge disruption also towards language and normality. And uh, so like you guys in the... And, and, and it's often, there's often conflict within it, and, uh, and, and it can take a hundred years for a word to be understood. So we have examples in Icelandic history, because Iceland is very transparent. When an idea comes into Iceland, and, and uh, we can see when the idea came, and you can see the evolution of the idea until it becomes a paradigm. So like in 1809, when the ideas of the French Revolution came, it was just nonsense, you know, what do you mean, like, the poor should have the same voting in proportion as the rich and powerful. So, so when you're in a paradigm shift, language kind of evaporates, and, and that's what we are in now, that the dreams and hopes and normality of our, our kind of 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, what we thought was, was normal, uh, is just not that way anymore. We have among us the first leaders in human history that know that they can melt glaciers. You know, they didn't know that, you know, Napoleon, Churchill, Caesar, they didn't have meetings to discuss how they were melting glaciers or, or how they were leveling the sea level up and down. Uh, but they're talking now and we're mocking the leaders in that fly to Egypt but we're not understanding, we're not holding our breath like it's the World Cup. Like what comes out of this conference, we're just like, oh, yet another climate conference. But, but we need to back out or, or zoom out and like, when did leaders meet to discuss something like this? And, and things that we take for granted in our daily lives, in our dreams, or what we feel we are entitled to, you know, power, oil, all these things are being questioned, and, and you guys in the Extinction Rebellion, you're being annoying like the suffragettes, you know, doing misbehaving and doing things like, uh, and, uh, and the question is, is that inevitable for a paradigm shift that people have to misbehave, and is it, isn't it enough to write an op-ed in the Times and just be proper, <laughs> or, or, or do you have to misbehave? Yeah, yeah. And certainly, um, yeah, that's that's uh, that's what we decided. You can answer that. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that's 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 why we decided to. Part of the part of the DNA of Extinction Rebellion was to try to change the conversation, was to force a change in the conversation, and in that sense, it worked. You know, it's one of the very few things in the last 50 years uh, that has worked. Um, a national conversation during the April Rebellion in uh, 2019 uh, was forced, and that came from disruption. Uh, my view is that now what we need to do is to, is to take that spirit of disrupting the, uh, the failed paradigm, but translate it into terms that will be not just comprehensible to the average citizen, but something that they actually want to do and be a part of. And that's, that's not easy. Uh, but I think it's absolutely essential if we're going to get through this. And we're now sort of segueing, I think, into the, the second part of what we wanted to talk about, which is how do we actually succeed in making this feel as real as it bloody well is uh, to people? And part of the answer is going to be by framing it properly. But other parts of the answers are going to be, for example, uh, that we need to help people to understand this is about a total full spectrum shift in the way that we do pretty much everything. 
That's what transformation means. That's what paradigm shift means. That's what one civilization ending and another beginning means. Uh, and that's how, to go back to your thing about the leaders, from the point of view of history, as it were, and this is another part of what we need to, to, to shift, right, is a shift towards more long-term thinking. From the point of view of, uh, of, of history, uh, it will be completely absurd to look back on leaders who said, yeah, okay, so we're melting the glaciers, but look, we can't stop people um, having as big cars as they want or going on holiday you know, every couple of weeks or every couple of months or something. I mean, that's just outrageous to stop that. So, of course, we have to carry on melting the glaciers. You know, from the point of view of people living a few hundred years from now, that's going to be either laughable or abominable or incomprehensible. But that, <coughs> that remains the norm right now. So that indicates other, starts to indicate some of the other aspects of what has to shift in order to make this real. We have to make it feasible for people to think about time in the kind of way that you do in your book. Tell us about the, the lovely thing about the, uh, the, the three generations um, of a family. Yeah, yeah. Which helps to, to uh, concretize I, this. Well, I felt like one of the fundamental problems was this meaninglessness of 2100. You know, why is it meaningless? Why, why does it feel 100 years away? Why, when a scientist says 2080, 90, it's just, it's just, it's just meaningless. So I took, uh, I was, I'm so lucky that my, uh, my grandparents became very old and, and had a very clear mind. So I, I took my daughter to visit, I call it pancake sci-fi. Uh, I took my daughter to visit my grandmother, and she was 95 at the time, she became 98. And we calculated, my daughter was 12, and we calculated, when do you become as old as grandmother? And uh, we just did the calculation, and she was like, wow, 2,104. I will be the age as grandmother, and you will still remember her, hopefully. And you'll be under influence because she was one of the coolest women in the world. And, uh, and I'm not bragging. It's, 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 uh, it's just uh, she was a glacial explorer and, uh, and, and had a, lived a very full life. So, so my daughter will be inspired by her in the year 2104. And we're thinking, but when is someone still alive that you will love, asking my daughter? Imagining that when she's maybe sitting in this same kitchen in the year 2100, and a 20-year-old comes to visit, somebody very close to her, maybe somebody that she has deeply influenced, when is that person still talking about my daughter as her greatest influence? And she does the math, it's like 2170. So that's like beyond Hunger Games. You know, it's like, a, so, so we were thinking like, so my grandmother whispered a secret to my daughter, and she, she's not telling me, it's just something from the 1930s. It's not horrible, I hope, but it's just a secret, uh, hopefully a sweet secret. And, and my daughter promised not to tell anybody until this person in the year 2100. And she's gonna ask that person not to tell anybody <laughs> until the year 2170. So, so, our, so in the year 2020, you can plan something to happen without writing it down, just by your own continuity, to take place in the year 2170. So our time is the time of the people that we know and love, the time that creates us, versus the time that we will know and love, the people that we create and the time that we create. So my daughter, she will be able to touch almost 250 years with her bare hands. So that's the handshake of generations. It's uh, 1924, 2170. And I felt like one of the ideas of my book was to update our sense of time and continuity and, and create some kind of responsibility, maybe reclaim from dystopia uh, 2170 and, 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 and claim it into just our inner sphere of normal long-term thinking. Just, just at least, maybe it's difficult to think of 2200, but at least 2170 is, is a time that people up down here will touch in their lifetimes. And, yeah. uh, and that maybe comes to uh, through Topia. Yeah, well, I'll get through Topia in a, in, a, in a second, but just quickly on, on the point, the beautiful point you've just made with the handshake across the generations. What you're really doing there is you're giving us 
a way of quite long, what feels just like quite long time periods, seem actually quite sort of intuitive and, and human. And that I think is so, so important. This is part of how we make this thing real. This is part of how we get people to get more serious about the, the climatic disruption that we've initiated, to enable them to understand that, that 2100, which otherwise just sounds like an abstract date, which is a long time off, is part of this process that matters because what gets passed down the generations, if, if anything, does ought above all to be love. And that's the idea at the center of my book, Parents for a Future, that there should be a, a way, and this is part of what the Climate Majority Project is trying to do, to get people to think of themselves in this kind of sequence of the generations and realize that if, as people say, what they love most of all in their lives is their, is their children, well, they have to remember that those children have children and those children have children. And that if you say, yeah, I love my children, but I don't really give a fig about what happens in 2100, there's just an internal contradiction in what you're saying. Now, one of the methods that, that I'm increasingly trying to use in order to help people to see this and imagine it is this concept of throughtopia. I'll just very briefly explain it for those of you who don't know. So right now we're headed towards dystopia. Um, some people might say we're in dystopia, but honestly, you ain't seen nothing yet. Right now, we're headed towards uh, dystopia. Um, and tragically, utopias are no longer credible. Anyone who says to you now, oh, there's going to be a smooth transition and, and the economy is going to carry on growing, there'll be new technologies, everything's going to be sorted out. They're either a, a liar or a shill or a fool. That's not how it's going to be. And people know that, really. Most people know that and they sense it much as they might wish to deny it. And the real problem, I would argue, with both dystopias and utopias anyway was always that they're imagined as this sort of static, sort of far-off place. What we actually need is a much more process-oriented way of thinking about these things and feeling into them, right? So what's happening right now in our world, we're having to adapt to it and we are gonna have to transform, right? It's what we call transformative adaptation. And the way that we can succeed in imagining that process is precisely to imagine it as a process, as something we have to be continually nimble as we go through. So what a throughtopia is, is the best that we can hope for and that we can make together now as we go through what's coming. And it's actually quite exciting when you start to think about it in that way. It's like, let's think about scenarios for how the future could unfold, for how we could help it to unfold, which are not just everything turning to shit, and which are not just ridiculous fairy stories that we tell ourselves that we know are not gonna be true. They're not dystopias, not utopias, but throughtopias. How we get through what is coming. And the telling of those stories, this is something which is starting to happen in literature. It's barely started at all in um, TV or some other parts of the, the, the arts. It's, it's, in my view, gonna be absolutely huge and absolutely essential, because to come back to what we said quite a while ago, Scientists can't do all of this for us. We need scenarios and ways of feeling into them that, that come alive to us as, as narratives. So this kind of throughtopian impulse is, I think, a big part of how we get to actually start to language and imagine and then co-create a transformation so, so, so mythic that it recreates our language and our future. Sorry. No, no it's, I'm just kind of taking this off like... Uh into the term of purpose, like they were talking about before, is like, I think everybody wants to have, well, I think it's known that everybody wants to have purpose in their lives. And I think that former generations all thought that they were kind of improving life for future generations. That is when you're building a road, you're building a bridge, you're building a, a school or a hospital, you're building a city. If you feel this pride of, yes, I'm, I, I'm leaving here a better place than, than when I came. And we're in this terribly cynical situation where even these good intentions are now measuring as being uh, negative. That is, that is, we are not improving the chances or, or, or the, the, basically the future for the future yeah. generations. Yeah. And, and this cynical situation it's difficult because it's hard enough to have a job, 
but if it's if it's if the job is worse than useful, you know, it's it's a very kind of cynical place to be in as a as a collective society. So uh, it's very delicate to talk to young people like about issues like this, because the first time I spoke to a group of like 15, 17 year olds, it was like it was like I was turning off the lights in their eyes. It's like telling them you're too late to the party. So I was thinking, how can you frame this without being, uh, you know, without just filling them with blackness. So, so I started to kind of think, okay, what needs to be done? And what is the purpose? Uh, and suddenly it's like, oh yeah, every single job you choose has a purpose. If you go into fashion, which was before maybe superficial, uh, going on the Paris runway, Fashion is 6% of the problem. Uh, so if you go into fashion, you can have such a huge purpose regarding material waste, uh, fashion cycles, uh, recycling, all that. So 6%. If you go into energy, you have to transform the whole energy system. If you go into transportation, uh, we have to look like barbarians currently when you, ha in hindsight, after 30 years of how our transportation systems are, if you go into aviation, it has to be remodeled totally. If you go into food, agriculture, farming, yeah. uh, so just basically every single field has to be transformed. And I tell them that doesn't have to be a negative situation if you're going from this standpoint into that through utopia, you could call it. Yeah. That, is, that is to revolutionize every single sector of the economy or, or of our, yeah, of our activities yeah. uh, can be a very stimulating, intellectually stimulating time. And basically all of your working life is about this challenge. You know, 2050 is for a 20 year old today. It's basically, it's basically most of their working life. So, so I tell them that, that, that the last 30 years were, were about making this, uh, the digital world and all that. And, and maybe these, uh, Google Glass, no, these uh, Apple Vision Pro things uh, were an end of an era uh, into the absurdity. Uh, maybe the next 30 years are about the tangible world, uh, food, soil, air, uh, materials, uh, much more than this kind of digital thing. Yeah, yeah that's a great utopian thought. It's also a great climate majority uh, thought. And... Um, I think it, it, it's so exciting because we have a crisis of meaninglessness, right? A crisis of felt meaninglessness, which Nietzsche was the first uh, prophet of and has, has really come to roost in, in our societies in recent times. The, the, the felt meaninglessness of lies, which are just about uh, consumption and so on and so forth. Well, here is a, a purpose in spades, right? Our situation drips with meaning and it's not going to be even remotely easy or a lot of the time pleasant, but it, it's, it's an incredibly exciting prospect for careers and, and life purposes for huge numbers of, uh, of people. Um, and by the way, um, if anyone ever says, "Be yes, but isn't it uh, too late? Or on the other hand, if anyone says <coughs> to you, yes, but look, it's not too late. Um, the question is always, for what? Right? The, the people who say, oh, it's too late, the people who think we're doomed to the dystopian outcome, ask them, for what is it too late? Yes, it's too late for certain things. It's too late for a smooth transition. It's too late to stay below 1.5 degrees. That ship has sailed. Don't, don't believe the people who are pretending to you uh, that, it, uh, that it hasn't. Um, but it's not too late probably to stay below 2 degrees. Uh, it's not too late to undertake the kind of transformations that Andrea and I are talking about here. And it's never too late to do the right thing. It's never too late to minimize the harm. It's never too late to practice transformative and deep adaptation. Anyone who, this, 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 this false binary, it's too late, it's not too late. Ask people for what, get concrete about it. And then you get out of these kinds of, um, really what the, what the people who say it's too late are looking for is an excuse for inaction. And what the people who say it's not too late are looking for is to continue to carry on as they are. And neither of these are credible positions. Neither of these are but, viable positions. But regarding too late, is, you could say in a way that, you could almost say that we haven't started. Yeah. 
to address climate change. Uh, we have Which a, is barely starting. We, it's because you ask somebody like, okay, we had this catastrophe two years ago, like the, the corona thing, I don't want to say the word, I get goosebumps. Uh, so you ask somebody, okay, do you agree that climate change is a bigger crisis than corona? And, and then they say, yes, of course. And then I ask them, okay, name me the top 10 things, your, how your life changed for the corona. And they can just speak endlessly. Like, I didn't hug my grandmother, I didn't, didn't go to work, I didn't go to school, I didn't... Uh, it, it's just, it's just everybody knows this. Just, they, could just, they could talk for a whole day about how their life changed and transformed within, within a, a weekend. And then I ask, okay, climate change is bigger. Just name me the top 10 things, how your life changed uh, between the fourth and the fifth IPCC report. They're like, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, tell me just the top 10 things. Yeah, like, like what's unimaginable today that was common 2010 uh, and just sounds absurd you were doing 2000. Yeah, yeah, wait a minute, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Yeah, just the, just the top 10, you know, because it's much bigger than Corona. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I have paper straws, okay, <laughs> and um, mm, my uncle, he, he bought a Tesla, <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, so the greatest existential crisis that we're faced with collectively as humanity will be fought by the suffering of your uncle upgrading to the coolest car he has ever had. So it's kind of obvious that we are, we are so entitled. Yeah. We haven't taken on any, any discomfort. Uh, any like, and, and, and then if you compare it to the discomfort of not hugging your grandmother for a year, actually, you know, there should be at least 10 things that, yeah. that we should be able to at least to look our grandchildren in the eye that we actually did take on in terms of discomfort. Yeah. For, because otherwise they will not hug us, not because of Corona, they will just not want to hug us. Yeah, absolutely. That's always the, the question to, to ask, what are you going to say to your uh, grandchildren when they ask you, what did you do once you know? What did you do once you knew? Everyone has to have an answer to that question. And just on what you just said there about um, how we can start to up that ante of things that get changed. And then I'm gonna to come to the, to the floor, so please be thinking about your questions and comments. This, of course, again, is where uh, localization uh, and transformative adaptation and what in the Climate Majority Project we call community climate action. This is how it can be really powerful because that is people starting to do their actual lives, their actual quotidian lives differently. And I think it's, it's, it can work like a mind bomb, a slow mind bomb. People see other people acting with each other as if the crisis is real, making preparation, building resilience, growing, growing food, and if asked why, saying, well, because it's, it tastes better and because um, we can't be so reliant on long supply chains in the future and we may have to look after ourselves more in the future. It goes off in people's minds like, oh, well, maybe this isn't about some distant abstract date in the future. Maybe this is about preparing now for what's already here and the worst that is already definitely coming. Right, let's go to the room and see what you make of this conversation we've been having. Can I see hands with, uh, with questions or comments? And we've got one or two mics. So let's start with uh, this person here and that person there. Andre, you just mentioned a word that I think is really important, entitlement. Um, and as I think about the future, I sometimes wonder, even within myself, like how will I respond to when the people who didn't cause the problem are dying by the millions in the global south. At the same time, the global north will <coughs> lose a lot of what people now feel they're entitled to have. How do we find language and ways to not get into a barbaric world where people just accept that millions of people or hundreds of millions of people are dying in the global south and us kind of going, well, we gave them some aid before, but now we don't really have any money for that and 
and we need to look after ourselves. And it's, it, I have no idea about an answer. I'm just wondering. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to try that, Andrew? Yeah, it's um, because it's a difficult question because if you say like, if in, if in good intentions you say like, a hundred million people will be coming over the Mediterranean because of climate change, the response might not be altruism and and support of solar panels to prevent that, but military spending and wall building uh, and maybe making it illegal to cross the Mediterranean and and legal to shoot down those that cross it. So, so it could it, the the response of such a dystopian future could be uh, not the well-intended response that you would like. And then I also think, even framing it as something that will happen in the global south, nobody really knows if it will be so linear of, of south and north because Florida will go under. Uh, we're seeing fires in Canada. We're seeing Greece under under water. So, so unexpected things can happen very disproportionately. Uh, you know, in, in climate utopia, you know, maybe, you know, humans have, this is, have turned disadvantages into advantages. So, so we, are, we are barely now, and this is maybe a bit techno answer. So we have like, in Arabia, we have like Dubai, we have places that are rising from oil, that is built from the ground from oil money. We, have, we, don't, we haven't seen the scale up of solar where people have actually built cities based on the resources of which would be like sun and heat. So it doesn't, I don't think if we look 50 years ahead in terms of how scaled up solar and, and thermal technology will be, that maybe it's not like this linear fall of people escaping the south and going north. Maybe it will be like Iceland. We were. Uh, Evacuating people, evacuating people in the 1870s because of volcanic eruptions, until and, and because of the hostile seas, until those disadvantages became advantages of abundant fisheries and, uh, and geothermal energy that we could we could use to. So now we can. We were at the limit of growth in 1900 of 100,000 people, but now we could easily have much more because of the disadvantages that we have turned into advantages. So I want to frame it, it, it sounds a bit over, over uh, optimistic, but I just would like to warn the framing of lots of 100 million people swarming to Europe. I, I just think it might create a very dystopic answer from our political discourse. And, and, and so when I'm, also when I'm just, uh, yeah, so that's, that's kind of the answer. And just to, to add briefly to the, the point about uh, where is the ax going to fall, and we don't really know. Uh, we do know that, that so far um, there are more people suffering and dying in the global south than in the global north from climate, but there are also pretty serious disasters hitting the, the global north. Uh, it's worth bearing in mind that if we look at corona again as a precedent, it's quite surprising, really, the way that played out, right? It's quite surprising, for example, that a country like the United States did so much worse during the coronavirus crisis than an, quite a lot of West African countries. Why was that? Well, arguably because the political system in America is basically broken uh, and the place is run by uh, rampant individualism, whereas in West Africa, they learned from the experience of Ebola and they've still got quite strong, actually, local resilient communities in quite a lot of those countries. So this is something which Amitav Ghosh makes quite cleverly as a point, that it may <coughs> turn out that in the face of uh, climate and other crises, countries in the global north are surprisingly uh, fragile. Let's go to the next question. Hi, thank you so much for your, um, your conversation this morning. I was very interested by your uh, talks and ideas around language, imagination, and our ability to tell stories. And you mentioned Throughtopia, which I know Amanda Scott writes a lot about. I was wondering, for people who are interested in creating stories through art, music, film, theatre, that will ignite people's imaginations and galvanise us towards Throughtopias that are vibrant and appealing, do you have any advice for those folks? 
Well, I'll, I'll start with something on that. Uh, very succinct. My advice is do it. Uh, this, this really needs to happen. This is a wave of the future. It is absolutely critical. One of the main reasons why, I, I'm quite convinced, one of the main reasons why we are not taking the climate more than emergency as seriously as we ought is because people can't really imagine the different possible futures very clearly. And they don't see their own agency in choosing between those futures. And that is what these throutopian narratives and so forth can do and, and will do, is show people how it could be, how it could be really bad and how it could be much less bad and in some ways better. Uh, and they'll show people the kind of parts that they could, they could play in that. And I think it's hugely exciting. Andre, what do you think? I, I think the arts, of course, lots of bad art will be made as a response to uh, a good cause is not essentially good art. Uh, and, and I, I uh, but, but still in the whole picture, art is fundamental of in paradigm shifts. And I think it's vital to understand that, like we were talking about before, like who defines the language? You know, is, is climate change a specialist issue of scientists and their scientific terms? Or is it my own issue, my own personal issue, or your personal issue? that you can interpret in any way you feel appropriate to your own life and your own surroundings. Uh, so I was like, when I was writing my book, I was kind of obsessed with the periodic table of language. So this imaginary periodic table of language. So I was thinking like, like these fundamental words that have always existed in mythology and culture, love, God, blood, mother, uh, you know, water, sun, moon, these, these fundamental things. So I was thinking emissions, emissions are not in the periodic table of language. Uh, and 35 gigatons of CO2 emissions, uh, they are not in the periodic table. But fire, fire is in the periodic table. Uh, so so be, below the emissions is fire. And if you look at the fire, then you understand, okay, the invisible 35 gigatons are actually the biggest fires that the earth has ever seen. So, so maybe reclaiming the language from technocracy, from science, and because it's a fundamental issue, it deserves maybe to be talked about in terms of fundaments, in terms of love, fire, God, mother. <laughs> so, so like that's, that's how I, that's, that's kind of the approach that I found appropriate when I was writing the book, not, not using super, super complicated language, just, just very simple language and just visiting my grandmother and talking to her. And yeah. Thanks. Right, let's see more hands. Uh, okay, so uh, we, let's go to this uh, woman here and then this woman down here. Hello, um, my name's Ella, I'm the founder of The Long Time Project and I've got a comment and a question. So firstly, um, at the Long Time Project, we have been kind of operationalizing these ideas over the last five years. So helping individuals and institutions do processes like the ones that you've been describing to help them build intergenerational empathy, to help them take the longer view. So just flagging that up, that there's a load of resource out there for folk who want to get practical with some of the ideas they've heard about. Where do they find the resource? Uh, so if you search, you can listen to the Long Time Academy podcast that we have in partnership with Headspace, the meditation app, um, or you can search the Long Time Project. <coughs> um, but my, my question, we've, we're thinking about the mythic, and often in mythology we have heroes. Uh, and you very beautifully this morning, Rupert, said, you know, perhaps um, the next Buddha will be a Sangha. So what are the kinds of um, stories that... I guess it's a double question. What are the kind of stories you've heard that have collectives as their heroes that have been potent for you? And if they don't exist, what are, the, what are those kind of stories look and feel like? Wow, what a wonderful question. Challenging one too. Uh, I'll make a, a little start. It, it, it would probably be a controversial um, one, but it's worth just kind of thinking through. I think that uh, it's, it's far from perfect, but I think that 
Avatar does this to some extent. Now, some people say, no, it doesn't, because Avatar is just a, a white savior myth. But I think that's a, a completely wrong reading of the film. Uh, actually, the, the protagonist has to go through an incredibly painful journey involving massive, consequential, terrible mistakes on his part in order to get anywhere in his learning, which is essentially reverse anthropology. In other words, he's learning from the indigenous people rather than teaching them. Uh, and it's actually the, the collective, and ultimately the collective includes the entire animal population of the planet, um, which, uh, which manages to uh, achieve victory. So it's as if you know, uh, Gaia herself and all her animate beings have to rise up uh, in order for the, uh, for the thing to work out well. Now, that's probably more than we can hope for, but it, it's, a, it's a story which has at least some of the qualities you're asking for. Do you have an example, Andre? I, I was obsessed with mythology when I was writing this. Like, uh, the gods were right when they punished Prometheus because we couldn't handle the fire. And we have, th this is basically a result of, of Prometheus giving us the fire and we just couldn't handle it. So I was thinking, like, how is mythology created? Like, if you look 500 years back, you can maybe just name one king from each century. You can't name all the characters. You just maybe, maybe you remember one person from the 14th century, one person from 700. So if you zoom out 4,000 years and you, and you look at this time, this break in geology when, when uh, the glaciers started this trigger melting, Maybe all our kings will be concentrated in a single king, uh, this single king that had all the information in the world. He was like the epicenter of humanity. He had satellites, a hundred satellites going around the country, uh, around, he had castles full of information. He had, he had scientists in, uh, in, uh, in towers all around the world. He had perfect information about everything. And then he had these magical machines that were serving him. But then he found out that his machines were not serving him. They were harming his future. And they were going to claim his children. And he thought that he had some control over these machines. But then his machines just continued doing their thing. And in the end, this king found out that what he thought was his power and control was in the end just machines on cruise control that just continued, despite all the knowledge, despite all the information from the satellites, they just kept on rolling. That's maybe future mythology. So th that's a wonderful, um, horrible note on which to, uh, to end a story we have to make <laughs> sure doesn't come true. Uh, friends, I, I hope we've given you some food for thought and some tools for thought. Thank you for being with us here.
it's unfriendly. <laughs> Hello. Welcome everybody to this session, Strategies for Strengthening Local Economies. And I was looking for the description of this session. I like the way it was written and it sounds a lot like what I say when uh, I'm trying to describe what we're, what we're moving toward, the kind of economic system that is just and inclusive, ecologically wise, socially thriving and resilient. So that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm Jay Tompt, and I teach regenerative economics at Schumacher College. Uh, I'm also a co-founder of the Totnes for Economy Project. I've been involved in, well, also the co-founder of something called Local Spark Tour Bay. So have been involved in, in local stuff for a long time, and uh, also involved in a, uh, an international uh, community of practice of people doing this kind of thing. And I'm joined today by um, Carla Denier. And you were the co-leader of the Green Party. Uh, present tense, unless something unexpected happened in the last few minutes since I looked at my phone. <laughs> my mistake. I, I, looked, I looked online and I thought your Wikipedia page said was, so I'm really I'm very sorry about that. <laughs> Shall I, I can introduce myself please if Please do, want. and then Diego, please introduce yourself. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Carla Denia. I'm co-leader of the Green Party nationally, the Green Party of England and Wales, but I have two other hats as well, um, which are local ones here. I am one of the 25 Green Party councillors that sit on Bristol City Council, which is the largest group of Green councillors that's ever existed anywhere in the UK. Uh, and I am the Green Party's parliamentary candidate for Bristol Central, which is the new constituency that's about to be created exactly where we are sitting right now. And given the number of councillors that we have here, we think we've got a reasonable chance. So I'm hoping to be uh, a future Green Party MP for Bristol. And Diego. Uh, so first, really nice to be here. Uh, I, I have just met Carla. I met Jay, I don't know, six, seven years ago, I think. Um, I'm Diego, I'm coming from Spain. Uh, I was living here in the UK for four years, two in Brighton, two in, also with the Green Party there in that time, and two in, in London. Um, I've been always a so social entrepreneur, and uh, eight years ago I, I set up, I am co-founder of an NGO that is called NESI, the New Economy and Social Innovation Forum. And we have the goal, uh, our main goal is to change the economy and to create an economy where people and planet are at the center of the model. So we have a lot of work to do. Great, so what we thought we would do is that each of us would talk for about 10 minutes uh, and the order would be just this order. So Diego, Carla, and then, and then me. We might provoke one another for a little bit and then open the floor to questions. So um, let's get started, Diego. 
Um, so, of course, I, I think I will not be speaking for 10 minutes, so we can interrupt if you want, but uh, when we were preparing the, the, the session, uh, we thought that it would be interesting to start with uh, an understanding of the economy, and that's what I'm going to do, and then Carla, she will come to, to more specific local things. Um, if we want to strengthen local economies, first we need to understand how the global economy works. And the, car the current system, the capitalistic system, is quite simple and it's very well structured. So it, it has a goal to maximize profit, to grow in terms of money. It has a method to achieve that goal, that is competition. Countries compete with each other, businesses compete with each other, and people will compete with each other also to get the money. Um, of course, it has uh, indicators to measure whether it achieved the goal or not. If you are a country, the GDP. If you are a business, the, the balance sheet. If you are an individual, uh, how much money have you got in your bank account, how many uh, properties. So it's, it's a very well organized system. So that is the current system. So what kind of new system we, tr we, we can create if we want to move from global to, to local? So, first we have to define the goal. Uh, we are here in a summit where we are talking about economics of happiness. So, the goal of every economic activity should be to contribute to the common good or to the well-being of the people. So, how can we do it? Which is the method? So, the opposite to the current system. The current system is competition. So, we should try to, to promote collaboration, cooperation. And how can we measure that? And we know that there are new uh, ways to measure, new indicators to measure well-being, to measure whether uh, people are uh, having uh, good lives or not. So th that is the, the, the current system and the way that we need to, to, to try to create the, the, the new local system. So um, if you are an individual, of course, or you have a company or a business or a local NGO, Every economic activity that you do, you need to think whether you are contributing or not to the well-being that those people that surround you, your neighbors or your suppliers or your customers. And also you have to see whether you are collaborating or competing because even NGOs and charities, we compete for the, for the funding, for example. You know? So it's, it's, we are quite polluted by the system. Um, of course, you need to understand to, and to define your, the indicators that you are going to use. To, to measure whether you are uh, really contributing to that local uh, uh, economy. Even if you are an individual, you, you have to, to slow down and think whether you are having, as this morning someone said, whether you are, uh, how many uh, human relations of really good quality do you have in your life? Uh, how, when is the last time that you were to nature and you were relaxed, uh, close to nature? So you have to find the things that really create your well-being and well-being to other people. So, and then coming to, to, to how to strengthen local economies uh, after um, this introduction, I think is, I'm talking about localization, I think we need to try to get um, globalization of localization. So everyone working to, to, to be local. And, and for that we need to understand that it's not the same living in a small village, that living, for example, in a medium town or city or in a big uh, city or megapolis. So in a small villages, it's easier because it's, you, normally you, you know the, your neighborhood, your neighbors, and you get on with, with them. But in big cities, even you don't know who is living in the next door. So we need to understand how it works and to apply it to your own life. But for me, that is enough. And we, can, we can go ahead and then I come back to the other topics depending on what you said. <laughs> Testing, testing, there we go, it is on. Uh, right, so um, I'll start by briefly introducing myself and a little bit about the Green Party's approach to economics and localism and local economies for anyone that doesn't know, but then I'm gonna quickly move on to giving you some examples of how that works out in practice. So um, uh, I mentioned that I've been a councillor here in Bristol since 2015. Uh, I actually 
originally my background is, or my, my day job background is in engineering. I moved to Bristol to work in the renewable energy sector. But my campaigning background is in campaigning on various single issues around the environment, peace, human rights, etc., and specifically in getting involved in local projects that are about building the alternative. And I'll talk about a couple of those later. Um, Green Party policy, obviously, I'm not going to recite the whole lot to you, but to give you a little flavour on uh, economics, we are the only UK parliamentary party that is explicitly anti-capitalist. Um, we are um, one of, I think it's, this is slightly more debatable, um, the only parties that is anti the austerity agenda. Um, and uh, I'm pretty sure we're the only party that is critical of the use of GDP growth as a measure of economic success. And that sets us quite a long way from most of the other political parties and can present a challenge to us when we are... Um, in an interview situation, say, because uh, that there's a lot of sort of starting assumptions that the interviewer might have that you kind of have to challenge before you can get to the point you're trying to make. That's something I've learned in the last couple of years. Um, but that gives you an idea of our economics approach. And our, the Green Party political philosophy is also inherently about localism and grassroots. We... Um, for example, are very pro-public ownership of public services, but that doesn't necessarily always mean nationalisation. Sometimes it can mean municipalisation or cooperatives, and, and our policies are really explicit on that. Um, one of our key principles is subsidiarity, so the idea of making decisions at the lowest practicable level. Um, and that can vary depending on what the decision is. Sometimes the lowest practicable level might be a village or even a household, other times it's a region, other times it's the country, other times it's internationally. Um, but that's a really core principle running through our policies. Uh, and so Greens in government, national government, uh, which is not currently the case in England, unfortunately, although is the case just over the border in Scotland, where we're in a uh, government with the Scottish National Party, and it's also the case in, I think it's seven currently other European countries. Um, the Greens are uh, often the driving force in devolving powers and funding to local government or regional government. And that's particularly relevant. I know there are people here from all over the world, but it's particularly relevant here in the UK because the UK has one of the most centralised political systems in Europe. Uh, compared to most of our European neighbours, uh, local and regional government has very little power. We can't raise uh, our own taxes, with the exception of, of some like specific, very tightly regulated rules around council tax uh, and business rates, but we can't... Yeah, there's very little flexibility uh, and there's very little power. And over the last 13 and a half years of, of Conservative government, local government has been given some extra powers, but none of the extra funding that goes with it, with the result that often the work just doesn't get done. Um, so, yeah, the Green Party approach, to give you a few specific examples, we would uh, give voters the power to force referendums on local government issues if more than 40% of the electorate call for it. So that's giving not just local government power, but local communities power around decisions that local governments are making. Um, we would fund local government better. At the moment, um, we're very much still... We never recovered from the first round of austerity. Local government's been cut hugely, which restricts their ability to do things, and also pitted against each other. Uh, local councillors are made to competitively bid against other local councils for funding so that only two or three of the UK cities can have funding for sustainable transport rather than all of them, for example, which is clearly not in any of our interests as a country for climate change, well-being, air pollution, all the other reasons. Um, uh, and we would give... We, we have one of our other core principles is self-determination. So that means that if a community within a country wants to be independent and they have a referendum that that shows that that's a majority, then we would support that. So um, uh, an example of that 
which uh, I think no other parties apart from Nevin Kernow support is the idea of a Cornish assembly if a referendum of Cornish people said that they wanted that. Um, and that does seem to have a, doesn't get much media coverage, but it does seem to be a growing movement. Um, so there we go. That's an idea of the kind of things around localism that a green government would do in England and Wales and that green governments in other countries are already doing. In the meantime, though, uh, although we're not in national government, we do have over 750 local councillors elected to councils uh, all over England and Wales. Um, uh, and we're in administration in 30-something of those, joint administration mostly, apart from one. Uh, and that means that Greens have some power to pursue those kind of policies already at a local level with the limited powers they're given from government. Um, and I'll give you uh, a couple of examples. One is from Lewis in Sussex. So that's a town uh, kind of just up the road from Brighton, near the south coast. Uh, and Greens have been in administration there for a few years. And they have set up something which has been called the Lewis Model. Uh, now, I'll start, and I'm going to get a tiny bit of audience participation here. Hand up if you've heard of the Preston Model. Quite a lot. At least half the room. Okay, so the Preston model of community wealth building is basically that the council and other anchor institutions like um, local educational establishments, hospitals, etc., um, make a commitment to use local supply chains, whether that's caterers or builders or whatever. Um, and that includes a commitment to help create and build up those supply chains if they don't yet exist so that um, more of the investment from these big anchor institutions is reinvested in the local economy. So the Lewis model takes that idea and applies it to uh, housing retrofit especially, and in a way that magnifies the impact of the council's direct control. So, uh, and also involves expanding their definition of local a little bit by working with their neighbours. So Lewis District Council worked with six neighbouring councils um, to pull the money in their housing revenue accounts, which is a ring-funded council account that is just for building and maintaining council housing. And that's ring-fenced by national government, so they're not allowed to put extra money into that from another budget or take it out. Um, and the problem with that ring-fencing is that it means that uh, the, the, the money comes in from rents which are capped uh, and so councils don't have enough funds to build enough council housing to meet need. And they also don't have enough funds to renovate them to a good quality. So by teaming up with neighbouring councils, they can get a bit more economy of scale, get slightly better contracts. But more importantly, they are specifically uh, using and building up local supply chains for low carbon retrofit to make the homes much more sustainable, which the government hasn't given them extra funding for. It's just that by using local suppliers and, and, and getting that economy of scale, they're able to use their regular budget for maintenance to do more with that money and to, to lower the bills for people who are living there, which obviously improves their financial situation, their quality of life, um, their health. There's a huge cost to the NHS from living in cold, damp homes and lowers carbon emissions. Um, but the cool, really cool bit about this is that by building up those local supply chains, those local skills amongst local building firms, etc., once they've finished retrofitting the council housing stock, those tradespeople will then likely turn their attention to the private housing market and as anyone that does own their own home or, or a tenant that is trying to get your landlord to retrofit your home will know the main barrier is the shortage of people trained to do low carbon retrofit and so building up that supply chain leverages the council power far beyond their direct carbon emissions into helping to make it happen faster in the private sector as well. Um, so, yeah, there's an example of, of Greens in government, and then they, uh, that involved a lot of cross-party working as well. So, Greens weren't the sole administration on that council, um, nor in most of the neighbouring councils, but as is often the case with Greens in government, 
when we propose an idea, it's not necessarily that the other parties oppose it, but they never would have thought to propose it themselves. And so even when we're not a majority on a council, that impact of having one or two or a few more greens in the room tends to just put things on the table that wouldn't be there otherwise. Um, one final example from me is uh, a completely different angle, um, is about energy. So uh, some of you will, probably many of you, will have heard of Molly Scott Cato. She's actually speaking later, this, later in this festival. Uh, she is uh, a Green Party politician. Uh, she used to be the uh, member of European Parliament, the MEP for the southwest of England, where we are now. Uh, but she's also a professor of economics. And she pioneered the idea of bioregional economies. Given the nature of this event, I expect quite a lot of you are already familiar with the idea of bioregions as it applies to earth sciences and agriculture and so on. And she argued that we should design our local economies along similar lines. Um, and that that was a sensible scale to organize your economies. And as a reflection of that, when she was an MEP, she commissioned two reports, uh, one on what that would look like in terms of agriculture, which is a big part of the economy in the Southwest, and another in terms of energy. Uh, and since I'm an energy nerd, as a former renewable energy engineer, I'm gonna talk about the latter, um, because that report worked out that as a region, the Southwest of England could be totally self-sufficient in renewable energy, uh, and in fact, more than self-sufficient, it could export to the rest of the country because it's a peninsula that's very windy, wavy, sometimes sunny, and has lots of tidal and geothermal resource. Uh, so the report worked out that 34% of the energy needs could be met from marine and tidal energy and 66% from onshore renewables. Uh, and excitingly, that that had the potential to create 122,000 full-time equivalent jobs in the sector. And that's one of the big benefits of renewable energy and housing retrofit, that because of the nature of them, they are geographically distributed all around the country. Those jobs aren't just in cities. Um, and that's a big issue, especially for um, the more rural parts of the Southwest region. Uh, and uh, also really interestingly, now this report was uh, about eight years ago, so the exact prices won't be up to date anymore, but I think the general principle is still stands. At the time of that report in 2015, the estimated cost for delivering that transition for the Southwest would be less than the equivalent uh, amount of energy generated from nuclear. So that decentralization is better in a number of ways um, for, for society, for climate, um, for, for the economy, for jobs and it's also cheaper. So I think I'm gonna pause there for now and let's hear from Jay and then open it out. I think, I think we have loads of time because I think the session goes until a quarter after. Um, but thanks for that. I was sort of musing to myself uh, about writing an essay or, or giving a longer talk with the title, When Neoliberalism Came for Schumacher College or maybe uh, disaster capitalism in the Shire. Um, I say that because this is very top of mind for me at the moment. I don't know how many of you have heard of Schumacher College? How many of you know what's going on right at the moment? So um, I don't wanna dive into all the details and I don't wanna say anything I shouldn't say. Um, but uh, I and my colleagues are really, really angry at what's going on. The, uh, the former leadership of Dartington Hall Trust, Dartington Trust, you might remember, for some of you older folks, you might remember this is where the welfare state was conceived. It has an amazing history of progressive action and innovation in all, of all kinds, including innovation oriented towards strengthening local economies. But that was last century. In this century, the trustees and the leadership, the governance of the place has been consistently sort of selling off the family silver and in fact, uh, land from the estate for housing to pay for an ongoing deficit that the people who they continue to bring in as trustees and as leadership 
have been unable to solve. And not unlike the interviewers you face, they come in with a kind of neoliberal capitalist mindset, um, I think, very top-down, very command and control. They did something horrible. Uh, our students were coming in for Welcome Week, all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and at the last minute said, all of the classes are postponed indefinitely. And then when classes were to have started on Monday, at the end of that day, they said, oh, well, we're gonna unpause. I mean, absolutely horrific judgment. And the, the chairman of the trustees, and I'll say his name, I'm gonna get into loads of trouble, Lord David Treesman, uh, who made the decision, did not have the moral courage to come down and say to the students himself in person that he had made this decision. Absolutely horrific. Now, I'm bringing this up uh, because it's on my mind. I'm bringing it up also because um, we all may be asking for your support in the near future. But I'm also bringing it up as an example of why strengthening local economies is so damn important. So when we are beholden to forces outside of our control, outside of our democratic control, in the places that we live, we are vulnerable. We are vulnerable for this kind of, um, this kind of stuff. I mean, you know, we're a graduate school. It's a crisis, but it's sort of a middle-class crisis. But at the same time, livelihoods are at stake. And the, the model that may come into this estate would be not, in, not consistent with the history. It could, be, it could become a giant center park or a bowling alley. So this is why I've gotten involved in, in fighting for and working for making local economies stronger. I've been doing it for 20 years in various ways. Um, I'm from Totnes. You might have heard uh, only just maybe seven, eight years ago, we kept Costa Coffee from coming into town. And that was a big battle. And it was a similar, it was a similar kind of issue for us. Um, local economies are always at the mercy of extractive uh, corporates of all kinds. So, so it's very important. So how can we strengthen? Um, I don't have the answer. I, well, I do. <laughs> I don't have, I have an answer. I have an answer. Um, in Totnes, we, we started something called the Reconomy Project, and we said, okay, what could we do? So we could start something up, or we asked the question, what if we could create the conditions for many things to start up? And, and the kinds of things that we would want to start up would be consistent with the, the theme of this, of this session. You know, how could we move toward the kind of economic system that is just and inclusive, that affirms life and meets everybody's needs, that is ecologically wise, socially thriving, and resilient because we know there are going to be more shocks, whether it's extreme weather or extreme austerity. So, so we asked this question, what could we do? How could we create the conditions for a new kind of economy to emerge? For new economic actors, new economic models, and new economic relationships to emerge and to take hold and to thrive? And I think this is a big question for policymakers. So I hope you guys get into office mm -hmm. in Westminster. That would be great. Um, and I'm going to ask you later for some policy ideas, so, so get ready for that. Um, so, so we thought, okay, how would we answer this question? It's a systems kind of question. And we thought, well, one of the things is we, we have to create a new kind of entrepreneurial culture. So we don't need more Elon Musks, as I like to say. We need more Myrtle Coopers. Who's Myrtle Cooper? She's, she's a, a local entrepreneur in Totnes who started up a little foraging company. Um, we need to mobilize the capital and the know-how that already exists in our places. So the example that you gave in Lewis, that, that's so inspiring. And I think it's just the kind of thing that we need. And how can we create the kind of ecosystem that can support these kinds of new entrepreneurs? Um, 
and, and find a role for all kinds of people to play, whether it's investors or supporters or experts, create lots of, like a diversity and abundance of ways of gathering the resources to start things up and the kind, start, the kinds up, start the kinds of things up that we need to start the kinds of businesses that may not look like the kinds of businesses that you're used to, but ones that are oriented toward conviviality, oriented toward meeting people's needs in ways that are outside of the market. I don't have the answers to what these kinds of models might look like, but I think we need to be open-minded and to see what people come up with. So we've been doing something in, in Totnes for the past 11 years that we call the Local Entrepreneur Forum and Community of Dragons. And so this is where we gather people in the community, um, four or five of these kinds of entrepreneurs pitch, and then people in the community play the role of dragon or investor. And we say everything counts as an investment. So somebody might say, I'll loan you a thousand pounds, I'll give you a hundred pounds, I'll help you write your business plan, I'll help you do your website, I'll bake you a cake, I'll give you a hug just because I love what you're doing. That's a great investment. And the return, of course, is a better place to live. So, We've been doing it in for a long time. It's happened in a few other places. Uh, I started, uh, I co-started something in Torbay. Torbay is a coastal city. Um, many coastal cities in Britain, uh, and Diego, you probably already know this, having lived in Brighton, many coastal cities have a, like a special kind of deprivation and poverty, um, and Torbay is no different. So we're trying to bring this kind of thinking and doing uh, over there. And then I'm part of this international network uh, we call ourselves the Reconomistas. It's the Reconomy Community of Practice, and so um, it's been around for a little while, and we're trying to reinvent ourselves. We, we have a little group here, we have a little group in Luxembourg, in Bern, in Rio de Janeiro, we have friends in Japan, in the US, and other places. And we're, we're going to trial this idea of twinning places so that we can begin to share the know-how and the knowledge of how to do this kind of stuff. Um, probably you guys have, have already have experience of how hard it is to, to support bottom-up change, especially bottom-up economic change. So this is, this is one of the things uh, that we're doing. So um, I guess the last thing I just want to say is this is not a spectator sport. We don't need more entertainment disguised as activism. We need people to participate, and whether that means to start something up yourself or just to support the local businesses in your own place, stop doing Amazon Prime or whatever. And there's a role for everyone. And the key thing is to link up with other people and everything else kind of start, you know, kind of rolls on naturally from that. And so, uh, I think I'll stop there. So, um, I can see you've got something yes, burning that I, you want to say. Yes, I, I, because you said you don't know the, the, how, which has the answers to localize or to strengthen uh, local economies. I, I, I don't have a clear answer, but I, I bring, for me, two fundamental uh, strategies. Uh, the first one, listening to Carla, I think we need to decentralize and, uh, uh, politics. And the other one is to decentralize the economy. But in terms of politics, uh, a question for all of you. How many of you uh, are part of a political party? Uh, is involved in a political party? Oh, this is amazing. In Spain, it would be in the same way. So uh, six, seven people. Okay. Is that a national political party or a local political party? The local political party is only in your town. One person, two, myself. So my personal uh, experience last year, um, I am from Palencia, two hours north of Madrid, small town, 70,000 people, and different local people came together, really, really upset with politics there. We, it's, a, it's a town that is losing population, uh, there is no work there, uh, so things are not going well. So they came together to, and we created a new local political party. Because the four, the, the, yeah, there, are, there are five political parties there, but are the national. So it's the conservative, 
we don't have the Greens there. In Spain, the Green Party is not very, 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 very big, uh, and they have been sort of uh, now inside other political party. But so we have the Conservative, the Labour, the, the right wing and the left wing, and also the Liberal one. So, and we got three councillors, and we were lucky because we, we, we are key to decide the government. So after 12 years of Conservative government, now there is a Labour government, but they have to do 40 specific policies that we suggested, and they are all based in local development. So first, we need to find ways to get involved in politics. So congratulations, because in Spain, not many people get involved in politics. That is to strengthen our local economy. And, and secondly, for, for local economies, as you said, there are many things, you say, yeah, there are many things going on. I think Totnes is a good example at the local level, and probably most of the people in this room, you are involved in uh, different projects trying to strengthen local economies. But for me, the key strategy, the clue, is not only working at the local level. If we want to strengthen local economies, we want to work at the global level, as this morning Helena suggested. We need to change trade agreements, global trade agreements. We need to change international, many international things and the way corporations uh, move. So we need to work in the two levels. At the local level, as many of you are already working, but also we need to change something in this level. And I give you one example. Uh, Spain is the main pro pro producer of oranges in the world. Last year, in Spain, we consumed more oranges coming from South Africa than from Spain. That is not a consequence of the local economy, it's a consequence of the global economy, because it's cheaper to bring oranges from South Africa, because we don't include in the price the carbon footprint, the labor conditions, and then Spanish oranges probably are consumed here in the UK, in Norway, in, in countries with more capacity to buy that oranges. So that is the consequence, not, it's not a consequence of any natural law that made oranges cheaper or not in one place or another. It's a consequence of the global economy, so we need to act also in that, in that level. Two suggestions of strategies. <laughs> so, so basically, <clears throat> what we need to do is completely transform everything. Yes. <laughs> Great. Right, where do I start? I, I didn't have a huge amount to say for this section and that's all reminded me of a bunch of things. So thank you, that was very interesting and inspiring. Um, so you asked me, Jay, a, sis, a sort of systems change question. How do we create an environment that is good for local economy and local business? Um, I think I've got two main answers to that question. Uh, and there's lots more, but here's two kind of tangible top of mind ones that are that would be relatively easy and quick to do. Uh, one is to remove all of the perverse incentives in our tax system. Uh, so residents pay council tax, which is uh, very regressive. As a, the, the more income and wealth you have, the smaller a proportion of your income you're spending on council tax because the rake doesn't match the rake for house values. Um, I, I, in fact, that was covered on Radio 4 this morning, I think, for the sort of average modest house in, in a sort of mid-sized northern town, you're paying 1% of your income on council tax. For a very nice house in Westminster, you're paying 0.1%. Um, but it's similarly unfair for slightly different reasons for businesses. So the business version of council tax is business rates. Um, I think the most egregious unfairness is that, well, like council tax, it's based on valuations of property from decades ago that haven't been updated, uh, or, or not often enough. Um, but it's also calculated in a way that means the business rates for a large out-of-town box warehouse, Amazon style, is much less, much, much less per square footage than a small bricks and mortar shop in the town center, which pitches the entire economy against local businesses. Uh, now, councils do have the power to um, exempt very small businesses from, uh, from business rates if they've just got one premises that's below a certain size, um, but that still hampers 
local businesses from expanding slightly and, for example, opening a second premises on the other side of town, still very much a local business of the kind that we would want to support. And as a local councillor, I've directly dealt with casework from local businesses that were struggling with this. Um, there's also some more subtle things that we could do around business rates. So in the long term, the Green Party would replace council tax and business rates with land value tax. I'm not going to go into the nerdy details of that, but uh, it basically m makes it uh, harder for wealthy landowners to evade tax because it's hard to hide land, um, and it makes the responsibility for paying it on the people that can more afford to do so. Um, and it, at the same time, we could remove that perverse incentive where bus business rates are so much higher in town cities where people can walk to the shops and so much lower in the middle of nowhere. Um, but there's also some, some more subtle perverse incentives in business rates, like uh, if you upgrade your premises to make it greener with you know, the modern state-of-the-art equipment, then that might tip your business rates into the next tier because you've increased the value of your property. So one of the things that we as the Green Party announced uh, on Small Business Saturday late last year is that we would... Uh, prevent that. So we would protect businesses from accidentally being taxed more for greening their operations. And indeed, we would provide grants to, to small, medium enterprises to help them green their operations and also um, various other incentives to support them around um, uh, helping them with, with childcare costs for their employees if they've got a small payroll, for example. So there's lots of things where uh, currently, the government is incentivizing in the wrong direction and using existing instruments of business rates in the short term and in the longer term, introducing new tax structures like land value tax, we could flip the emphasis the other way, tip the scales in the other direction. Um, my other answer to your question about system change is what I was saying before about devolution. Uh, and just to expand on that a little bit more, true devolution to local or regional government, including the powers to directly make decisions on a wider range of areas than currently, the powers to raise and change the way they raise taxes, and stable core government funding rather than competitive bids are important, not just for the inherent good of good quality local government and public services, but because when local government has enough funding, they invest in local industries, charities, creative sectors, etc. So to give you some examples uh, from Bristol, um, Bristol, so I'm about to say all of these things in the past tense. Some of the count some of some of them the council still does in the present tense, but in a much diminished form because of 13 and a half years of austerity. Uh, so the council gave slash gives uh, contracts with peppercorn rent to lots of small businesses, charities, um, people doing good work in the economy. So the, the, the council where it hasn't sold off the family silver, familiar story, um, you know, has lots of buildings and it often recognizes that it can deliver its objectives for the local economy by letting an organization have that for not very much money rather than trying to milk it for all it's worth. Uh, it can also grant meanwhile uses, which is where the council uh, might be pla might have a bit of uh, derelict land or a building that's not in amazing condition that it's planning to either build on that land or, or, or renovate the building at some point in the next five years, but it's not doing it right now, so it will let organisations use that space on yeah, peppercorn rent in the meantime on the understanding that it's fixed term, and that is on that, that's the basis on which many exciting local businesses in Bristol got started by having a cheap meanwhile use for their first few years. Um, there's also lots of non-profits in Bristol that used to get core funding from Bristol City Council, and mostly don't anymore. Mostly is one-off grants for specific projects these days. Um, and uh, 
the council also has sometimes collaborated, and I know this has happened elsewhere as well, with local universities on incubators for things that are more in the sort of university spin out, knowledge and tech startup uh, and local businesses. So to some extent, of course, I would say this because I'm a local councillor, but I think that giving powers and funding to local government is good not just to improve local government, but also to directly improve local economies because councils are incentivized to do that. Or if councils are incentivized to do that, I should say. Fabulous. I'm sitting here um, thinking, gosh, there's so much work to do and there's so little time. So, um, <laughs> you know, the IPCC reports say that we have to, we have to transform utterly our societies and our economies in the next next 10 years. And um, uh, there's, it's so hard working at this level. I mean, I'm really inspired by what you both have shared. And, you know, in a place like Bristol, it's a very progressive city. Of course, there are gonna be lots of things happening. And yet there's, there's a lot of deprivation and a huge carbon footprint here. Do you think... Those of you who are from outside Bristol who've just come to this event, we're on the posh side of town, just <laughs> FYI. <laughs> Don't come away thinking all of Bristol is this nice. But there, there are, and there are so many inspiring uh, projects and models and solutions. I'm looking at Juan and, and Jason right here. So Repess, the, the sort of network of networks of solidarity um, uh, economies, really inspiring model. And uh, it's happening all over the world not enough, probably. Um, Juan, I know you're you're involved in a network of network uh, a networks uh, equalies, and you were behind the the transition in municipalities movement. And I'm just going to say something controversial, just to maybe stimulate the thinking a little bit, and we'll take some questions from the audience. Can I say something before? Because you said that it's very hard, but uh, if Satish Kumar would be here, you were listening this morning to this inspiring man, he would say, come on, Jay, we need happy activists. So we need to say, it's exciting. So it's so difficult what we had to achieve, and we are the people that is gonna do it. So I, th I think you we know, need to cheer. We hope, hope is a choice, <laughs> hope is a choice, right? It is, and, and yes, and. <laughs> <laughs> We, we need to be inspired, we need to have fun while we're engaging in the revolution. Um, but what I, uh, now I forgot what I was gonna say. <laughs> Question from You're about the to throw it out with some provocation. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna provoke a little bit and, and I forgot exactly what I was gonna say. I think one of the things that I might have uh, wanted to say is that I think really the project here is about, uh, in a way, creating the new person. So, you know, if we, if we hearken back to, to Marx a little bit, you know, the kind of system that we're in uh, produces the kind of person who inhabit, who inhabits that system. And so we're, we're so used to being individuals, we're so used to just taking as given the kind of, uh, the, the, you know, the capitalist relationships that we are immersed in every day. So how do we begin to, to reinvent ourselves? Uh, you know, Plato, uh, in the Republic talked about uh, producing the kind of system that would um, uh, choose the best people to become the kings, the philosopher kings, and educate those people to be virtuous and, and strong and true. Um, what about the philosopher citizen? How do, we, how do we develop the kinds of capacities as people like us to be able to, to make the kind of, kinds of changes necessary we need to strengthen the local economies as this session is all about, and local politics, and we need to change things at the global level. And we need to do it in a hurry. Maybe, maybe a little bit of collapse is okay. Maybe that's just the kind of opening that we need to, uh, to step into. Anyway, that's my provocation. You've got your hand up already. So do we have a floating microphone? Yeah, great. So we've got a couple questions here. Hello? Is that working? Yeah. Um, Clara, I wanted to ask you a question. We've kind of covered decentralized economic systems, decentralized um, economic systems. 
Given your background in energy, I'm wondering what your thoughts are around how we can weave those together. We've got a time when solar particularly enables... Can you hear me? Yes, but if you can angle it slightly more directly to your mouth, there we'll be able to are. hear you How's better. That? Decentralised economic ownership and how that can power our economies and use decentralised governance systems to enable that to occur. Just interested to hear your thoughts with your tech background or energy background. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll try and be brief because I want to hear a few, few contributions. To be honest, because we're in a climate emergency, I think we can't do everything at a community energy level, even if that would be my preferred model. So I think there is a role for the big commercial scale offshore wind farms, for example. That was the sector I used to work in, in my day job. And there's also a role for community energy, which was something I did in my spare time, helping to develop solar. And we tried to get wind, but it didn't work out uh, in Bristol at a community level. I think there's roles for both. Um, Decentral. I mean, ev even with the big commercial scale wind farms, the grid is still being decentralized compared to the fossil fuel based model with a very small number of very large power stations. Um, I would prefer to have models where, where a stake in the wind farm was more often available to the local community to invest in. There are a few lovely examples of that. Um, but at the moment, it's the exception rather than the rule. There's no reason why you couldn't have that even for the big offshore wind farms um, for the local community to be able to invest in a stake of it. And I think that's good um, for allowing people to have a buy-in themselves as well as, as well as that kind of local economy investment basis. Uh, and one of the things we need to do to do that is to get the Tories to lift the de facto ban on onshore wind. There was some very misleading comments from them a few weeks ago where it sounded like they had lifted the de facto ban on onshore wind, but when you looked at the small print, they only sort of have. Um, so it is still very difficult to get onshore wind turbines developed in this country. In fact, there is only two or three in the last year, one of which was here in Bristol. But it took a very large and dedicated team years to get that to happen, uh, and it shouldn't be that difficult. So lifting barriers to community scale energy at the same time as rolling out the large commercial scale stuff, basically pulling all the levers we've got available. Um, I would prefer if more of the large commercial scale stuff was also um, state owned at a national or local level, or at least had a stake. As it is currently, a lot of the big offshore wind farms are state owned by other people's states who have state owned energy companies, but not by ours. Um, yeah, and I would also say that while, very quickly, while uh, the Green Party in general is very pro-public ownership of public services, and we would bring, for example, all of the water companies back into public ownership at a regional level, um, for energy, I and the Green Party have a slightly more nuanced view because we do see the benefit of the innovation that comes from the small innovators like Ecotricity and Good Energy, that the grid wouldn't have decarbonized at the speed it did if they hadn't been the that were the ones provoking at the early stages. Um, so we wouldn't completely nationalize the energy industry, but there would be, there needs to be a greater role for the state, we think. Uh, so are you inspired by the work of Mariana Mazzucato? One little question. And also, uh, what about a role for state cooperative uh, sorts of partnerships? Um, I'm not explicitly inspired by her work, although, uh, why? What did I say that specifically? No, because did I, did you I said I there's a role. No, 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 no. You just said there was a role for the state. Yeah. And so, um, you know, uh, she's written a book, Mission-Led Economies. I, I think that's the title, yet, something like that. Uh, anyway, it's w it would take us off on a bit of a tangent, but it's about the role that the state could play in enabling innovation. And I think the interesting part for us is that it envisions innovation, national innovation systems that include an important role for local communities and, and local innovators. Um, anyway, so we have later. another question. I'm happy to consult later with the Green Hello. Party if you are interested. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think a lot of us agree with what you're saying about local and bioregional governance. And then obviously there's been lots of mentions as well about these kind of global level governance for commons and for conflict resolution and things. Why do you think that national governance has been the main decision-making 
sort of level? And do you think that there really is a future there? Or it was just because a monarch a couple of hundred years ago decided that they would sort of put a line around all these places and make decisions at that level? Or do you think it does make sense to still have national policy and national decision making? Mm, good question. Um, I think that we're not going to see the end of the nation state anytime soon, um, and I don't think that's a realistic thing to, to be pushing for, but I do think that decreasing the importance of that level of government is, is a good focus to have. Um, as for why we've ended up there, I'm no historian. Um, me, the others may want to comment, um, but I certainly think that various empires, including the British Empire, have a lot to answer for because the, the nations we have now in this country are a result of how those empires divvied things up. I think that nowadays nations or national governments, they have the power, but now we are, have the risk that power is going or, or is now in under big business, business. So it's economical power managing national power. So I don't know whether in the future we will go through a international power, I don't think so. Hopefully to a local, local power, as you said. But I think uh, the risk is more that uh, big economic power will manage or is managing um, nations now. I don't know, Jay, what do you think? Well, it's, a, it's a big question and I think a couple things to look at. Uh, one is the, the sort of retrenchment of globalization that's beginning to happen, friendshoring, uh, is a phenomenon that's happening in some countries. Um, so, so there's a bit of a shift in power dynamics there, but I think one thing to really point to is the rise of municipal power, and I think this is where concepts like bioregionalism is, is, uh, is really important. What's happening in Barcelona is really important. There are other examples. Preston might be an important example. Maybe Lewis is an example. But I think there are cities, in fact, you know, when, when Trump was president and pulled out of the Paris Accords, mayors all across the United States said, well, we're still going to be working for climate change, and they, they banded together. There's an international network called the C40 network, I believe. So it could be, and some people have tried to theorize, well, maybe this is the withering away of the state and the rise of, of city-states or, or municipal power. I'm not sure it's going in that direction, but I do see that um, there are places around the world where cities and regions are beginning to to be the ones who are driving uh, political innovation, let's say. So I think Juan had a question, and then uh, you have a question after Juan, and then you have a question, so one, two, three. Yeah, so one, and then in the front row, and then back in row Hi. six, five. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much for your uh, contributions. Um, there are several things coming to my mind, listening to, to all of you. First, is that we are talking about energy transition in a very mm, global, now, global north perspective, thinking that only renewable en energy, uh, I mean, that we will continue basically with the same level of consumption with uh, renewable energy, which is biophysically impossible. Uh, and then we're talking through the whole, I mean, the, the key word through the whole summit is local. But local, it also means to the grow at many levels. And I think we, I don't know, we are not using that word, or we are not talking I'm about really decrease. I'm sorry to interrupt. Could you speak slightly slower? With the echo in the room, when you speak fast, we don't get every word. Okay, thank you, I'll try. Uh, like this is better? Yeah, can you hear me? Okay, thank you. So, yeah. Sorry, because I'm, I, I feel a bit, the, the word is not angry, but I feel a bit like we, we need to touch the bone. And, and I think there are many things happening, but it's just that, I, I mean, when you were talk, talking, uh, Jay, about that we don't have the urgency, you know, about that we don't have enough, enough time. I feel that, you know, when I look at my daughter and after 20 years working in community projects and with municipalities and so on, it's difficult for me when I was listening to, to uh, today in, in, in the morning and we were talking about happy, you know, how to be a happy activist, no? I'm not struggling with that, honestly. 
I, need, I live in Barcelona. Uh, there are so many interesting things going on in terms of social and solidarity economy. I just made a film, a documentary, showcasing a lot of interesting, uh, good examples in economy, in energy, in, in housing. But still, is, is that enough? Well, I don't know, but I think we should talk more about, um, about first, about these examples and trying to build these narratives of possibility, but what's possible is very different to what is happening now. So I think we all need to be, and, and at political, uh, sorry, because it's very, maybe a little bit difficult for me to frame what I'm saying, I'm just sharing a bit of, of different things, but um, really, it's, it's not possible to continue doing the things in the way we're doing it. And we need to do, yeah, well, anyway, it's difficult for me to, to speak now. Yeah, I think I think, maybe I think I'm talking about the elephant in the room in a way, you know, <laughs> which is we really need, we, we are very, very privileged, you know. We are, the people that we are here, we're just in a small part of the world. And, and it's, we are talking about energy transition and like an example, we're talking about many things. It's not because you were talking about that. Uh, as if that's the solution, you know, and I, and, Well, thank you. Thank you for saying that. But yeah, clearly we need to, to live in a, in a much simpler way. Anyway, I don't know if this will be provocative or not, but I think we need to touch that, yeah. that key aspect. Just a few uh, months ago, we had the post-growth conference, for example, in Brussels, which uh, I think... I'm really sorry to interrupt, but we have a few hands. We've only got three minutes left for the entire event, and you've thank been you, speaking you, for quite but, a long but time. But you spoke so much more than the others, too. I, I agree with you, but you spoke much more than much. More than the others two, and you didn't realize that either, probably. Anyway, mm -hmm. so I think um, I think one thing that might have been in, implied in your comments, especially around the energy transition, is that um, many of the minerals required for our wind turbines, our electric batteries, our electric cars, um, for lack of a better word, will be plundered from the global south. And so there needs to be a lot more change from the global north, not just carrying on as before, but now just electrified. Um, maybe, uh, maybe we can just go on to the next couple of questions. I yeah. mean, I agree with all okay. of that. I, yeah, I agree. <laughs> so let's, let's go here and then back here and see if we can fit in a couple. So we've got, we've got uh, two minutes and 10 seconds left, I think. I, I don't... I don't have uh, a question as much as I want to take things down from the 10,000-foot 10, level down to the 100-foot level, and I appreciate what you were saying about localization, and I really appreciate what you said about we need a different kind of person. Um, I work with a, a group of people that are promoting the work of Eleanor Ostrom. Uh, Professor Ostrom was the first woman to win the uh, Nobel Prize in economics, and what she did was study the patterns in indigenous communities that stewarded their shared resources cooperatively. And she developed a, a she developed a eight core design principles that have been used by members of the Evolution Institute and the Pro Social Institute to develop a way of working with small groups that brings in uh, valued based. Uh, engagement that can help small groups be effective at the local level to integrate those values of uh, meeting one another's needs within the actual group. The problem with politics, as I experience it, is it's, they have these great ideas, but once you get involved in these political groups, it's the same top-down sort of competitive control dynamics that puts people off. So the pro-social worldview is a, an approach that is designed to help evolve human consciousness to make a world that works for all. And it brings these ideas down to how do you work together? What's your identity? How do you sharing work? Uh, what, do you have conflict management that works? Are you tracking your agreements? Are you uh, rewarding a, a great agreement, uh, a compliance, etc.? But I just want to say that there's a wonderful group of people in London that have, uh, they have developed something called the Power Station. There are a couple of artists that have mobilized their community to uh, raise money, to mobilize the community to install power, to install solar panels on a local school and to uh, provide locally based 
uh, uh, energy for their community. And that's a model that can be scaled up across scale to connect communities to become more, have more authority, more control over their sources of energy and how it's used. That's a great comment. Thanks for bringing up Eleanor Ostrom's work, Commons, and that project in London is great. I propose that we occupy this hall until we are all fully satisfied and that we've solved all of the problems. <laughs> Who's with me? <laughs> well, I'm really sorry that we didn't get to your question, but let me, let me also propose that... Well, you can just shout it out. No, that's inaccessible and excluding people with hearing impairments. I'd rather we didn't do that, and it won't get picked up by the cameras anyway. Can we have 30 okay. seconds to hear them quickly? All right. We won't respond. I just <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I just did really want to inject some optimism into this debate and hope. I'm a co-founder and director of Bristol Energy Cooperative, so you know, the, the last speaker talking about community energy. We've been going a decade. We've, we've raised 15 million pounds for our projects. We, we produce about a third of the city's solar at the moment. We have over 1,500 members. We're part of Community Energy England that has over 300 groups doing stuff across this the country, there's Community Energy England, there's Community Energy Wales, there's Community Scotland. I personally spent the last five years working with the community sector, the commercial sector, and the local authorities to really start working together and bringing in the finance people, the lawyers, the technical people, the PR people, all, all these sort of people who actually make this happen. And there's all these discussions and coordination is happening at a national level and at a local level, but most people don't know anything about it. There's real hope here, and there's people who've been working on this for a whole decade, whether it's technology, finance, legal. It's going to change. Can I, can I just, just because they want us, they're going to want us to leave, because I think there's something else. But let me, so let me go back to what I was saying just a second ago, which is, for goodness sake, we're not going to solve all the problems in this room. We're not going to do it in an hour. So let this be the beginning. So if you, if you want to carry on the conversation, Carla, where will you be in the next 15 minutes? Uh, I don't know, I can hang around downstairs Great. for up to 15 minutes if you want. Sure, yep. okay. So, so we can carry on outside and hopefully more relationships will be built during this conference, more opportunities for collaboration. Bristol Energy, awesome, thank you for bringing that up. Thank you all for coming and I hope you got something out of this conversation.